You are now listening to the Save Cast, the number one old school RuneScape podcast featuring guests from all across Galenor. To support this podcast, visit the Patreon link in the description. All right, welcome to the Sebe Cast number 51 with Gentle Tractor. Gentle Tractor, how are you doing this fine evening for you, afternoon for me? <laughs> hey there, yeah, I'm, I'm doing well, thanks, yeah. Can't complain, quite uh, excited, looking forward to this. It's not the, not the usual kind of thing I'm finding myself doing, but yeah, I've had some some good uh, recommendations actually from from other people about yourself so yeah i'm looking forward to a, a little chat about all things well whatever comes up <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm extremely excited uh you have been a name that's been brought up multiple times when i ask like what who would you guys like to see on the cast that's like i don't know kind of like out of the mainstream and i know you you yeah. are well known especially on reddit but you... Oh, I don't know, that's still uh, it, <laughs> but it you... was weird anyone finding me well known in any capacity <laughs> but it's it's flattering I will definitely say that it's humbling and flattering that anyone does even after all this time yeah and I think that this is a really special episode because I don't imagine many people have ever heard your voice so it's... probably not I think there's a there's a small handful of people who are uh, chat to on occasion in well places like this on, on discord or wherever yeah um and I well I technically have been to a rune fest before so there's a group of people who've seen me in person and uh chatted um but yeah outside of that it's it's pretty much uh pretty much restricted to you know social media twitter reddit that sort of that sort of stuff so yeah well awesome i'm really excited to talk today we got so much to talk about a lot of things that you're passionate about and i've seen that passion yeah. through your reddit posts so i already know this is yeah, just gonna well. be gold and oh God. for the past few years, I've actually been upvoting all of your Reddit posts because every single one is total gold. I'm not even kidding. I, it's just yeah. every single time I'm like, okay, this is like something completely different. Nobody's ever really brought up before and it works. So well, now you are being too generous. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Compliments. <laughs> I think a lot of people would agree with me. So um, very I, I want to kind of get into this by asking a little bit more about yourself and how you kind of got into the game and yeah. kind of just like your origin story. So if you have anything like noteworthy, feel free. Yeah, I guess a bit of a, a bit of a history as best as I can. Um, yeah, well, we've been playing the game in all of its many incarnations for a, a good old long time now. I think probably starting, I think it was like late 2002, early 03, so a really classic era. Um, probably a similar tale to many people out there uh, a friend of mine uh, introduced me to it. Hey, we should play this cool game where you can play with each other online. <gasps> See, that was quite a novel concept back in the early 2000s. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, obviously, yeah, something special about it back then that just got its hooks in. Never quite able to unhook it. Um, and yeah, so sort of since Classic, been playing kind of, I say intermittently, kind of off and on. Um, I'm one of those people who likes to, I like to dip in and out as and when, you know, as of when I feel like it, as of when there's interesting things going on and, and all that good stuff. It's one of those things where I'd say I've I've had long periods away from the game, but I'd, I'd never say I've I've quit or would would completely quit because I mean who who quits RuneScape? I don't think anyone does. Yeah. It's it's always there, isn't it? <laughs> Eventually you come crawling back. Yep. Um. So yeah, I've just kind of uh played it sort of semi consistently slash inconsistently at times um, over the years. I'd say through. Probably right up till about, well, I mean, the, the big first major milestone, I'd say, towards the end of 2007, where the uh, the infamous removal of the wilderness and free trade. Back back in that sort of era from 04 to 06, I was quite big into the clan scene and, and PvP and, and doing a, like a high-level free-to-play wildy warring and that kind of stuff, which is a far cry removed from what I do these days on in-game. But yeah, PvP used to be a... a, a nice strong love point for mine so um yeah when that all kind of came crashing down with the removal of the wilderness and that traditional format of pvp and restriction of free trade and all that stuff i kind of stepped away from the game for probably the longest period i think from like i guess the start of 08 through to about 2010 ish um then then came back around 2011 for a little bit i think it must have coincided about with the release of things like max capes and comp capes because i have a distinct memory of that era where i was like oh i'm like not a million miles away from these things 
you know, do I do I go for it? Do I try and push that that last bit of grinding? Um, and I basically did during that period, and I think that ended up uh, shaping a lot of how I ended up playing later on, just because of a a deep deep burnout that I experienced from doing that <laughs> for a good year or two. Because um, then that all coincided with the uh, well, 2011 oh. rolling into 2012, and I probably don't need to say much about 2012 and what happened in that year for RuneScape's <laughs> history. It all started, you know, unraveling and, well, all sorts. Um, so, yeah, I kind of remember towards the end of that, actually, uh, with things like, you know, microtransactions and EOC betas coming out thinking, oh, God, I felt like a, almost a race against the clock because I was like, sunk cost fallacy in full swing. I was like, I'm not quitting when I'm this close to, like, maxing and getting a comp cape. I just I need to tick those things off. Um, so uh, I kind of committed to those uh, grinds at that point. Um, and I think I managed them just about on the cusp of of that whole sort of transition era, I guess, um, right at the end of 2012 and the start of 2013. I think it was shortly after Old School launched, actually, that I kind of went back after playing Old School for a while and just sort of finished off the last bits that I needed for comp in that first game, just so I could be like, ah, breathe a sigh of relief. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, um, so yeah, obviously that, that leads to like when Old School came out and that was, you know, such a fun and exciting time when that came back because, you know, everything was so chaotic during that period and seeing a, a version of the game come back that you kind of thought was potentially gone for good and there it was. It was a oh, big blast from the past and, you know, fun fun to sort of bathe yourself in the nostalgia again. So um, I'm a little, sorry. I'm a little yeah, curious. No, no, you're good. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little curious what, what you think of like the beginning of old school did people because i didn't play then uh, i played in 2004 yeah. to 2007 and then i quit for eight years until 2015 when i was reintroduced all ah, right yeah so for me i never really got like that the total golden era of old school when it was like first release yeah. no no like god wars or anything so how was that and what was the mindset of the community at the time did they yeah. just think it I was mean, almost just a novelty or what yeah i guess there was a a bit of a mixture i'll, I'll, I'll be honest um I mean, there's maybe some confessions I need to start giving out at this point as well. <laughs> like for me, I I took a good, probably a few months, I would say, after old school like first came out in 2013. Um, you know, just sort of having fun, doing all the old grinds again, getting through to Dragon Slay, and then you know, you're doing your Barrows gloves and all that fun stuff that I find uh, very iconic uh, with the game. Um, but like to be honest with you, back then, I I wasn't so much kind of concerning myself with the wider scene, if that makes sense. Like I was pretty much in the mindset of yeah this is just this is the game i'm gonna log in and play it just remembering the childhood somewhat um so i'm not sure i feel, really feel adequate to talk about like the wider community at that particular stage um i can certainly speak for myself and how i thought and this is where as i mentioned a bit of a confessions time coming in um again just like speaking of previously when i you know in, in the run-up to the downfall of rs2 and the release of old school um like I really went ham on on grinding things, and at that point I was so burnt out. I just I kind of said it in my own mind that I was like, I'm not doing that again. I'm I'm not gonna force myself to blooming play a game that I'm not actually enjoying at the time. So from pretty much old school's launch onwards, I've always kind of approached it with a slightly more you know laid back mindset. I'm gonna do the things that I enjoy in whatever quantities I find enjoyable, and then I'm not gonna push it any further than that. And specifically back then, seeing how the first kind of few months went and, you know, the, I think there's even charts somewhere that gets tracked of like player counts at the time and all that. Um, you can see there was like a huge surge in popularity when it first came out and it, it started tanking pretty quickly. Uh, you know, players dropped off. Those players weren't really sticking about um, throughout 2013. And again, like confession time, I was one of the people who was a bit of a non-believer. I, I looked at that. I looked at the state of Jagex at the time, obviously off the back of a history of really questionable decisions and, you know, driven kind of the other RuneScape into the ground a bit. And I, I was really questioning whether this game would have like legs to stand on. Like, would it go the distance or would it just kind of become RuneScape Classic? Because Classic was still up at the time. May it, oh, may it rest in peace. I miss it <laughs> uh, since it shut down. But, you know, at the time that was still up. But you know, some servers had as many as like single digit players log on to RuneScape Classic, um, you know, never more than double digits. So I thought, well, 
if old school is just going to be this true kind of 2007 snapshot of the game, if it's just going to stay as that, then I kind of feel like it's inevitable. It would just, it would kind of go the same way as classic. It would, it would stagnate. It would lose players all but, you know, everyone except for the absolute hardcore who are just really looking for any RuneScape experience. And it just wouldn't really, uh, yeah, have the, have the sticking power to it. Uh, or if not that, at least Jagex themselves might end up doing something questionable at some point, which would, you know, sadly a history of doing that. So yeah, at, at that point in time, I was like very cautious about even wanting to sink a huge amount of time into it for all sorts of different reasons there. Uh, and plus, yeah, I just, I, I struggled to see what the long-term future it was looking like. So yeah, I don't know if I'm, I I'm, might be a bit of an outlier. Um, as I say, like it, during that era specifically for the first couple of years, I don't consider myself to be particularly ingrained or in, in tune with what the community was like back then. Um, cause I really did sort of like dip into it and try to treat it in a very lighthearted way with just, I'm going to enjoy it for what it is. I'm going to play it for as much as I want during whatever periods I want. So you know, maybe a few months at a time, then leave for a bit, then maybe come back and play for a few weeks again, leave, so on and so forth. No, um, I, I think your view of it was actually a very common view at the beginning. And I, of course yeah. I wasn't playing then, but I, I came in the middle of 2015 and I feel like that was like the big surge of new yeah. players. That's what it felt like to me, of course. I don't know how yeah. 2014 was. Probably similar. So yeah, there was, because it was, I guess the end of, oh, this is what I'm going to have to try and remember timelines now. I think it was the end of 2013 that it was God Wars came yes. back, didn't it? Yeah. There was, I'm sure it was the first year still. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I bet. Yeah, yeah, Jack, it was. I was. The team have said that, that, um, that marked a bit of a the first turning point, as it were, which sort of you know stopped the <laughs> the curve dropping off and started it pulling back up again of player counts and that kind of thing. So, I think that probably was a, a bit of a highlight. That okay, content of some description probably going to be necessary to to keep this thing going um, to the level it needs to. And so yeah, yeah, as you say, sort of over 2014 onwards, there was a bit of a it was a fun, it was a bit of a Wild West era, I would say, for old school, because I don't think anyone, the community, the old school team, anyone really knew what the direction was or should be. I think there was just a lot of, you know, trying different things, seeing what worked, a lot of you know, very highly engaged with the community at the time. Um, but as I say, like, I still wasn't kind of super engaging on my end. They were just kind of observing it a little bit from a, from a distance. And as sort of the years rolled by to... 2014 i think it might have been 2014 then that we can well potentially start segueing into one of the bigger aspects that kind of all all leads towards the path of a uh, why i'm perhaps even here talking to you which is some of the content they started talking about and concepting early on and um because as i said like you know i was coming off the back of the year you know, in 2013 thinking oh this is just going to be a 2007 server is it gonna is it gonna stick around does it have you know, does it have what it takes to to last? Um, but I think it wasn't until the following year when I heard like rumbling, or you, know, you see first new pieces of content starting to drip in, and then the rumblings of something quite substantial. I remember it might have even been in like a, one of their early developer live streams because they've been doing them pretty much since the start. I think the the Twitch streams and stuff, Q and As. Uh, it might have been on one of them that they talked about this idea of potentially releasing like an entirely new landmass. Right, a big new continent. I was like, oh, I remember first hearing about that, thinking, well, that's that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, you know, that's very very different than a lot of other things you could be doing or that we've had in the past. And hearing little bits and pieces of this, and and having them, you know, talk about what that could hypothetically be, I think certainly it it planted a seed in the back of my mind, at least, that really kind of got me a little bit interested in what the future of this game was going to be. Because it's like, okay, it, it sits in an awkward spot with like RS3 doing its strange thing at the time and sort of classic sitting there as this little, you know, time capsule of a game. Then you've got old school sort of trying to find its way. And I always thought that idea, you know, this idea of a, starting with a bit of a, a blank canvas in terms of content with this idea of like a new continent, a new location, somewhere that you could kind of build new content into, make new things that would be within the whole game, but detached from the mainland and all those iconic nostalgic things that people who really do want a mid 2000s experience just want, you know, untouched and preserved. I, I always thought that's, that sounds like such a good way of approaching that. 
because you can kind of get the best of both worlds. You can almost have this new place to put all your new content and experiment with the new things and then keep all the old stuff kind of intact and, and untouched. Um, so yeah, I think ever since that first sort of uh, rumbling and, and rumor of this entire new continent coming out, I think that, that piqued my curiosity and, and got me you know, wanting to see where this game would go. And obviously, yeah, that kind of snowballs into much bigger conversations as that the yeah. years rolled by. Because I think, I'm trying to remember the timelines again now, when Zaya was first discussed in Polk, I think it was really a long time before it ever actually saw the light of day. Because obviously there was a big turbulent time that the whole game took and, and the old school team, like one of the driving forces behind what would you know, become Zaya was, uh, I believe it was former mod Reach, he who shall not be named. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the colourful past of uh, old school, the old school team. They do manage to pick him somehow. Um, but yeah, obviously he ended up, you know, getting dismissed from the company for various reasons at, at some point. And that kind of project, I guess, partially got put on hold or sort of passed over. I think actually Mod, mod Mac K even took up the mantle of it a little bit, I think, later on and, and did some of the design work on it, perhaps. Um, but yeah, so I think that, I'm sure it got polled as like a big bulk update. I'm, I'm, I think you remember the po a poll question existing being like, should we release a big new continent with a bunch of stuff in it? Yes or no? It's like, uh, <laughs> you think about how they used to poll things back then versus how they would now. It's kind of a, oh, you'd, you'd never get that these days, I don't think. Oh yeah, no, the it's gigantic way too broad. bundle of, should we just do like a bunch of random <laughs> shit and <laughs> see what happens? kind of thing um and yeah so that sort of you know once that gets polled and and i guess it's on the back burner for a while it wasn't until i suppose late 2015 that it started development did it um but yeah i guess during that time again i was still just kind of you know playing the game in little dribs and drabs really like there were little bits and pieces of content that i'd poke my nose into to check out and sort of dip back out again when i felt like i got my fill of it um and just sort of that, that was the main thing that really interested me to see what would the long-term future of this game look like? What direction is it going to go in? Um, and then, yeah, I guess it starts to finally roll around. It gets, you know, active development. I don't know whether it's just full-blown segue into this now, like the whole conversation of Zaya. I guess I'm there already. Yeah, I, I'm, I actually have on my end, I have your Reddit post yeah. pulled up of your original Zaya redesign. Yeah, oh, okay. So the, look back at that because there's so many things I don't like about it. But yeah. <laughs> well, I well here's the thing, compared to what Zaya was, well this yeah, looks that is true. god tier. Like this looks like absolutely beautiful, and they've yeah. made some readjustments. So I want to hear your thoughts, like the beginning of Zaya, what you thought, like logging in for the first time, traveling, oh, and boy. then just kind of your thought process throughout Zaya's history. Let's go into it. Yeah. So yeah, Zaya. It's uh, it's it's kind of fascinating in many ways, but I think in that in that run up to launch, I think one of the it's probably a couple points just prior to its launch that I still somewhat vividly remember it uh, happening. I think I remember watching an old school live stream uh, with some of their art team, and I think this must have been I assume like late 2015 then while it was in development just prior to release, um, and they were you know sort of showcasing an area showing the things that were in progress and I have, I have a memory of, of seeing that and seeing some you know they're showcasing some big kind of spacious location with these strange very large looking vines with grapes growing off of them and then these big buildings placed in a very flat barren green field it's like oh okay <laughs> odd but i mean it's all work in progress so you can't judge that there's no point in trying to critique something that's uh, being actively worked on but, you know, it's sort of, huh, maybe a little bit of a head scratcher in hindsight, maybe actually a little bit of a red flag, but there we go. <laughs> um, I think the the next red flag, or at that point, it was kind of the point of no return. I think just prior to the release, I'm pretty sure they updated their world map because you can access the world map through the like the web page because they update, um, they update that periodically, usually like a few times a year to take and check out, you know, new updates and things. So. I think they released the map just ahead of launch. I can't remember if it was maybe a few days or a week or so. And obviously, you know, boom, there it was. There's Zaya, like on the map. And it was a it was a big old square. Um, yeah, it's 
it's difficult to talk about that and, and look at it and think, huh, that's kind of what it was. Because there's so much to unpack just from looking at it to begin with, I think, even before you get in game. Um, for me, at least, looking at it, there was so many things that just immediately felt off uh, based on all the descriptions of what this area was going to be. Uh, the first one being things like this is phase one or update number one of what would be a big, sprawling, ever-expanding continent. And it's going to contain one new city. And you think to yourself, okay, a new city. A new city across, uh, or cities across the, the mainland of the game. Um, in terms of you know, what they contain, how, how big they are. I mean, they're usually, you know, a, a small village or town. It's about one map square. I, I guess for context, most people probably know this, but a map square is a 64 by 64 game tiles. And there's a lot of old content that can kind of fit in the confines of a map square. But anyway, most villages, towns, things like that, small ones, fit into one map square. Some of the bigger ones, your Falador's, uh, that kind of places, you know, there's sort of two plus map squares, maybe a large one like Varrock, about four perhaps, if you include, uh, you know, just the bulk of the center of it and maybe, you know, GE in there as well. This first launch of Zaya, I think I'd have to go back and double check the actual uh, specs. I think it was something like 40 to 50 map squares, what was supposed to be one city. And it's like, huh, uh... the math seems a bit off there because this is literally 10 times bigger than any other city in the entire game. In fact, in terms of like region coverage, it's about the size of two to three kingdoms, like full-blown regions with multiple cities, multiple towns, and oh, all sorts. So just, just looking at a map based on what they'd said the content was going to be and how it was going to be structured, you could tell straight away this something's gone wrong somewhere. Like something, <laughs> putting it lightly. Um, so then, yeah, launch day comes around. You log into it and head over there, one little pokey boat off of the southern portion of Port Sarim to find this entire new continent out of thin air. And you get dumped unceremoniously on Piscarillus Dock. Um, <laughs> if you remember what the, the first dock was like as well, it was this kind of comically long, well, I don't know what to call it, other than a partial bridge, I guess, to nowhere that just extended for days. And I believe that was also the origin point of a fun ongoing meme amongst the community. I think it's referred to as the Dampot Sink Bridge because it conveniently links, if you were to go all the way east with it, it would link up very conveniently with uh, Piscatoris on the mainland. Yeah. So, yeah. so like, straight away, you get into this new region. It's like, oh, okay. It's like a lot of running just to get off a dock. It's like, start sort of exploring around. And yeah, it's sort of a, I just remember it being a very odd feeling experience just just to start with you know, before you even get into the gameplay aspect of it um just trying to navigate that place felt really chaotic and and labyrinth like you had so many buildings and structures kind of dotted around something that was actually quite unusual for the game at the time like you you may be uh forgiven for thinking it was already like this but actually the majority of the game doesn't have too many identically copy and pasted structures and there, there are a few things with similar layouts here and there but most buildings in most cities are actually subtly unique. Um, whereas the launch day, you know, Kurend, Zaya was not so much unique. There were a lot of big, spacious buildings, copy and pasted. So the exact same layout, the exact same structure kind of dotted throughout. Um, no real pathways. Like that's something to really like interesting to, to look at as well. When you think about trying to navigate, it was literally just in, in some areas, just a, an ocean of buildings just kind of intermingled amongst scenery seemingly at random yeah um, and and completely empty with like no actual content or anything yeah. really going on and that's that's the big thing and that, that's the, the one area where maybe it's worth you know talking a bit more self-reflecting me from uh and, and critically on myself where i guess i'll get onto the the major meat of it of, as to when i started getting involved with the community as a result of all this but um that's one thing i kind of regret focusing a bit too much on just like i've been talking now i'm talking about sort of like the layout and the visual the squared and kind of large oversized nature of it but actually there were some really serious deep systemic gameplay issues i would say as a result of either awkward or perhaps unpreferable design decisions and different things like that and you know a culmination of just a lack of content the content that was there being basically lackluster itself um and big systems that perhaps were just sort of conflicting with the core runescape ideals things like the favor system itself um 
So all these kind of factors sort of accumulated. So kind of you're there in a region, you've got a favor system that's locked all of this content that is already lacking behind having to do this very arbitrary feeling grind. So, okay, how do I start getting access to something? Okay, I can head to Hesidius and you've got to go and push a plow. So, oh, okay, cool. That's, I guess that's gameplay technically in the most literal sense. Um, yeah, okay, what, what do I unlock for doing that? Well, you can eventually get access to a, a mini game, a, a big tithe farm game, which, I mean, that was a, a beautifully monstrous beast. <laughs> but it was first in game. It was Strong massive. Look at pictures of that. It, it truly was. It was, oh, I mean, it's a sight to behold. I kind of, kind of in awe of it. <laughs> when you really look back on it, it's, uh, it's kind of beautiful um, in a very horrible way. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you had things like that, which serves like the only major content pieces for an entire area. You know, you got to that place and what do you do? You just sort of, you unlock an activity that lets you just plant seeds. And even then that didn't really have any rewards associated with it to start with. So it just kind of existed for the sake of existing sort of. Um, and then even like the other regions you had, well, not a whole lot really. Like Shazian gave you borderline nothing to begin with. Um, you know, Piscorilius, you got some anglerfish, I guess, to, to do a bit of high level fishing. I think one of the only things that were really uh, polled and perhaps a bit contentious at the time was Archaeus with its rune crafting stuff. Obviously, that was quite a big uh, jump at the time, getting access to that. And you would have thought with the release of a new area and a what came with it, a new spell book as well, which you'd think in hindsight should have been quite a dramatic and impactful update. You think if the old school team were going to do a new spell book today, that'd probably be quite a, an amazing thing, probably attached to some big grandmaster quest, a fun adventure to go on, some really meaningful spells to come with it. But yeah, sadly that one just sort of locked behind first having to find some books in a, in a giant library that was... Oh, goodness me. Trying to use that library before any third party client <laughs> plugins or anything like that was that's that talk about painful. That's a painful content experience. You have to think of like those people that actually made that plugin. And like, yeah, I remember there was one guy. I I regret not being able to remember his name, but he did like the king of the skill and he they they disqualified the player that oh, used yeah. the library. I remember that. It. Yeah, you remember that? <laughs> yeah, I think he was one of the early ones, wasn't he, to sort of figure out that there was yeah. actually a system to it. And there was a kind of an algorithm to learn and, and be able to basically exploit to your advantage. And I guess that game mode was all based around game time, wasn't it? So just logging in and out and doing things like that to optimize and, yeah, getting the right books and everything. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's funny to think, though, isn't it? They banned him for figuring out how it works. So. <laughs> no. Oh, dear. So funny. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> just one of many... Uh, interesting bits of content though so yeah and even that only unlocked the that the archaeus spell book which at the time you'd think oh a, a necromancy spell book again that's another thing that sounds awesome in concept but in practice it was you bring back an enemy just to kill it again a little trickle of prayer xp like, oh the entire spell book for a single prayer training method okay well you know it's it's you know nice and it has its place in the game these days in the sort of at least um but yeah for an entire spell book an entire area sort of Hinging on that as its rewards. Ooh, I don't know. Then, yeah, other areas, I mean, Lover King, not faring much better. I guess one mining activity that kind of has a spot in the game. Uh, I'd say the Blast Mine is probably one of the few few areas that actually, you know, sort of, I think it hit its mark, more or less. You know, after a few updates and things, I think that sort of did what it needed to, roughly, yeah. at the time. Yeah, I think it did. Um, yeah, but Again, like everything else leading up to that point. I mean, like, again, the favor grind to get there. And <laughs> yeah. Can we talk a little bit about Lover King favor? <laughs> oh, God, yeah. We can talk about all the favor, I think, quite <laughs> frankly. But yeah, Lover King in particular as well. They're all some interesting ones. See, I, I, here, I, I just need to ask, did you do, yeah. like, because I know on release, you had to, like, choose a house. You couldn't just have yes. all favors. Yeah, but did you actually do the one hundred percent Lova King favor before the fifty percent increase? I I don't think I ever did that one. No, not when <laughs> it was still um like you know dedicated to one house at a time kind of thing. I, and, I think uh, it was literally a six hour log of getting yeah. just smothered in this these clouds that were just damaging you nonstop like for no, six hours. It was it does not sound fun. <laughs> yeah, it's and obviously insane. if you want to go and 
catch some anglerfish. It's like, oh, we'll have fun undoing that progress then <laughs> and do it all again later. So, oh, oh dear. God. But yeah, so I mean, in, in all seriousness, that, that did spell like I think one of the biggest sort of glaring issues, which you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll always try and be fair to the old school team because I don't like at the times it would sound like I needlessly bashed them. And I, don't, I genuinely don't mean to because they are such a talented bunch. Um, and I think with the favor system, and with Zaya as a whole, I think they've said that, you know, it was, it was an ambitious undertaking. And I think at the end of the day, they tried a few different things, bit off a heck of a lot more than they could chew, and just made a few kind of fatal errors at the very, very, very starting block. And all of that, obviously, you know, if you don't have that solid foundation, it doesn't really matter what you build on it then, does it? It's all going to crumble. And I think that is kind of Zaya's problem in a nutshell. And the favor system, it was quite a departure from everything else and in my opinion it was it was too much of a departure from the standard runescape affair of like w- one of the things i love about um you know runescape in general and and osrs is just how it's always been different from other mmos it's not a game that makes you you don't pick a class you don't pick a faction you don't pick a skill or a combat style or you, you can do everything you can go do every quest you can go eventually you get every item every piece of equipment and i think the popularity of things like iron man mode these days kind of really solidify why that makes this is a game so special and so that's why i think the favor system really sticks out because it was the first big time in game where it's like you technically can experience everything but just 20 percent of it at a time and then if you want to get the other 80 percent you've got to undo progress and if there's anything that feels awful in game it's having your progress not actually feel like meaningful progression that's persistent and permanent yeah. Like, why do we like gaining XP? Why do we like leveling up? Why do we like doing quests or complete achievements or picking something off somewhere? It's because that goal has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that's what the favor system did differently. And in my opinion, it did wrong, which it didn't have an end. It was just endless when it launched. And you just, you know, we, we kind of don't mind grinding things that perhaps we don't always find the most enjoyable. But as long as we know it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, there's a sense of satisfaction, even if not enjoyment, that comes from that. Yeah. And I don't think Favor from Zaya gave any of that satisfaction because it just didn't have an end. Uh, so, yeah, that was, I think, one of the big, big missteps there where, you know, an ambitious attempt to at trying something a bit different that hadn't been done anywhere else in game. But ultimately, I think it was a bit of a misguided step too far that just didn't didn't pan out at all and didn't work. Um, and obviously, you know, in the years since then, the Favor system has been essentially completely overhauled. So it is just a, I mean, it's a part of a mini quest now you could, pretty much just treat it like a little mini quest that you go and spend a bit of time doing yep gathering some little miscellaneous activities and and doing it one time i've, I've even heard some you know desires or conversations i doubt I, I don't know i guess you never say never but i've heard some of the jane ones and quite frankly i'll be in favor of this as well talk about you know do we even need any of the remnants of the favor system still or would it be better served just the five house quests that now exist there just being the favor unlock essentially yeah Do a house for quest real. Just gives you that region's activities and things because i think that would feel from just a gameplay obviously it would cut down the grind so some people might say oh easy scape update but at the end of the day i don't think that favor system ever should have even existed in in many ways so just you know cutting out the middleman and bringing it back in line to how runescape has always unlocked things you, know, you do a quest you go to a new area you unlock new things via that quest i think that would probably feel so much better and make current as a whole feel a lot nicer if those five house quests were just that's how you unlocked all of that area's um, features yeah that's actually a good point i never considered that i i usually i generally only play one account so having all yeah. having done that years ago i kind of forget that new players still have to do that favor <laughs> so yeah. maybe it would be best to just scrap it all and it's yeah. taking up an entire tab in yeah your, that's true uh, as well in your game especially with the conversations of you know interface shuffling and moving of mini game tabs to become grouping tabs and things like that yep. and people rightly questioning why is there a favor tab when it's just i mean it's sort of a bit of a, a painful reminder to some people of what was once <laughs> the past and to yeah. others it's just kind of a pointless existence once you've sort of done it and it's yeah it's um i guess if they wanted to keep that favor tab it might have been a bit more interesting if they properly repurposed it into a, a full-blown game-wide favor and approval tab you know it'd be kind of nice having a you know like a little bit underneath it for miscellaneous telling you your current favor and how many days oh, yeah. collection, stuff like that. and you could have i don't know taibo one i favor favor for all three people that like doing that <laughs> you, could, you could turn it into a proper system where you know the strange little miscellaneous activities and locations that exist in game just to give it a tiny bit more use um, I, other than that it, it doesn't make sense just scrapping it 
I need to just quickly um, let the audience know that this whole yeah. tab interface was really your idea. Looking at your <laughs> yeah. your, your past Reddit post, um, yeah, technically, yeah. Before uh, yeah. we ever had these tabs, so I'm I'm, I'm showing the audience right now, kind of, yeah, what what your suggestion was, and yours was to have all the tabs here: mini game, rating, everything together. You had six different tabs. It looks like here. Yeah, initially I did, and I well, I, I included an extra one as well that just quite recently got into the game, which surprised me because I didn't think they were going to do that one, which is this sort of account summary overview tab as well which yep. players love sharing their progress and it's a shame that they have to go through you know screenshot about three different areas to get what's my skill total what's my quest total what's my diary what's all this and that so having one little centralized thing to just look at it all made sense to me at the time so but that's no, it's cool seeing that um emerge years later but yeah the tab thing as well i'm a i'm a big i'm a big fan of things that i don't know nerdy things i guess just interfaces fascinate me i find them i find them quite enjoyable thinking about and looking into and always using that old one with the little how the buttons would just sort of like move around when you clicked on diaries and everything didn't it and it just oh that was annoying so just you know turning them into little tabs it's not exactly a, a revolutionary idea i can't really take much credit there just you know again i think prodded the right people in the right direction and I, yeah, I, uh, I think I think you're a big reason why we now have this very very clean interface. So I have to thank yeah, you personally. Oh, well. It just looks it looks great. So thank oh, you well. for your influence. <laughs> He's good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's uh, that's I guess favor, isn't it? In uh, in Zaire, and I think that kind of covers a lot of the the basic early sort of issues and you know, size issues, very oversized, kind of incongruous placement of things, the favor and the gameplay was a bit, all a bit lackluster. And yeah, the whole kind of experience of what Zaya was at launch back in January 2016. Yeah, it? 2016. Um, so it's almost six years ago, which is freaky to think about. It, Yeah, it's insane how fast time flies. Yeah, I, it really is. So I want to kind of ask about um, how Zaya changed over the years and what they did well and what change for the better and what they could still do in your eyes to improve yeah. it um yeah so i guess it's i mean it has undergone a lot of a lot of changes because uh well I, i'm, I'm going to kind of backtrack a tiny bit first and then yeah, get to your yeah uh, absolutely that's okay um cause i suppose i should probably say at this stage like yeah after watching being excited for the for the development of this big new continent seeing it in game and being really really thoroughly disappointed um i think that was the final kind of the straw that broke the camel's back for me where i was like ah oh. i mean the old school team seemingly the last couple of years they, they they do so much to engage with the community out of all games i've ever played or any other little communities i've been a part of I've never felt quite so motivated to want to share an opinion and put ideas out there and suggestions because you know especially in the games industry there's there's a lot of talk and very little action. And I do think there's quite a, a shift that's occurred in the last, you know, 10 years alone, perhaps five to 10 years, where more companies are doing a, a little bit more. But even still, I think the old school team, I'll give them massive props because I think all of us, myself definitely included, take for granted the kind of relationship that we have as like a community to development team and how unprecedented that is, that we have a voice and it is not just heard, but actioned upon. Yep. And that just like knowing that, having seen, you know, player ideas and, and feedback being taken on board and you know, player design content from years prior, like rooftop agility courses and motherload mines and that kind of thing. And knowing that they do actually listen and do take things on board. I think that was the main thing that said, okay, this is probably worth me spending some time to kind of put some feedback towards. But I, I knew straight away, I didn't want to just share some kind of, you know, another big set of paragraphs of text and and that because i'd seen you know when zaya came out there was quite a bit of criticism that was shared that essentially anything and everything i've ever said is i wouldn't classify as particularly original um a lot of other people would share the same sentiment and ideas and and called out the issues um, so i kind of i think i knew on some level it's like okay there's no point in just sort of shouting into the void and repeating what's already been done so what would I most like to, to do to articulate criticism and feedback in a constructive way that would feel positive? And that's where I kind of got the idea of, okay, maybe it should be a, you know, let's look at this area from like a, a, an image standpoint, from a map. And there was one, actually, I should give credit. I think I've even still got 
I have a, a big old page of bookmarks and saved tabs and things, and I might still have it if you give me a moment yeah, to look through some of my old things. Yeah. Because there you... was someone else who I should probably credit this person as being, again, like a little nudge to me to think, ah, oh, okay, there's a bit of source of inspiration. Because I remember seeing someone else who said, hey, this, you know, January 20th, 2016, Zaya map is a bit, it's a bit boxy. Everything's a bit close together. There are no real transition zones. There's a big magical area next to a volcanic area next to a grassland. Maybe you could just space things out a bit better. Um, and someone had done, you know, a somewhat simplistic, but still quite effective um, mock-up of, of what they meant. Um, God, I'm desperately trying to find it now because it was uh, obviously this is going back to what would just be like a Reddit post I saw, uh, yeah, six years ago almost. Um, let's see. Oh, I think I found it. I yeah, I if you link it. it to me, I'll, I can show it. Let me share it. Yeah, I think this was the one. So when was this shared? Yeah, January 7th, 2016. So wow. let me paste that. Okay. And it's got an image in it. And this is a person, what's their name? Viawi. So credit to them. Um, and they just sort of did a, a simple side-by-side -side comparison of like, the, the Zaya that we got versus one that just just shuffled a couple things a little bit. Um, if you see it there. Yeah, it's just very, very simple. Just the little ex yeah. extension you know, right there. Tiny bit, you know, just grab some of the areas down a bit and just make it not a square to begin with. I do remember <laughs> seeing that and thinking, oh, that's, that's quite effective. And looking into it and thinking, oh, they just made that in Photoshop, huh? And and seeing that mock-up there, obviously everything is still pretty much as is, but just spaced apart. But immediately you get a certain effect. And I think that, coupled with obviously everything else, everything I already felt and thought and... I'd wanted to give some proper in-depth criticism and feedback of some kind, but wasn't really sure how to articulate it. I think seeing things like that and other players and I've seen other you know, videos at the time put out on YouTube of people critiquing the place and saying what could have been done better or why it's a bit awkward. And yeah, that sort of, I think, spurred me on to be like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see how easy this would be. I have an old copy of Photoshop, boot it up, pull in the world map and just started, started tinkering, started going at it. And yeah, that was a big process of trial and error to to ultimately land on something. I think I must have spent, God, I don't know how many hours, but it was over the course of like a good month or two while I was just, you know, chipping away at it in you know, every other evening or so and a bit of weekends, just sort of uh, starting with, okay, I'm going to do kind of what this person did and just sort of copy and paste buildings and move them and start adding things. Then I realized, actually, I want to go a bit further than that. Let's start editing things a bit more. Let's let's have a go at sort of changing the shape of some of these buildings. Can I redraw some of them? And had a bit of a go doing that with some of them. And I was like, okay, I can kind of do that with if I zoom right in and do a bit pixel art style almost, <laughs> pixel by pixel in some cases. I can yeah, I can kind of make these little things the way I want them to. Um, and yeah, sort of started, you know, in earnest, building out this this reworked and redesigned map of of Zaya that. I wanted to sort of showcase to highlight some of those initial issues, right? And yeah, as I say, it was a it was a lengthy process, very much trial and error, doing just kind of what came to mind with no real, in, in many ways, ironically enough, probably in, in a similar fashion to how the old school team did theirs without a super strong sense of design direction or where my ultimate end goal was going to be. But yeah, it started fleshing out. And I, at one point I ended up, okay, I've got this sort of, this chunk of current kind of done and it's looking very different. I've kept a few areas of it still quite similar, recognizable, but you can see how it would be laid out differently and just create a slightly different feel and vibe for things. And then I was like, okay, I'll start incorporating other things that I'd spoken about at all the different times over the years for Zaya. Cause I'd mentioned things like, uh, um, like a raid dungeon potentially existing at some point and this sort of volcanic town of Karoom and this scary fire making, boss up in the icy northern regions called the winter tard and potentially some kind of giant pvp coliseum so i was like okay i'll start mapping down or incorporating elements in some way shape or form uh and sort of so yeah the map started growing and growing and i realized okay i've not just done a, a redesign here i've started to flesh out almost a whole continent so i was like okay i, I guess i might as well just sort of commit at this point let's just let's 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 create a whole version of this then let's, let's make a 
you know, fast forward however many years it might take. This is a, a hypothetical look at what a finished Zaya could be in some way, shape or form at least. And so, yeah, I started adding in a few extra areas as well. Things that kind of didn't exist, things that hadn't been referenced, things that were just my own little creation. Um, yeah, one aspect of that was this idea of, okay, as I mentioned to you earlier, the whole city angle of Kurend was launched into the game as a city, the city of Great Kurend. And it was just too big to be a city. So that was one of the big things I sort of focused in on. I was like, okay, I'm going to highlight this. Kurend really should probably be referred to as a kingdom because it's the size of one or even bigger than one. And I thought a way of really reinforcing that point would be, well, I'll include another kingdom on this same landmass. And I thought, okay, let's, um, let's add a second kingdom in then and had a bit of fun sort of playing around with ideas and trying to figure out what the name for that should be. Um, I went and I actually did for that one in particular, sort of went across the mainland and I sort of jotted down all the names of kingdoms. Because one thing that, again, bugged me a little bit about Zaya was how almost intentionally obnoxious some of the names were, <laughs> like Lover King, Archaeus, and it was a lot of mouthful naming conventions. So I was like, okay, I want to make something that sounds very runescapey. How do you make a runescapey sounding name or a region or kingdom or something? So I just kind of went through and listed out all the different kingdoms in game, you know, Mistelin, Asgarnia, Andarin, uh, you know, the Fremenic Province, Karamja, Mauritania, Taranwin. I tried to sort of gauge any kind of verbal similarities and, and decided on a few things. I was like, okay, it should probably be about three syllables. That feels about right. I wanted to start with a letter that didn't already have um, a letter anywhere else in the game, which is a weird distinction to draw on, but I don't know. I guess I figure if people are going to abbreviate things down as they sometimes do, it's nicer to start with something unique. So I ended up going through the alphabet. I was like, okay, I'm going to start with the letter V. Um, played around with, uh, again, like vowels and figured out, okay, a lot of kingdoms have A's and I's as common vowel usage. I was like, okay, I'm going to dump a bunch of A's in. So I was like, uh, va, let's do something, va, uh, uh, something, something. Sort of just played around with how things sounded. Ended up on Vala. I was like, I like Vala. Vala sounds cool. Um, but it needs something more to it. Um, I couldn't really decide what more to put until, well, maybe it sounds silly. But as I just said there, I was like, <laughs> what, what more can I put on? Maybe I should just call it Vala more. But yeah, that sounds nice. So Vala more. Um, Kingdom of Vala more. That's how that kind of came to be. Plonked that thing down. Uh, and added a few little, uh, a few little places in there. One, just a little, uh, a little place that I've always liked the idea of seeing, which was a location that's kind of autumnal themed. I suppose we have a lot of wintry, cold places, not nice, warm, temperate, sunny summer places, but something that has like deep oranges and browns and that kind of thing. So it's started getting fun, getting a bit creative, adding little, little locations that were a little bit different, but felt sort of homely almost felt like yeah. they could belong but added a unique feel to them and yeah sort of expanded outward, outwards like that and added little interesting areas and features and a little forest here a little hidden glade there a, a big bay and uh, another little town and then eventually pushed south it was like okay i knew there was this big city that had been referenced by the old school team called civitas illa fortis so like, okay let's try and incorporate that somehow with the name being i believe latin so kind of imagine some sort of greco-roman kind of you know ancient european sort of vibe to it but then thought okay let's try and mix in a few other influences and and feelings where this place could be maybe it's a bit of a deserty vibe but not like a caribbean desert more of a savannah style kind of wasteland and scrubland so i kind of concepted that a bit put it down a big block wall city with this big coliseum in it in the middle of a big savannah and try to make it a bit interesting had a few fun features here and there and yeah, sort of ended up, you know, this long-winded process of just tinkering, experimenting, failing many times in Photoshop, and until eventually ended up with something that had some semblance of, well, interesting look to it at the end. And I could sort of zoom out and be like, ah, uh, yeah, it's like an interesting-looking content, I guess. And it's got a bit of a redesigned current in amongst the uh, the mix there. And yeah, sort of ended up with that. Wrote up a bit of a simple series of bullet points and things to critique it which again in hindsight i kind of wish i had have led with some other things because i think i've focused too heavily on the the look and the the overall shape and structure rather than really tackling some of the the deeper issues with it it wasn't until actually a, a post i made probably a few months later i have to completely go double check my reddit post history but there was one post I actually um weirdly enough slightly more proud of 
just because that was the one where I really was like, right, okay, we're just going to clearly and concisely list all the reasons why this area is problematic and why it's worthy of being in some way, shape or form reworked or looked back upon uh, and, and kind of gave some little image thing. I mean, I can give you a link to that if you want. To... I think I think I have it. Is it Zaya Redesign 2 it's... Retrospect? No, it's okay. this one. It's called The Actual Issues with Zaya. I think I put it at the time when there was a priority poll being done in game. And one of the things on... Um, I think one of the things on the priority poll was talking about play design content, and I was like, "Ah, oh, probably not going to get to uh, who looked upon fondly." I think so. I think I kind of wanted to to give a reason as to why I don't know why why it would be worth looking at, you know, taking on board suggestions and and pushing the game to try and improve things rather than focus on flashy new content all the time. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that was just a, a basic post where you know, paragraph by paragraph, I tried to break down what was wrong with the region. What problem did it elicit and how could it be fixed? Um, or at least attempts at that anyway. And yeah, I think I, I can look back through that now and actually feel quite content in many ways because I think the almost all of these points have been addressed or begun to be addressed in some capacity. So yeah, that feels very, very nice being able to look back upon that and be like, you know what, the old school team, massive props to them, like massive, massive props because They've really, you know, started to properly go in and, and work on that stuff. Uh, but yeah, like that that initial map then, first and foremost, you know, I finished it up, shared it online on the old school subreddit after making a account a little while earlier. Gentle tractor, log into it, share it. Um, didn't really think much of it. I, I honestly don't know what I thought would come of it, but was very, very surprised to see the next day I think I looked at some statistics on the image view count or something. It was like 800,000 views. I was like, what are you talking about? Excuse me, come again. <laughs> what? <laughs> I was like, how? Check like Reddit. It's like, why is it on the top page of r slash all? What? And it was absolutely bonkers. Like how a pokey little map had suddenly gone weirdly viral uh, <laughs> with this old game. And yeah, just seeing the level of interest and just comment that it it stirred up with people was quite wow it, was, it you know it took me back a bit um but it highlighted something i think it it highlights a number of things that i mean a it's it's much easier to catch people's attention with an with a picture you know one image means a thousand words and all that and that's very very true and i think that you know in all the years since then we can kind of see the uh the popularity of the old image post and in order to get information across and, and pitch ideas um, but yeah, it sort of it it really did do some it did some numbers early on, and yeah, got a you know response from the old school team. And even if it wasn't initially a positive response, because they did a, a good old job. A poor old Bob Matt Kay, you know, he didn't have an easy time of things, but kind of had to come out there and explain why this probably wouldn't be realistic to ever work on, why it'd be impractical and probably have to spend something like I think he gave, he gave an estimate of something like three to six months would have to be dedicated to fix this up. Yeah. Which in hindsight, when you think we're six years later and it's about halfway reworked, I would have taken a six month rework, man. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Rather than six years to get halfway. But uh yeah, anyway. <laughs> um Yeah, it sort of uh it, it seemed initially, you know, a lot of positive initial reception, but wasn't really sure how practical anything would actually come of it realistically. So I did have a bit of a back and forth. I think at that point, after seeing the response, that kind of switch something on for me where it's like okay i feel ever so slightly committed to this this uh sort of project now so i sort of came back at it again went for a a big old load of criticism again and in, in, you know sharing lots of uh lots more feedback lots more ideas different revisions try to come back again with like a second version of like, okay what about a stripped down version of just no crazy moving of things just sort of re-sculpting what's there to save time and there was some positivity surrounding that and then Bit more time passes and i came back and did like another iteration of that which happened to strike just at a, the right kind of time because it was towards the end of 2016 that uh oh, the good old champion mod west i think he joined the team around about the same time that i would shared that first day redesign map and i think he just personally shared a lot of the same thoughts and feelings it was like yeah I'd, I'd really like to see this this location actually that's kind of just come into the game he's just joined the company at the time I think he was very sort of personally invested in that as well. And so things kind of fell into into 
a particular way that he ended up getting one of his early, I think, roles or, or jobs allocated to him towards the end of 2016 was having a first bash at, okay, can we do some things to sort of at least fix up the, the overlying structure, the, the coastline and the, the core feeling of, of Zaya. And again, I happened to share something around that sort of time as well that ended up being used as a, a little bit of a template for what that ended up being. Um, Cause that was, well, that was this, I guess I can link it to you here just so you're not having to scurry around. It's uh, it was that one there that ended up being used as a, as I say, like a little bit of a template. Let me bring it up real quick. Yeah. Um, so in, in things like that, I included some areas that did, you know, manage to make their way into the game, like a little, little woodland around the woodcutting guild with a, a small little camp that I just called Land's End and just adding a adding a nice river through the whole length of Hesidius and just breaking things up a bit, basically. Obviously, in, in hindsight, it still isn't, you know, there's a lot more that would need to be done from that yeah. point, ideally. But that was a map that I made with the notion of, okay, this is what we're working with. How do we make the best of what we've got kind of thing? That's yeah. maybe realistic. And that felt like, well, potentially doable. And it turns out it kind of was, you know, it was potentially doable. So Mod West managed to work through it and he added some of his own, you know, fantastic things. He kind of created the entire current castle area in the center of the, the kingdom and really did some you know, amazing things. And obviously later on went on to do even more amazing things of his own. Uh, and and yeah, that sort of, I guess that started the first aspects of Zaya improvements. I think after that point, when those first round of changes came in, I wasn't sure if we'd ever see anything more than that. It's kind of like, okay, this was this was one of the things that they talked about and, and Mod Matt K said might be doable in terms of spending time and not wanting to you know, waste time and resources on lots of big reworks. Um, so yeah, it kind of stayed that way for for a number of years, I guess, because looking at it, it's weird to, to really look over the timeline of Zaya and how it changed, and how it got added to and expanded. So little pieces of content come over time. Like Winter Tide was pretty shortly after all that initial uh, release, mm -hmm. um, which has its you know its own fun issues, I guess. Kind of Winter Tide, <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, and, and you know other little expansions, additions, eventually Mount Quidamortem and Chambers Eric and all that good stuff. Um, I guess it wasn't until, was it 2019, 2018, For I made Mod West to showcases his first big, like really meaningful, drastic Hasidious rework. Oh the, the yeah, proper, that must have been 20... the meaty changes. Yeah, that must have been 2019, I think. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think, don't actually know. I think it was about then. I'm, I've got, I definitely have some tab saved somewhere where I've commented on something, but yeah, 2019 rings a bell. Yeah. Um. And yeah, like seeing that tease, it was like, oh, it oh. looked amazing. There was, there was a little tingle, a tingle in me. It was like, oh, it's happening. It's <laughs> happening. Like we waited years, but it's happening. <laughs> like just some kind of proper rework yeah. to, to see it. And someone who clearly had come at it with such a level of care and attention and really thinking about world building and like fun little yeah. environmental storytelling and thinking about how it works from like an MMO standpoint with like players of like that locations to, to serve as little player hubs and and activities or areas and oh it was just it was so good seeing that hasidious See, rework come to life and the fourth os dungeon with it as well because that kind of came as a bit yeah. of two -parter. and that's probably you know it's not the most meta defining dungeon out there by no means but i would say it's probably the most runescapey dungeon we have you know yeah it's just that's a, like a it's new, a dungeon. dungeon yeah and it's i kind of hope we do get more little things like that in the future yeah, especially if you can I, figure out little ways to make it a bit compelling to people. Yeah, absolutely. I th I think the biggest thing that Mod West did, and I think you would probably agree, is just and and I'm not an artist, and I'm not like a you know a a uh, I don't know a building does like I'm not I'm not a uh, yeah. whatever it's called <clears throat> a designer of a map or anything. But so yeah. I I didn't understand what was wrong with Hosidius. All I knew it, it was it was wrong. But as soon as he said the buildings like just to make a town that's small and then have like a lot of land that's you know filling yeah. that little town is like way better than just having the town as the whole entire continent like you know absolutely so, yes it's the it's the yeah. concept of um kind of hub zones versus transition zones yeah where you want areas that are quite concentrated with a lot going on 
to serve as a little hub area where you're going to have a lot of players running into each other and time spent there doing some kind of activity versus larger chunks of the map, like realistically the bulk of the map, which would be kind of transition zones, which you're not spending a lot of time in, but you are using to kind of get through from point A to point B. Yep. And that is where Zaya initially, the launch version of it, just fundamentally failed because it, it did just, it, it didn't have either of those two things. Everything was just sort of evenly spaced out in a big kind of spreading broad brushstroke of just dotted buildings that did feel like a bit of a labyrinth to navigate. And that's, I think, why it made Zaya feel both much bigger, even <laughs> with the big size that it was, it somehow felt even bigger still. Uh, and just it felt kind of dead and desolate because you just didn't really easily run into people because it was such, everything was so spaced out. Everything yeah. was kind of in an awkward position. And, and yeah, and so as, as you say, you know, it's, I think that's the same thing where I, I really wouldn't want to take too much credit in the grand scheme of things for, you know, pointing out flaws or highlighting possible suggestions or anything because a lot of other people had done that i think it was just difficult for a lot of people to really fully articulate what they kind of subconsciously knew was wrong about it yeah it just sometimes you know you need that little image to sort of spring you into life it's like oh yeah you know it's it's like you can tell when something's wrong and when something's right by seeing an example of both even if you can't always you know pull out all the specific details of it yes. as to what it is right like, you know when food tastes good versus when <laughs> yeah. it doesn't even if you don't know what all the ingredients are or how they came to be you can tell on some level. Yeah, so I think that was like a big part of it too. Um, but yeah, being that the city has finally come together and be like, oh, oh my god, like that's one of the biggest, most problematic portions of there, I think. And seeing it just have a, such a fun and interesting little, very just very RuneScape-y design to it, and, and see that all come to life. Was, yeah, uh, it yeah, looks. That was a real joy to see. It looks incredible now, and Shazian looks amazing. Yeah, and obviously that followed suit. Some, well, I guess, I actually took a couple years later sadly but um yeah so it's you know you look at zaya that southern half of it it's it's looking pretty damn stunning i would say it, it's a, i think there's a really strong case for those areas being like a really solid addition to the game now and you know hopefully one day the the northern portions will yes get a, a chance to be tackled too and i've you know i've even uh i don't know whether you're interested in having some little I've, I've brought a little, a few little things with me today, depending on how much of a, a visual experience you want this podcast to be. Send them. To... I think my audience would absolutely love. I, <laughs> I just got to say right now, I'm loving this yeah. right now. I, I love this. So yeah. oh, well, that's keep good. going. Let, let me know if I'm <laughs> waffling on and rambling yeah. too much. I, I would let you know, but I'm enjoying this hours. thoroughly. Okay, good. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like seeing, uh, yeah, that the portion of the map has have slowly improved over the years. It's, it's definitely, you know, it's, it's an, it's inspired me a little bit more again there was a time where i'd kind of i'd seen that especially when uh let's start you know mod west is out with the hasidious rework i felt like okay i can probably not feel any kind of need or compulsion to step in here again i can step back and this feels good you know it's over time it's gonna happen yeah but i've seen a couple of other things in chat with a few other people in the community have done some great things themselves and there's a i will give a big shout out first to a, a subreddit called um it's just osrs maps so yeah, reddit.com slash r slash OSRS maps. So it's a quiet little little subreddit. It's a nice little wholesome place. It doesn't have too many posts on it and it's fairly sporadic. Maybe every every other month or two, maybe something comes up. But it's just people who share fan-made maps, usually just 2D little Photoshop mockups. But actually there's some very impressive things if you go digging through that I might even talk about in just a little bit from some players. But yeah, just seeing what some pe people have shared on that, on that subreddit. Uh, there's uh, a couple of examples of player-made Arceus reworks and player made Piscarillius reworks as well. And some of them look really, really stunning and have some really awesome design directions to them and, and some crazy things. And I mean, if you go scrolling down a bit further, you'll find an absolutely phenomenal Kingdom of Valamor sort of design pitch as well by uh, another player. Um, I should probably shout out and credit people. I think that one is uh, Zigzagzigal. I see it Valamore. right here. I'm yeah, on it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, their, their Valamor map is just. Oh, it's like, oh, chef's kiss. It's just, it's so good. Like, yeah. I, I look back at mine, it's like, wow, you just took a silly old <laughs> shit on mine. That's just bravo, sir. It was so good. So I, if, if the actual Valamore turns out even a fraction like that one, I think we can all be happy as players, quite frankly. Yeah. So, I, yeah, there's some... Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I love this... Uh, I think it's Civitas. I don't actually know if this is, like, Italian or, like... Uh, I don't Where know what this place knows? is called. The like right right near the Colosseum, that whole area, like that whole little town, looks amazing. 
Oh yeah, yeah, it really does, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's just so much little so much detail packed in and again there's so many fantastic maps like that on that subreddit. If you want to just get lost in a little hypothetical made up fantasy world for a little bit, I'd I'd recommend opening up that sub and just have a little browse, peruse through there, see what people have shared and there's one or two things from me there as well. But there's a couple of things that I'll probably share again in the future that I have working in, in progress. So as I say, I could even possibly share a I'd have to give a big disclaimer and be like proper work in progress not finished it looks janky and it's not done but i, I could show you that if you want yeah show and, it and, and in show fact I'm, I'm seeing zigzag is actually the top post as well with yeah. like that i i do remember seeing this i think it might have been just shared to the 2007 scape reddit where like yeah that, i think it's, it's them have been yeah like that huge uh, i don't even know what this thing's called like a delta or something like that the thing where like the river splits into like eight different yeah. rivers i don't know oh, what yeah, that's, that's called fantastic one that is yeah yeah i know what you awesome. mean that, that map there I think it's sort of his, his entire kind of creation of a, a unique wagon. It has basically a unique continental landmass in of itself, but it's yeah. again so rich with detail and, and <laughs> yeah. amazingly packed with just little fun things and little Easter eggs here and there too. And oh yeah, it's it's exciting stuff. And yeah, as I say, there've been some awesome maps shared by a number of people there. There's like uh, I know someone by the name of Dark Blade has shared some things in the past. There's someone called uh, well. Maybe gonna shout a bit later on. But I guess I'll do it now. Um, Screet Monge, but they tend to go by Gnome. And yeah, Screet, I know him. Is, yeah, yeah, he's a very, very good bloke. He just a few weeks back got in touch with me. He's like, "Hey, can we have a chat again?" Because I've I've chatted to him some like a year past maybe, and we discussed a few design ideas. By the way, if you if you ever thought you know you, you gave me some very high praise and compliments earlier on about posts that I've shared, but I've definitely been a bit a bit quiet as I've taken a bit of a step back from the game in the last couple of years. If you want to see someone who puts out unbelievably stunning work, go and check out his posts on, on Reddit and Twitter and everything. Screet Monge is, uh, yeah, Mr. Gnome. He has got some of the most high quality and thoughtful suggestion posts I've ever seen that I really do think far eclipse and surpass the things I've shared. I'm right already there. just looking at this thing yeah. by him with the uh, Auburn Veil kind of like... Yeah, so... Like, yeah, just <laughs> so warm. It looks awesome. Auburn Veil. As I mentioned earlier, didn't I? That was a little place I first included in my Zay redesign map, just as this could be a fun little autumnal themed place that might be fun to uh, to have. And then I, I later on went back and said, like, you know what? I'd like to do a different start, a different take on that. So I did a, a slightly different map. I, I put it on the coast and expanded it a little bit, made it a little, uh, you know, gave it a little monastery on a big cliff top near some cascading waterfalls. I was like, yeah, I like that map. Shared it on the subreddit about three years back. Old Gnome, because we, we've chatted a few times, and he, he spoke to me again. Uh, a few weeks back, he's like, can I speak to you about something? He's like, all right, yeah, okay. He showed me, a, we had a chat on Discord, and he's like, I want to show you this video. He, he showed me it. And he'd, he'd only gone and flipping A, got on a hold of a, you know, some 3D map editing software through various means, and literally mapped, like in 3D mapping, like an actual old school RuneScape map editor, he'd, he'd made it. Like he has made that <laughs> location of Auburn Vale, like actually physically in 3D. <laughs> zoom around I'm literally he sent at me it. the files and the program to have a look at it myself and i was like oh my goodness gracious like he showed me without any context because i think he wanted a raw reaction and as soon as he started like he gave me a trailer which i should i don't know maybe i didn't should link that to you because he did a little uh like two minute trailer for yeah me link and, uh, it link it i don't know yeah, if there's like I'll audio like i don't know if there's like uh, like audio in it because i'll probably have it muted if there is no i, I don't think there is any okay. oh, not audio that's um that yeah link is. it i'd check my um dms with him and make sure i find the right link because we've shared a lot of links to things that wouldn't want to be shared but uh yeah. let me see i think it'd be this one let's hope it doesn't start auto playing in my ears and break them uh there we go yeah okay so this is what he showed me let me copy that and paste that hopefully that's it okay. so that's just like a little four minute trailer basically and that that's what he he yeah just sprung on me is like, i want to show you something linked me that and i was watching it live with him and i was like oh this sort of god this, this reminds me of a place where i always wanted to pitch like a big autumnal theme place with maple trees and redwood logs and a big orange and then it went round further <laughs> and further it's like it looks like i'm getting deja vu this feels <laughs> like a location that i've sort of and then i realized i was like oh my god you've made it you made the map you pulled out of two dimensions into three and goodness me it was just so impressive like unbelievably impressive uh, again i cannot sing that guy's praises enough <laughs> um 
and so yeah like i was just i was absolutely blown away by that and obviously he has a full kind of reddit post he's shared alongside that on both that osiris map subreddit and in the main 2007 one and just sort of going into the process and, and everything and it's it's a fascinating read if you're interested in a bit of a you know a bit of a deep dive to see someone's various trials and tribulations and challenges they have to overcome to to pull off a map like that and sink it in an ungodly amount of hours and time but my god oh it's, i it's can only imagine work. Like, seriously it's such a high quality i think he's, he's got in the end there and he does talk about some really interesting things which could be you know a, a different topic to have some other time but this idea of you know player designed content and and what position it has in the game still these days if kind of at all because you know, the game's changed a lot over the years and the way that the old school team operates has shifted a little bit as well and that big uh part of that post of his was talking about this idea of man wouldn't it be nice to just have some have some more tools you, you think about all the controversies that have happened this year where players have really taken it upon themselves like 117 scape with the hd client stuff yes it's like what an, what an amazing amount of effort and, and work to go to just purely for reasons of passion wanting to you know being being passionate about something and want to share something with the rest of the community that you think would be cool and man how how telling was it that jagex instead of you know welcoming that with open arms instead try to suppress it and shut it down it's like oh breaks my heart yeah. but luckily you know they, they they came around to that pretty damn quickly so hopefully that was just a case of a little bit of poor decision making from a higher up somewhere but you know it's kind of is what it is but yeah it opens up a much wider discussion to me the way it's like god imagine if we only had better tools you know things that we could work with to really properly help the old school team and and be seen as that and you know imagine if, if they didn't have to rely on trying to kind of remake rune like functionality themselves in their own steam client but instead had some sort of program where you could actually write your own plugins for the official client so yeah be much more collaborative and symbiotic relationship there oh my god website. that'd be amazing and going the final big step which is what you know mr gnome here talks about and myself i'd be so interested in is god, imagine if we only had proper map editing software that we could have access to where we could properly make things and visualize oh. them 3d <laughs> rather than having to rely on these things which unfortunately are you know Fair play to the, the players who made them and put these software together because you're far more intelligent and brainy than I could ever be. But, you know, these these are, you know, programs made by people in usually for slightly questionable reasons and slightly questionable sources and they're not supported anymore. So there's a lot of tech issues and trying to run them is, oh, it's it's a it's an experience in pain, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, it'd be so nice to just have proper proper tools and, and this line of conversation and everything that, that could facilitate, you know, the channeling the players passion into constructive things that would benefit the game and benefit everyone and there's so much untapped potential there on what could be done on sort of creative tools and things like that which just hasn't really been hasn't really been properly explored i don't think you know if, if only I, I just think that the kind of lifespan that a lot of games have had thanks to the modding scene you know, long after developers quit supporting their own games and they just take on a whole new life of their own because the players don't want to let them die they they keep them alive through all sorts of new content additions and revamps and, and all sorts of exciting things and i just imagine what kind of fantastic territory could the old school game potentially have or maybe still could try and forge into being you know, one of the only mmorpgs on the market to really try and bring the players in in every step of the way having having player design content and player development tools sort of present in game and a whole system where it could be sort of player curated and you know, sharing ideas with other people and upvoting, downvoting in the game to figure out what the best ideas are and having the best ones taken on board to make as actual pieces of content is that that that's the kind of stuff that really would have excited me. But yeah, how realistic that is these days is that's another thing entirely because the old school team, as I say, it's a it's a different beast these days. It's it's, it's you know any sort of growth and and change over time, it's usually a double edged sword. You know, there, there are nice things and there are maybe not so nice things, and I do think that's one thing just from an observation standpoint. It, it does feel like the the team is large enough and you know they're, they're more than again I, I will genuinely sing their praises because i think they've got such a hard working and talented bunch there who are you know genuinely they all seem to care about the game so much and are good at what they do i think it's just kind of the case where they're probably big enough to just not need community input anymore <laughs> when it comes to designs like it's we've shifted to this point where most things that come out it's just the old school team come up with an idea and sort of hold out in front of the player base and we either give an, a yes or a no right yep. we, we give a thumbs up or thumbs down and you know that that system's okay it works for what it is but it does kind of make me sad that we don't seem to have the other side of that anymore we don't have players holding up pieces of content to jagex and them saying yes or no and yeah you know, we had that quite a lot in in the early days in the first few years of old school it, it does feel like things have subtly shifted away a bit you know the 
the old school game has gone from this sort of scrappy little independent startup feel that it once had and it's yeah. it's a bit more of a machine with a lot of cogs whirring and yeah there's a lot of steps and processes that have to be adhered to now so again so, double-edged sword there's some nice things about that and the high level of quality that we tend to get these days and less yeah. of a private server feel that used to be complained about a lot but yeah, yeah you, you lose something special in the process of doing that i think i want to ask about so like i agree with you on like every point like just I think the community, like, first of all, the OSR's community is amazing. And yeah, I yeah. think, like, driving the game with the community is, like, the perfect, you know, the perfect storm or whatever, like, collaborating together. And so um, you're going to have to let me know if you want to cover more on Zaya because I'm totally, like, I'm, I'm good for all tonight to just keep yeah. talking. But what would you think about, okay, so it's inevitable that a new skill will come out. And oh. what would you think of it being kind of like a community deciding like oh, cool. what the skill is rather than a proposal given by the team and then we say yes or no? Yeah. So I guess okay, let's just there's... talk about like a new skill in general because I know you have plenty so... of ideas. So Oh, there's, there's... <laughs> this is a really, really big topic I could talk a lot. I will apologize again and maybe rewind quickly just because yeah. I kind of teased it earlier and then accidentally glossed over it i said i'd share with you a little thing i had about zaya so just to round off the sort of zaya conversation um i don't want to leave that piece earlier other people be like hey you said you were going to share this. I never did. <laughs> go for it so, go for uh, it um yeah it's as i mentioned there's some really cool player it is i never thought i'd go back and do another stab at anything zaya related but here we are you know i'm a filthy hypocrite and i'll eat my words <laughs> uh and just got to put up the right uh file and share with the right thing but yeah so i've seen players put together some really cool archaeus ideas and some pistol release ideas but i haven't seen any like modern or recent uh lovacang ones and obviously lovacang you know a little region of dwarves on on zaya again one area that still doesn't yeah it, it doesn't does it does not look right? good yet no yeah it's a big sort of lava field and just all sorts going on so i thought okay you know what i'm just gonna have a bit of fun i'm just gonna in, in recent months, again, I've been, as I sort of alluded to, I've been, I've been uh, mostly on on the sidelines, sitting you know, away from the game a little bit for quite a few, you know, a good couple of years now. So just sort of watching on the periphery. But this is something that I felt a bit enthused about just lately, and I thought, you know what, let's let's go ahead, let's let's spend a little bit of time, have a bit of fun, making a map again. I I'm really want to stress this is still like a working. There's, it's kind of like a bit of an older work in progress as well because I've since made quite a few changes to a. Uh, what this looks like so just bear that in mind but look at it in sense of like okay this is a the way something could feel a bit different like taking something in a different direction and uh, and all of that so i'm gonna link a couple things I'm gonna link two let me make sure the right ones that one and that one yep i think they'll do um let me send those okay so these are just some again kind of early-ish mock-ups for a very, very different design direction for that kind of area of, of Lovacang. It's probably worth, I should put a side-by-side -side with the existing one, but I guess you can uh, flick between to have a, pull up the actual world map and have a little look-see. But yeah, that's, that's uh, a newish direction I tried to take Lovacang into, just having some fun, thinking, what do I think is wrong with the region and what would I do differently about it? A big thing for me was it was very samey, just a big black barren wasteland of lava and buildings not a whole lot going on and it always felt a bit odd to me that a large part of the structures were a above ground considering they're dwarves and almost all yeah. the settlements are below ground in in runescape at least and b a big part of their settlement is right on the cusp of a giant canyon overlooking this huge fight with some aggressive lizard men. <laughs> not, not exactly the most defensible sort of position you've chose to live in there, Mr. Lovacane dwarves and, and ladies. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I sort of approached that. I was like, okay, I'm going to have a little play around with this. And I thought, I'm going to spruce up the landscape a bit. Let's push a lot of their features underground. So I had a little fun playing about Again, like, I really want to stress, it's just sort of, don't really, you know, look too closely at building placement or anything. Yeah. Just sort of get get an idea of the feel of, of things, just looking at it rather than any specific placements. Because I've already got a version of this. I've moved a lot of stuff and redone a lot of things. But the general gist of it is, you know, what if a large chunk of their city structure was underground now? Sort of all subterranean, much more similar to 
you know, all of the, as I mentioned, other dwarven places like Keldegrim or, you know, the areas under Ice Mountain, all that good stuff. See, okay, r real quick, I just want to say, yeah, like, this this totally reminds me of Keldegrim. And the yeah, fact yeah. that you included that the minecart network, it gets me so excited yes. because I think you could just take a minecart to Keldegrim in here. Yeah, that was oh. a part of my, like, back of my mind. I was like, oh, like, it would be nice. Even including it as, like, a little mini quest or something where you have to reconnect, you know, the Zaya dwarves <sighs> with the mainland dwarves again. And maybe they're just a fun little... uh a little series of gameplay scenario to go through to, to hook them up again and maybe some sort of you know, I don't know crazy issues that plague them along the way all good old-fashioned runescape questing style my god uh, this would be in incredible to see yes yeah, so again just sort of like a, a vague semblance of you know shove some of the industrial and, and shops and things underground and then keep the above ground I made it a bit more you know hilly and natural to the south so there's this sort of natural environmental border between the lizardman canyon and the sort of Lovacane mining camp and little post. And I made the top area much, much smaller and more condensed. So yeah. it's it does feel like more of a, you know, a little scrappy group of dwarfs that are sort of traveling about above ground, moving their, you know, ore rocks and different mines and locations like that. Um, and yeah, I guess there's a lot more I could talk on that in, in depth. And, but I think I'll leave most of it as a bit of a, an ambiguous tease for now. So viewers, in... if, you, if, if you've got this up on screen, you can pause it and have yep. a little look if you want to. But bear in mind, it's big been up work here. in progress. Yeah, good. I think, <laughs> dude, okay, I'm just looking at this. First of all, it just it's just inspiring to see this because you don't even really think, like, the fact that you brought up that they're dwarves and they should be living underground, you know, in, yeah. like, these mine shafts and stuff, like, just stuff like that, you know, where they're, like, exploring more minerals down below the earth and stuff. So it's like, I don't even think of that. I just think, okay, we got to, you know, redesign Lovacang. How's it going to look from the surface? But the fact yeah. that it's literally underground is incredible. Like, that is such a cool idea that nobody would really think of. At least me, I wouldn't. So. Yeah. It, a fun little uh, side note, I guess, in fact, about that. One, one of the other, I guess, many things that bugged me about the initial launch of Zaya, it still sounds almost unbelievable to say it, but this was genuinely the case. The launch day version of Zaya, January 2016, there wasn't a single area to go underground. There was no cave, Jesus. no dungeon, not a single staircase, not a single basement going down. <laughs> nothing. What? Zero, zero ability to go underneath the the flat plane that was there. Holy. So there wasn't any, any sort of inclusion of that whatsoever. <laughs> so, yeah, this is sort of like, a, I think, a systemic thing that that stems back to that like why were the lovacane placed on the surface well because everything was placed on the surface at the launch of zaya that there was no underground system like the catacombs of kurend and oh man there's another discussion point because that has a whole like you know awkward history to it that yeah. kind of came in response to there are there isn't any dungeons and there's nothing <laughs> yeah. to do and all this kind of stuff so i they can't kind believe of let was... the pendulum swing too far in the other direction then and right here's a dungeon with everything in it yeah <laughs> in fact but yeah let's let's kind of talk about that let's talk about like neve's cave on release oh a lot of people oh, thought cave. yes so, yeah a lot of people <laughs> yeah. thought it was very private servery and yeah, everyone had kind of been asking like hey let's get some variety let's travel around the the place and then they threw out or and then they made the catacombs which is like literally just yeah. a neve's cave expanded almost just like everything's in there yeah it really was because like the neve's cave stuff that was i mean again shamelessly sharing of the links but like that was one of the ones that i tried to push for as well again i'm in no way shape or form the only person to have done that there was a lot of people talking about it for a very long time and i just sort of combined together a lot of suggestions and ideas on that one and yeah exactly what you said happened you know neve's cave awkward weird private servery it sort of grew over time and just sort of became the dumping ground of slayer um and yeah eventually you know broken up i think it's in a slightly better spot nowadays you know interesting vibrant locations around the game world but as you say the catacombs weirdly immediately took up the mantle that it previously had and then just added so much more so sort of added new slayer metas new barrage spots a new reason to just go there because of totem pieces and shards and everything and it was like oh yeah it, it's it monopolized slayer even more than neve's cave did in a way which is weird but yeah i think that's just the unfortunate reality of letting that that reaction of, you know, this thing is a problem. There's no underground. We want to add something and then just take it a bit too far. Yeah. But, you know, I think the catacombs are, well, probably going to be split up in a way that's already been started. Because with yeah. the and rework, they added the hill giants. Uh, hill they, giants, the giants, moss giants. There, and... Yeah, there's a, there's a little giants um, yeah. dungeon there, which counts as being in the catacombs. And it looks cool, it's all, too. Yeah, it's really nicely designed. And I think that was a part of 
probably i'm gonna credit mod west sorry if it wasn't him whichever artist did it but i think uh he wanted to sort of push for that as well because of you know player suggestions over the years of these monsters really should be located in more suitable places and yeah you know what at this stage maybe it's too much to try and disrupt metas and take away rewards and things but it's you not still keep okay. the rewards and to spread them up. yeah you go I, ahead on that I'll, i, I want to just saying it <laughs> yeah I, I just want to say that because like I, I don't think it's ever really too late to change something that's you know not working i, 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 I never agree. feel like it's agree. too late so 100 percent with you there yeah yeah it's just the, the, the practical reality i guess of trying to pitch things that are difficult to perceive as anything other than a nerf is yeah. obviously always going to be tough you know you're, you're going against the the tide on that one aren't you so it's it's going to be challenging um and yeah you know i've tried to pitch some slightly controversial things that would be probably perceived as nerfs and you know, i know it with middling response but it sucks to like have to kind of cross that by the community where, where a lot yeah. of people don't actually care about more of like the artistic balance and everything else sure, that yeah. goes along with it people just like what they have um, it's very that... to play in, oh, in the yeah. moment, your kind of, you know, your sphere of influence in your bubble. And that's fair enough. You know, the 99% of players are almost certainly just going to be logging into the game, doing what they like. And that's that, you know, that's yeah. fine. Nothing wrong with that either. But it is a shame when that kind of starts impacting what might be slightly better long-term balance for the oh. game. And yeah, it's it's a shame. But I was, is, I, I was very surprised that they even did any equipment balancing. I thought that was just never yeah. going to be a thing because it was just too much of a disruption. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right, definitely. I thought we'd sort of resigned ourselves to a fate of blowpipe scape for <laughs> yeah. many, many years to come. And yeah, that is genuinely surprising. So again, you know, yep. always, you know, I, I've, I've caught myself and I'm aware that I probably like many people but at least for myself probably been quite negative at many different times it's easy to point out the flaws and the criticisms yes. of like the old school team but i think you know credit where credit is due and I'll, I'll try and praise them where need be that's i think that's one area where you know they stood by their guns they said this needs to happen and i think yeah. they were right something needs to happen ideally many years earlier but you know what better late than never and hopefully the landscape going forward is going to feel a little nicer it's you know fingers crossed it does anyway yeah Okay, let's talk about a new skill. I yes. think it's Ooh, inevitable. Okay, I even yes. I even talk to high level players, and a lot of high level players that are maxed and everything really do want to see a new skill. I think everybody's yeah. kind of like kind of thinking it'll be good for the game. So that was not the case three years ago. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where, like many topics and, and old school as a game in general, it's. I mean, man, it's crazy to think about. We're about to hit the nine-year mark, not far off it. Yeah. This game is weird because to me, it still feels like the fresh and strange little side project that Jagex are doing, but so much more than that now. Um, but yeah, that one thing that is definitely observable and, and you can see has happened is that the gradual shift in player sentiment on a lot of topics over the years. You know, things that were met with fierce countering and, and criticism and, and negativity 2013, 14, 15, would these days be, you know, barely a blip on the radar, I think. And I definitely think skills would fall into that category, at least to some extent. Now, obviously, a skill is in many ways, arguably the biggest thing that you could kind of discuss kind of content wise, topic wise, in terms of game changing effect and what it could have. So it's understandable that's probably always going to be the most challenging topic to come towards and, and difficult to, to find full agreement on. But yeah, it's definitely one that I'm I'm certainly interested in. I have a bit of history surrounding, you know, talking about new skills and, and what they could be and how they could function and having skill pitches and ideas myself. And it's definitely a fascinating one to consider. And just to try and stem back to the conversation you, um, you know, before I so rudely interrupted you earlier, asking me about the direction of, you know, the community pitching ideas versus Jagex presenting skill ideas. Yeah. Yeah, that immediately obviously comes back to things like warding, which was something that you know, that came out of Jagex. That was a that was a Jagex driven idea, effectively. And they came out and showed it to the community. And I think you're right. In in core, in essence, I think for a skill to effectively have a hope of passing these days, and I think the old school team have sort of highlighted this and are well aware of it too at this stage. I think it does need to come from the community in some way shape or form yeah like i think it's gonna have to either be done collaboratively with them or some kind of idea it needs to be shared out there that just really captures people's imagination or something like that yeah i don't think warding was ever even addressed before that rune fest i don't think so no, no. i like i'll 
weirdly enough, I'll have to confess, like one of the strange little things of, you know, I shared a, a, a number of things over the years. And uh, one thing I tried to pitch some time ago, just because I'm a, I'm a bit of a fan of the old farming skill. I liked it. I tried to pitch a version of a farming guild before we ultimately end up getting a farming guild. And that was quite a funny one as well, because <laughs> I think I shared my interpretation of that. Maybe, I feel like it was maybe a few weeks or a month or so before a RuneFest that year. And I remember when I shared it, I had old, uh, I maybe won't say the name, but one of the mods messaged me and I'm like, why do you do this? I was like, huh? <laughs> like, what are the J mods? I was like, what? He's like, dude, we had a, we have a farming skill, a farming guild that we're going to be presented at RuneFest. And now everyone is going to throw a hissy fit that it's our one and not your one. And I was like, oh God, I'm oh so sorry for that bad timing. But I'm like, well, I guess great minds think alike sort of thing. Like, okay, you had your own farming guild plans. That's awesome. I mean, I'm happy. I, I just wanted to see a cool bit of expansion to farming and some more crops and things. But yeah, that, that was quite funny. But regardless of that, like at the end of my farming guild pitch at the time, I did include one little section, and that one section was like, hey, there's not many ways of making magic equipment. Wouldn't it be cool if you could grow certain kinds of fibers in a patch, like a, a flower patch or something, and then weave those fibers into magical cloth to make like blue wizard robes and basic things like that, like maybe even mystic robes with a high level one. And so I'll, I'll confess to being guilty to saying, yeah, I've, I personally have tried to pitch a version of making magic equipment. However, I included it as a part of like the existing sort of farming or crafting stuff. So. Yeah, seeing it come from a completely new skill was obviously one of the biggest points of contention. And again, I, I did a big old deep dive on warding. Yeah, I, I, I shared I... that as well and really tried to go like, I, I do also a little bit regret that one because I think there are a few areas where, again, like I'll, I'll try and highlight my own flaws where I can because I think I do have a tendency to, when you get tunnel visioned on something, it's difficult to sort of remember not to, not to, get too biased and too negative and i think there are a few occasions where i sunk into sort of shamelessly bashing or knocking something without being fair and, and constructive i think on yeah. the whole it was and the criticism i gave was reasonably valid and warranted but yeah maybe some of it could have been addressed slightly more nicely but yeah even sharing that like the old school team again um they actually reached out to me after that one it was like hey would you care to give a bit more feedback like privately and stuff as we're iterating on this and i was like yeah sure by all means you know if you're going to reach out to me the least i can do is try and assist so I, because I was the criticism I gave to warding initially, just to make my own uh, opinions known to people. If you're not aware, like I was, I'll, I'll say I think warding out of the three skills pitched, artisan sailing warding, I think it was actually the most robustly and well designed skill, in terms of the thought that had been put into it and the kind of the overall effort and the presentation. Um, however, I wasn't necessarily in favour of it, because I do think, I do think it, it hit a few fundamental kind of flaw had a few fundamental flaws and, and hit some early hurdles that are difficult to kind of get over for me at least and some of the big ones would simply be this idea of I, I think a new skill on some level should try its best to both try and bring some semblance of new to the game like it should have some kind of compelling new thing that aims to be a little bit exciting and capture people's interest a bit and also something that can't easily overlap with what's already there. Now, obviously, it might be challenging to figure out what that unique concept could be that doesn't, you know, easily fit into an existing skill category. But I do think it's possible. I think it's definitely doable. I've got some, you know, ideas that maybe, maybe I'll give you a bit of an early tease. I could maybe share some more things Ooh. with you in a bit okay. on skill front. Um, but yeah, for me, warding, it was just, it it overlapped just too heavily with, basically, with, with crafting, with magic, and with rune crafting. And however you span it like it just it didn't it didn't fully make sense to me as its own skill when i weighed up one of the sort of you know ways of analyzing it i'd say are all the existing skills that currently are in game going to be improved by the existence of warding and my kind of answer to that was actually no in fact some of them might actually end up worse off because yeah. at the minute you've got skills like room crafting which for all intents and purposes i would call the magic support skill in theory that's what it should be now it's not very well utilized at the minute and it's got its own problems but in theory that's what it should be and to me with this idea of adding warding as like the new magic support skill it'd be like well okay if there's any new magic tangentially related updates to be added where would they naturally go like well they'd almost certainly be put in warding because warding would be the new flashy thing and so as a result of that in the long term i think rune crafting would have suffered otherwise not getting things that probably would have been better served in that skill to help bolster it and boost it 
but instead would have been putting the the new shiny magic support skill warding and i completely agree by the way i just need to put that out yeah. there i it's, when warding was first pulled i was telling like everybody i was like this this won't like this makes no sense because we literally have crafting like if you wanted to yeah, craft some craft, wizard robes yeah. you'd craft them and then you would imbue them with magic and then boom like yeah. that's all you really need so that's what there was you know is it is essentially you know i think they had to kind of almost obfuscate things with language and use of things because again if you're boiling down that skill idea it was as you say it was a, a robe crafting skill at the yeah. core so naturally you'd say well if it's a using traditional cloths to craft an item why isn't it a crafting thing and if we yeah. already have at that time i well, would still zarishan robes would sort of set the precedent of being in the crafting skill just as a piece of cloth needle thread good old-fashioned stuff and it was working you know and and yeah i guess it's it's one of those things where sure if you were to go back and redesign the game again you probably would do a heck of a lot of things differently like very much differently and maybe one of those things you would do differently is think more carefully about how magic equipment comes into the game and maybe you'd think yeah multiple dedicated skills could work really nicely perhaps you somehow construct this idea of a, a split more like ranged has where fletching mostly makes weapons and ammunition and crafting mostly makes ranged armor maybe you could have done a similar thing for room for room crafting magic and like a new skill where room crafting does offensive things ammunition and weapons and then a warding type thing does armors but again it was sort of a it, it hit too many overlapping points for me and yeah. it also started to break down with the proposed training methods and things like that where like one of the core training loops was literally you know take inventory of resources to a runic like obelisk make the full set of magic stuff and then return to bank or do it as more of a bank standing skill just outside of a bank it's like you're mimicking rune crafting as a gameplay loop and rune crafting is one of the most disliked gameplay loops it's like ah i just can't get on board with that like i again you've started to see my biases come out really heavily soon but yeah. i'm i'm so on on board with the idea of yes a skill in all of its incarnations old and new they need to have a simple basic structure to it like a core element of the skill that's really you know intuitive and you know point click and wait because that's what almost all runescape actions are point yep. click and wait and you know that that needs to exist but at the same time i think if you're doing a new skill you need to try and bring some kind of new element to it some kind of f inject some life and some fun into it and think about okay players are going to be spending hours and hours and hours doing this so let's try in this day and age to make a skill that feels like it's worthy of the player's time to make something that feels a little bit more engaging even if it is just optional engagement right like and that's where i think warding kept things a bit too simple and and too too kind of it, it didn't move off the starting block on the training methods front and i think that was a shame i would have liked to have seen you know there's a lot of interesting concepts you could have done with warding and i even again i mentioned a bit earlier that i um you know the, the old school team reached out to me for more um feedback and things and i ended up giving them like a <laughs> 20 to 30 page Google document filled with images <laughs> and mock-ups and different ideas and things. And basically, you know, reiterating a lot of things I've said and trying to really explain carefully why and fairly and saying, okay, these are the types of things that would make it different for me where I might be more inclined to be, you know, in favor of it. And I pitched entire things like different mini game activities where you'd go around and chase down evil beings and have to draw wards to lure them out and defend citizens of Gilinor and extract runic energy from the crazy stuff. I don't know. I tried to make some, you know, interesting ideas out of it obviously it's all it's very difficult to express that to both the old school team and then to pass it on to the players to try and get them to you know get on board with a, a skill just when there's so much opposition to just a new skill as standard um you know but uh yeah it obviously all of that was ultimately not to be but like yeah. i said warding i think warding i'd say is almost the polar opposite to what sailing had where warding had one of the most grounded and genuinely robust designs to it in terms of they really thought what they wanted to do with warding and why i just don't necessarily agree that the why was fully warranted yeah Whereas i think they were sailing, pushing the why just yeah it wasn't it was like artificial almost yeah yeah in a sense yeah and then you know sailing many years prior is kind of the opposite end of that spectrum where it was very ethereal and intangible and like wouldn't it be kind of cool if you were like on a ship and out and doing stuff and adventuring and dungeoneering at sea question mark or making ships or who knows you could have all this weird reward content and sailing was just like all over the place as like a design pitch when they when they sold it to the players but there was no solid groundwork of what truly sailing would look or feel like um and even play. to this day but, nobody really knows they just I, yeah i mean yeah, i sure. want sailing but i don't have I mean, no idea what it would entail yeah like don't <laughs> draw through my post history again because you'll find i'm 
to a fan of sailing and i've, I've attempted that repitch in the past too um and I, I even now i look back on that version of sailing that i tried to repitch and I, I don't particularly like that version anymore i would do a lot of things differently but the big thing that appeals to me is just that it's the idea that it's it's an adventure skill and like uh man, there's there one point in time where i almost wanted to try and pitch this idea of like a fifth skill category because a lot of people you know talk about things like dungeoneering come up a lot with this mini game skill and that was very much it was mini game in its execution in being so you know isolated so restricted to one location it had this mini game interface and reward point system and it was all so closed in and forced and everything was very arbitrary about it um but to me the idea of what the gameplay with dungeoneering was was fantastic like i genuinely loved it i thought the gameplay loop is solid you have to go and adventure and and you know had these explorable dungeons and things that's that's it's just fun I, at least i found it fun yeah uh, i know dun dungeoneering still to this day is a very contentious skill slash mini game uh but it, it you know for, for all intents and purposes i think the gameplay was solid you know you can see the spiritual successes in old school that a lot of people point towards whether it's james as eric or gauntlet and they do capture hints of that of what dungeoneering did to me nothing's ever struck truly what dungeoneering managed to accomplish and i think that's purely because of the variety the sheer quantity of variables that dungeoneering had where you never fought the exact same boss well i mean you could but it was rare to get you know a string of the same final boss or the same series of challenge rooms or monsters to fight or puzzles to solve in the exact same dungeon layout whereas you know a chambers of Zeric kind of thing is well it's it, it's so devoid of appropriate variables and options that people can literally scout it right like dungeoneering was unscoutable yeah. for many different reasons and, and chambers is the opposite of that people can really you know, it, there's there's such a limited number of things that you can pick and choose which ones you want to take on. And the final boss is always the same. And the gauntlet, the final boss is always the same. And you just working towards the same goal. So to me, it, they, they never quite accomplished that same feeling of going into a dungeoneering floor and truly not knowing what you were going to be coming up against. Yep. Not knowing what the end boss was going to be. Not knowing what challenges you'll get along the way. And I genuinely don't think we've had a piece of content that really replicates that to the same extent. Um but yeah, again, like that idea of a uh, you know, dungeoning was implemented kind of poorly, too much like a mini game. But I like the idea of the adventurous nature of it. And, and as mentioned, I, I kind of like the idea of just having like adventure sort of skills, you know, not just being a, a gathering or a production or a combat or a support, but where the skill concept is more, yeah, you know, you're going out in the world, whether it's a sailing skill or an exploration skill or a reworked dungeoneering skill, something like that. I, there's always something like that that speaks to me because that's just kind of, it harks back to where the game kind of was at its core and what I think a lot of us perhaps lose sight of as we become older and more jaded gamers focusing yeah. on gains and efficient training and grinding out the same piece of content for 200 hours to try and get a <laughs> thing ticked off in a log yeah. right like we, we all lose sight a little bit yeah. it's very easy to do so the more we play and and forget that this is a game and games are meant to be fun I mean obviously to each their own fun is subjective I will fully acknowledge and appreciate that but I think there is, you know, there's something to be said for really trying to to make that core gameplay loop feel fun and exciting and adventurous. And that's why concepts like sailing and, and dungeoneering or exploration are quite interesting to me for that that sort of uh, that adventure aspect. And speaking of, you know, that this idea of kind of splitting the concept from the content is something, you know, if, if I could insert any thought process into the collective brain of everyone in the old school community, It'd probably be that, this idea of, I would love it if we could more regularly take concepts, but not be beholden to the content. Because I think Dungeoneering was a great concept, but I didn't think the execution of it was all that great. But there's nothing wrong with the concept of exploring dungeons and fighting mini bosses and taking on challenges and puzzles and things. Yep. And there's probably ways of doing that. In fact, I think there definitely is ways of doing that that would still work as a compelling skill, even an old school skill. You know, if that dungeon had been spread across every existing cave and dungeon complex in game with a little expanded area in Tavoli and underneath the Lumbridge Swamps and in the Fremenic Slayer Cave, and if every dungeon had a little extra part of it and some of them randomly generated, some of them static, some of them with a mixture of combat and puzzle and skilling, like that would have transformed dungeoneering. You, know, you remove the reward point aspect, remove the minigame shop aspect, and let all the monsters in these dungeons just drop things that are tradable. Then all of a sudden you've got this skill that's baked into the entire world without any really rigidly enforced minigame aspects. And yeah, yeah it's, it starts to move in a direction that's a bit more compelling. And that, that's what I mean by the concept is cool. It's just the content, the way the original content was executed, maybe not so much. And I think too many people get hung up on a concept coming exactly as the original content piece did. 
And I think that has really stifled things over the years. But this, you know, it, it, it taps into the whole discussion of how strongly do we stick to the rigid core of nostalgia, the 2007 RuneScape, and at what point do you sort of relinquish that and accept that there's there's a balancing act that needs to be had, this set of scales, where on the one side you have some of the familiarity and the, the 2007 nostalgia aspect, but on the other side, maybe it's better to have something new and different. And, you know, you can never truly know if you can make something better unless you do try something a little bit different. And I think that's a shame when you just bring back the same content as it was, you're almost limiting your, your sort of peak potential, right? You're putting an artificial cap on it because you kind of know what's good about it, but you also know what's bad about it. And you've already experienced it once before. And whether it's, you know, something coming back and maybe this is not the best time to have this conversation because it's like next is just on the horizon. <laughs> and it's like Soul Wars this year. And we're sort of in this new era now where we're starting to pillage more heavily from 2008 to 2011. Yeah. It's, sort of, it's an interesting time. But again, I just, I just wish the conversation could be more open and more more sort of progressive in terms of discussing concepts rather than immediately shutting them down because you didn't like the original content that the concept was surrounding, right? Yeah. I I need to bring up something quickly about the sailing. I've, yeah. I've been scrolling through it. And I've just been like, oh, I have... Okay, so I just got to say, I'm very, very passionate about this game. And yes. I love ideas like this. And it makes my head start like spinning, like thinking of all these other things. So I get really distracted <laughs> looking at all these graphics. But uh, I think, and I've, I've mentioned this before. In fact, I had a guest on we just talked about sailing for like half of the cast probably like two hours <laughs> yeah. and and just like ideas of it and like just and i thought what would be so cool about sailing is um like the exploration of it and as well as like it would unlock new places so one of my ideas was like varlamore would be locked behind sailing you would have to like trade yeah. goods over to them to unlock that place and there would be other areas that would be only like they would be exclusively unlocked through sailing. Yeah. And it's just oh my god, like I'm just I freak out about like I want sailing so bad. Yeah. And I have to say as well, um there is a completely new form of PVP that could come from sailing where you're you Yeah, you have your ship and you're I, against I, I, somebody I, I, else. Yarr. Yeah. But the thing is like it can be completely made from scratch and perfectly balanced. Because yeah. right now we have PvP that's like, okay, we got to keep up the the old metas. We got to, you know, kind of uh, appeal to this group and appease these Tell people. Like line yeah, but it. with sailing, it's just you have a brand new clean slate. Oh, yeah, I think that's what I like about a lot of skill ideas. It does give you that opportunity to try something a little bit different, but hopefully still within the confines of what is comfortably and suitably old school. And I genuinely do believe there are a lot of ways you can do that. Um, and yeah, not just with, you know, sailing, but I, oh yeah, I, there have been times I've thought about doing a sailing skill repitch uh, on a few occasions. There's, there's one other skill that I've worked quite heavily on, which I'll perhaps segue into in just a bit, because I'd maybe have something to tease about there as well. Um, but yeah, like sailing is uh, definitely, is always going to be, it's going to hold a little spot in my heart, um, <laughs> whether I would ever see it any day and thinking about all the different ways it could come. As, as you said, you know, locking places behind, just the ability to sail somewhere new and feeling that sense of excitement to come from it and what sort would be interesting way of doing like you said you know whether it's valamore or i always thought what make what would make sense for sailing is obviously you're sailing out on the ocean you probably want to go and visit some little islands and a little chain yep. of islands and assuming so far the old school team seem to be mostly keeping consistent like law wise with you know rs3 stuff um unless they like explicitly contradict but it seems to generally follow a similar path and one thing that's noteworthy is uh the eastern lands were established to be basically a, a it's an archipelago of, of islands like it's a big chain of islands that just gradually goes further and further out east and i thought oh wouldn't that be a cool way of doing a sailing Ooh, skill if you've got yeah. this collection of little islands it's like level 10 you've accessed the first island of the eastern lands level 20 here's the second island of the eastern lands and it gets deeper and deeper and by like level 80 here's like a new raid dungeon on this eastern lands island yeah and, oh, you know, a new resource God. on the level 70 island and oh that could be a fun way of sort of you know, getting access to some new things. You know, some might say it could be a bit of feel, could feel a bit artificially gated, but it, it, I think it's difficult to do anything truly organically if you're talking about skill locking things. And but yeah, I, I, there's something about that concept that really sort of feels compelling to me. Yeah. And and just again that sense of excitement and wonder that comes from you know tre treading into the unknown and and sailing uncharted waters and finding cool things on the other side and all the things you could do with it. So 
I need to ask what if yeah. if there were to be a new skill, what would it be? Would it be sailing? Ooh, if, if if it I was mean, up to you, up to me, and oh, and gosh. and I'm talking like in a, a like the perfect idea of any skill that you would choose. So like, not what you know maybe. Maybe sailing wouldn't turn out as good as another yeah. skill, but like the the perfect ideal sailing would be what you wanted. So what would be like the perfect ideal skill? Possibly. It's it's so difficult to answer that. And sorry, I'm I'm gonna give another long and rambling answer if that's okay. Yeah, go for We're it. We're getting to the real answer. Cause this opens up a big discussion point, I think, which is where we've kind of faltered, I think, in the past as a as a community, which is this idea of okay when skills have come up, it's always been, here's a specific skill idea. Do you want it or do you not? Yeah. And it's it's been devoid of this wider conversation of, okay, well, what is the nature of a new skill in old school? What place does it have in game? And what should it look like? And how should it sort of exist? And that's like, man, I've, I've badgered onto the old school team a number of times. And I've so many other people have, and I think there's internal desire to do it as well. But there's one thing I think we need more than anything else. It's just I'm pretty sure it's never actually properly been done just as a single unambiguous question. But we just, we need a poll to start with that says, hey, community, not not a guaranteed content poll question, but interest gauging. Do you actually want a new skill at some point in the game's future? Yes or no? Assuming a good enough skill idea comes along. Like we need to have at least some benchmark to know how many people are just on board with the concept of new skills to yeah. begin with. That That has to be like a step one at some point. And then going in from that, it's like, okay, so how do we approach the topic of new skills? Because just depending on how you present it, I think, again, artisan sailing, warding, really fascinating to look at, not just for the skill ideas themselves, but for the community reaction and how they were perceived. Because they all kind of took different paths and different journeys to get to where they were. Sailing was very abstract, too, too light on the detail, I think, um, to really like get people on board with the idea of it being a skill. Warding, on the other hand, almost the opposite too in depth too much iteration it had so much going on in terms of the nitty gritty little points of detail that i think people already got it in their heads haven't we already voted no to this thing i saw so much yeah um you know <clears throat> mis misunderstanding and misinformation before the warning poll had even come out thinking haven't we already voted no to this it's just like nah it's just gone through like six months of revisions and that was too much there was just too much iteration which is unfortunate because working with the community to refine something should be ideal but clearly yeah. there's like a, a point of no return almost where it's like peak saturation and information overload so and it's, it's got to be a sweet spot too and it's that first impression that completely tells it's like so the person important. whether they want it or not and then even like revisions like people won't even look at revisions because they've already decided yeah. from the first impression now and i think that was that was warding's ultimate failure i think it, yep. it it in hindsight it sounds cruel to say but it probably failed on the stage at RuneFest. It did. Like, it, it, enough people for, forming their own ideas in their head before they'd seen any information for it and thinking, yeah. nope. And then not bothering to, you know, go through the... Which, fair enough, it's it's difficult to expect every player to want to sift through, like, thousands of words of page after page after page of dev blog and, and it was, documents. It was, it was really sad to hear because I've, I've had J-Mods on the cast and, like, we were talking about warding and just their... Try, like... They were yeah. getting people thinking that there was still these robes that they had yeah, scrapped yeah. like two iterations before, but people still had that in their mind. It's just so sad because there's no way to get through to them at that yeah, point. It's, it's just, just over. So, yeah, I think all that highlights, okay, to approach a skill discussion in general, there's going to have to be some weird situation where you need to be able to somehow work with the community to form the idea first and then present it just the one time. Yeah. But then there's also this this deeper question to ask, which is, okay, what are some of the reasons why a new skill will fail? And especially compared to other pieces of content, why are some people gonna come in and just say, I'm gonna blanket vote no, no matter what happens? Because I think that's gonna be the key to understanding if a new skill should come in or how it would come in if it could. And and seeing why those no voters are voting no. Like there's always gonna be a certain percentage of people who vote no to everything and yeah. new skills are no exception. So there's kind of category one, okay. Whatever percentage that may be. But then I reckon there's going to be a sort of sliding scale. People who are like, uh, I'd probably vote no to a new skill because of X, Y, or Z. And that's where this could get into some controversial territory now, but I, I think it's worth having the discussion, even if it's really heavily prefaced with like, yeah, we're just spitballing ideas. You don't need to, you know, get all up in a frenzy, start a riot, take your pitchforks and cannons to Valador. Like, just hold on. You know, it, if we can have those conversations to begin with and it's things like, okay, what else might be driving people away? One of the big things I think is 
well, a new skill is just different from every other piece of content. And a lot of people will vote on a new skill based on whether or not it's what in their mind would be the perfect new skill to have. So like you asked me, what's the one skill I would add? It's like, ah, it's difficult to say. I think I have one answer in mind at the minute that I'll get onto in a bit, but it's, it's still difficult for me to just want to say one, just commit to one. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the challenging question was like, well, should the question be, you know, just talking about one new skill because unlike anything else in game, you know, people will vote in a new quest, even if it's a new a quest series they don't really care for, because, then, you know, eventually down the line, there'll be new quests in different quest series. I might vote yes to a elf quest, but I don't care because I know eventually there's going to be a new dwarf quest or a new gnome quest or something. And same for PVM. You might get PVMers who are like, yeah, I'll, I'll vote yes to a new solo boss, but all I really care about is like a big group raid. Yeah. And they don't mind that because they know eventually down the road, they're going to get what they want. You know, they'll, they'll vote for things outside of their area of interest because they know eventually they're going to get the thing they do like. But with a new skill, sadly, I don't think we have that because there's just no guarantee of what the future holds. Yeah. And a lot of the conversation is talking about maybe possibly we get one new skill, which means suddenly everyone is voting on that new skill, or at least a certain portion of people will be, not based on just, is this one new skill idea pretty good? Is it good enough to warrant implementing? But is it better than every other skill idea ever formed ever? And is it better than my yeah. personal preference for a skill idea ever? That's a good And point. that's where things break down. It breaks down because now people are not just judging it based on itself, but they're judging it off of every other hypothetical skill idea that could ever exist, has existed, or will exist. And that's where things just really crumble. And it's such a challenge going to get to get over that hurdle, I think. And it's you know that's why I think maybe it's worth just experimenting with changing the type of conversation. It's like, okay, well, firstly, again, I still think starting with that initial poll question: Do people like the idea of a new skill? We yeah. we need to know. Is there more than like comfortably more than seventy five percent of people? Because if there's not, this whole conversation is moot. So yeah. Just kill it now and move on, because nothing ain't gonna happen. Um, I'm almost certain if, if, if there was, oh, sorry, I, if there was an interest yeah. poll, I'm certain it would be over 75. In fact, I'd think it would be more oh, like I'm, close to 90. I'm, I'm in agreement. I think it would, again, it's, you know, it's putting our necks out a bit, isn't it? <laughs> if it ever happens, but yeah. I, I do think it would get a comfortable over 80%. I really do think so. Um, just for, you know, if it was understood that the poll was just gauging interest, you like yes. the idea of a new skill coming in at some point. Nothing too intimidating, um, just an interest Yeah, poll. exactly. Yeah. Trying to keep it, you know, who... <laughs> Lighthearted. <laughs> yeah, nothing too out there. But then there's this idea of, okay, well, should we start rethinking how skills work or what a new skill even means or what it looks like? Start to break down some of those no votes and, and how do we tackle that problem of pitching all different skill ideas against one another? One idea, and again, like prefacing this, it's... it's controversial for some people and it's going to really make some people flinch and recoil and be like oh no don't go that far ahead oh god this is too game changing but maybe one method or one path forward you could take is well perhaps you look at the game from a five to ten year plan which sounds a bit outlandish and ridiculous but maybe you start doing that and if you establish there's a desire and appetite for new skills because this initial poll said 80 to 90 percent yes it's like okay well maybe we say over the next five to 10 years, perhaps we do humor the idea of two to three new skills in that period. And it's like, okay, now if you talk about a longer period of time and more than one skill idea, that might start getting people on board with the idea of, okay, well, we can start judging ideas based on the individual idea themselves and be confident that just because my preferred idea didn't come in this time, it's not completely shot down forever. Yeah. So that might push people forward, but equally, the opposite could happen and it could have the completely adverse effect and people are like whoa why are you trying to pitch more than one new yeah. skill now oh god what's going on so it could be just as disastrous if not more so so that's why it's you know as i say controversial topics but i think they're worth having these discussions to try and figure out what path to take yeah that's one possible one another one is again i'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going down this you know weird way of thinking and new styles of of implementing things um this is kind of like a, a two for one um because one one side of things is no voters that well, maybe some people really like the current setup and they don't want to they don't want to look at their skill page and have it be different they don't want a 24th icon there they don't want to calculate their total level out of anything other than 2277 and they don't want to lose their max cape and to that it's like well okay but maybe you don't have to maybe we don't rigidly lock ourselves to how skills were implemented in the past but we take a true unique approach for old school what if we just simply say, you know, you could reclassify without actually changing anything, what the max cape represents. You could say right now, 
the max cape requires getting level 99 in all 23 old school skills. Because that's exactly what it requires right now. Yep. And then hypothetically, you could release a new skill and say, well, that's not an old school skill. So it doesn't require it to equip max cape. But if you do max the new skill, you get a shiny new little trim and you can get a trim max cape. Same stats, cosmetic difference, no changes. But, you know, it sort of makes a distinction for people who don't want to engage with a new skill. They're just like, oh, I was really close to maxing. And I just want to look at my 23 skills that I've got. Yeah. They could still do that in theory if you went with that particular system and, and you start breaking down potential pressure points like, you know, what the max cape represents to people. Um, but again, like some people might really, really dip like that and be like, oh, no, you're sort of diluting what it means to be a max cape. And you yeah. have some people who are maxed, they're not really maxed and others, you know, like messy, like trims and stuff. So I'm again, glad. Like yeah, no, I'm just they're saying like, I'm, I'm glad you're thinking of these things because I don't think many people do think of this. I think you're very thoughtful yeah. where it comes to like a new skill and like the the player bases and different players, how they would react to things. I yeah. don't even think of these things, but now you're bringing up really good points of like, this is how a new skill should be implemented asking yeah, these questions to, really, to the community yeah, we break things down yeah the final one is probably way too controversial but it's like the the ultimate end point of like okay how do you get new skills in and talk about them again without all of these previous problems and it's like well okay if people don't want to lose their max cape they don't want to see the skills interface change they don't want to have to look at it and they they you know don't want to just vote in one skill because it's not their preferred skill then maybe you almost go in the direction of well maybe we almost create kind of like a you know the quest tab and the the achievement diary tab have little sub tabs maybe i have a sub tab for the skills icon the, the skills tab interface and so the default stays exactly as it is it's the skills you know and love calculated out of 2277 total but maybe there's a second tab and you open that second tab and boom it's maybe all the old skills plus new ones as well or just a list of new skills there calculating a new total level so you're kind of potentially giving players flexibility and choice to be like, I just want to play the game and look at the old skills I always have done, look at my old total level as I always have, and just keep playing the game as I always have. Yeah. But then you've got this little, you know, little interface tweak where you can just click a button and then boom, there it is. There's some new things alongside it. So maybe it's conversations like that that need to happen that might, you know, again, I, I really don't know because for as many people it might win over, it might push people away because yeah. it feels like, ooh, you're messing with interfaces. So it's tough to say, but that's, I think it's still valuable having the conversation yes if you, if you never have the conversation you'll never know what the outcome will be so yeah there, there are lots of different ways of tackling that i think um and, and different pathways you need to go down almost before you start getting to a specific skill idea so i guess this is could segue into that now I'll actually attempt to answer your question after a very long-winded tangent of uh what skill would i want to see well like i said i I would really struggle to give you one categorical answer where I'd be like, I want this over everything else without any kind of question or exception. Yeah. There's one thing that probably just pips out over everything else at the minute. And I'll, I'll I've got maybe one little teaser image. I'll, I'll give you on that one. Okay. We can talk about it in for a little bit. Um, but yeah, like, as I've said, there are lots of little elements I'd love to see about different things. And, you know, I'd, I'd be totally cool seeing a, a revamp sailing skill or, even though you know, a completely reimagined dungeoneering concept or, you know, I've seen a really cool pitches for like exploration skills or even people who have, and myself, I've sort of partially concepted what an exploration skill would be if you just ballooned it and broadened it and made an exploration skill broken down into multiple parts. And you, know, you had sailing exploration and cave exploration and all these different things as a part of an all encompassing one new skill. And maybe that's the way you get a new skill in is just by having multiple sub skills in it. Um, but there's, yeah, there's, there's lots of different interesting ideas. There's, there's probably one that has sat with me for quite a while now that originally was incepted by another fellow community member, actually. So I'll, I'll give them a big shout out because they go by the name of Caveman Only. Okay. Um, oh, okay. I already know where it's going, but I'm excited as hell. Okay, okay. cool. Con yeah. Continue. Yeah. He, uh, yeah. He was, he was one of the, the uh, chaps that actually sang your praises as well. So I was like, oh, okay. I made a good decision coming on here. So yeah, he uh, speaks highly of you. Awesome. Yeah. And no, Caveman was a, uh, yeah, it was someone I'd spoke to quite some, it was quite a few years back now. We both had a bit of a, you know, a good old time uh, working on things and then just life getting in the way, sadly. But we've spent some some good time concepting different ideas and talking about skills in general. He had one skill idea that sort of, it just sparked something in me. That I was like, you know what, that's, that's interesting because it's different. It's really different than anything I've heard before. And it has a certain like subtle, simple charm to it has this sort of potential scope for some really interesting gameplay and possibly reward options as well. And 
that's essentially this idea of well i guess i'll just come out and say it but this idea of a bad skill so being a bad a bad in the sense of you're a you're a musician you're a, a player of instruments you're a storyteller you're a performer you're a composer you're an entertainer and again when i hark back to the earlier conversation about what you know what elements make a good or a, a bad skill why did certain previous ones fail and what would I look at? To me, again, I'd, I'd always look immediately at the existing skills we have in game and break them down conceptually and thematically. Okay, this idea, where does it fit into an existing category? And it, to me, that feels like, well, where would you put being a bard, a performer and, and player of musical instruments? I kind of wouldn't put it in anywhere because it just, it would feel shoehorned. Like you couldn't put it in mining or crafting or layer or what like it just it doesn't really feel like it fits anywhere yeah. so immediately that's like one okay there's like there's one step off the starting block now we're like okay we're getting somewhere interesting um and then just the possibilities of what you could do with a bard skill then okay what does it represent what does it sort of mean um to me it could mean a lot of things and starting from very simple to very interesting and, and complex potentially this idea of Firstly, using a lot of existing skills, which I think is always a good thing for a new skill to do. As mentioned earlier, again, I think a good new skill would improve and elevate the existing skills that are in game. That's why it, it sometimes disappoints me or disheartens me when people are like, don't do a new skill, you just need to update existing skills. It's like, well, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. In fact, a good new skill should improve and update existing skills alongside it. Yep. Like that could be one of the best ways of buffing old skills is alongside a new skill in some capacity. So that's always an interesting one where this idea of, well, you know, maybe you have old skills that you used to gather resources with your wood cuttings and your minings and all that good stuff. And you're using your fletching and, and smithing and crafting to process old materials as well as new resources into musical instruments. And now you've got this range of interesting musical instruments and possible gameplay opportunities that you could use them for, starting from perhaps very simple and, and almost kind of cosmetic and one side of what I like of a new skill, which maybe isn't going to be the biggest selling point to the average player, but to me, it also taps into that idea of what I said earlier again, of this is a game and we, we should kind of remember that it's, it's for fun. It's a big social MMO and it's nice when I think things just tap into that side of it. So this idea of music being a part of this skill as a bard and what you could do with instruments and potentially just letting people sort of ambiently play instruments around the game or perhaps even figure out ways of adding small user-generated uh, musical track implementation. I mean, we already have really basic versions of that. There are things in, I think even one of the recent released uh, clan like hall things, you can go, go to a piano and press the keys on it and it plays <laughs> yeah. the notes. So <laughs> yeah. there's like, there's, there's hints, like there's, there's hints of this already in game. I'm already, uh, of this idea of, I, I'm thinking yeah. of that quest uh, where you're in Paul Divniche and you play the little flute for the snake yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, you've got, uh, yeah, you got the snake charm there. And also, obviously, another big one is you've got the Fremenic Trials where you grab your lyre. Yeah. And you try to put that. However, this kind of adds in, and trust me, we've done... I'm, I'm talking about this quite loosely at the minute, but I'll go into a little bit more detail, not too much. But we've gone into a lot of depth and thought on this over time. And we've tried to uncover every rock we could. And so, yeah, things like the Fremenic Trials where you know, you're dealing with bards and olaf the bard to win him over but yeah the character explicitly states in that quest oh i can't put on the performance because i i'm not skilled enough to play this instrument oh. i don't know how <laughs> so you have to go to that strange fish woman ghost thing and get yeah. your liar enchanted to magically play it for you so you kind of cheat because you're not a real bard and that's how you pass that part of the fremenic trials so it's like okay there's already like some lore things of lore game yeah. bards that exist and you know, there's in more recent years things that have been really compelling to see where it's, there's little bands of troubadours and bards that talk about the college of bards in the kingdom of Valamor in this city called Oh Tempestus. my god. <laughs> that's now established in the game's like canon. That's, that's like in law now. There is this college of bards. It's a location. I don't know what it was planned for, what what why the old school team kind of concepted it or anything, but it's there. It's in the city of Tempestus, and there are some musicians and bards that travel around the game now. And so you've kind of got all of these little hints, these these sprinklings of ideas, and then starting to think a bit deeper about okay, gameplay opportunities. And I feel like at this point, I'm I feel like I should uh, pause and give you a little like visual aid because I I, I I don't know we've got so just to spoil things. We, as I say, we've been working on like I've I've been primarily collaborating with Caben on this for on and off for quite some time, starting a long time ago, and we've taken long old pauses from it and put the project down for many 
kind of many months at a time at, at different points. Um, and also had some different involvement from other members about the also earlier mentioned uh, Gnome or Screetmonge that we mentioned. He's also yeah. contributed to this too um, and given some fantastic valuable input too, as well as some really cool looking assets. But there's like, there's a whole host of things we have that we're sort of sitting on at the minute from visual concepts to big design documents to spreadsheets and all sorts. But this um, is exciting thought, me out of control, yeah. by the way. I'm thought, thinking of, well, you know what? I'll, uh, yeah, I'll go put for one it. little, okay. one yeah, little we, easy I'll... showcase visual thing just to like I whet see some it. appetites <laughs> and intentionally. So again, it's like, so this is, it's a bit of a chaotic collage, I'll call it. <laughs> I intentionally didn't want to like really like intensely give any sort of concrete detail or I, I, I actually don't want to present this in a way that sort of this is exactly how it would work and this is exactly yeah how it's structured that's scary kind of thing, right the community exactly yeah. so I, I want to kind of i try to figure out why okay how can i take some of these visual elements we've got for now and then sort of talk over them a bit so obviously been talking a while now and i'll again it looks a bit janky and ropey but i, I pulled all these different bits together quite hastily and uh, i wanted to make something like i said it's intentionally a bit chaotic um just to sort of something that's a bit visually fun to uh, to sort of look at. So I think that is that it. Oh, Hopefully I put the right okay. thing up there. So Pull yeah, up. if you can sort of see that image, does that come through? Yep. Cool. Um, yeah, as you can tell, it's just like a bit of a a weird mishmash of some things, some interfaces, some in-game, some assets, some instruments, and just. Basically, like, uh, I made a bit of a mood board, right? It's like a bit of a weird little collage, if you can tell. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so you can sort of, like, you know, infer from it what you will, take from it what you want kind of thing. And uh, yeah, sort of, like, trying to, you know, sow a few seeds of, of intrigue, at least, on what this could be. And yeah, sort of starting from, as I mentioned before, you know, I, I like the idea of the skill covering, I, I like the idea of a, being a bard, and a bard is a skill because of all the different areas it can cover. Like I already mentioned the idea of, you know, the more social and sort of fun side, the creative side that feels very old school to me because of the whole, you know, community driven nature of the game. This idea of if you could somehow get some community driven musical element, that feels quite fun to me. It feels very, very old school. Oh, very that would be amazing. The game is. So there's that side of things. And obviously, <laughs> you know, people might care more about, well, okay, what's the actual like gameplay? And obviously this is where, you know, learning from the, the pitfalls of warding and sailing and us and everything before it I want to be careful not to kind of again be be careful with the details as it were and and just sort of talk about overviews but to me i think the way we see this and, and caveman and myself we've, we've always seen this as a skill of multiple parts that aim to appeal to almost every player type and also aim to have like a purpose and serve a wider function whether it's kind of mechanically or reward based and so this could be starting as a really simple thing Maybe you're a humble bard, you've made your instrument somewhere, perhaps you visited a special kind of a newly acquired you know, musical workshop location, which is uh, somewhere you can take some resources perhaps and make instruments. Now you've got an instrument and you've gone out there in the world and you're, perhaps you're playing at a specific little, you know, little spot somewhere in a, in a little public location and putting on a little public performance. And perhaps these are sort of shared amongst players. So there's little areas to congregate and maybe near Falador or Varrock or Ardi or iconic locations where a lot of you can kind of gather and just click on something and just start playing an instrument and sort of watch your character play. And that might be like a really simple introduction, you know, talking about a basic core foundation of a skill idea, which is just point, click and wait, which I think a lot of skills kind of need. Yep. Um, I think that'd be, you know, I think it kind of just writes itself almost having a, a bard skill where you just, you have an instrument and you just kind of you interact with something with a click and then you just sort of watch your character play for a bit and, and get a little trickle of XP. And it's a very social laid back AFK sort of thing. So and I think there are, Sorry, I, need, I need to just uh, interrupt real quick. I yeah. have, first of all, I'm already, I'm already obsessed with this idea and I have a ton yeah. of, I, I'm thinking like one thing is like, um, imagine how cool it would be is if you level up an instrument and you can make aggressive monsters passive by playing a tune. Ooh, so you go into it, be... like, imagine you go into an area, like, let's just say you were like a skiller, like a level one and you want to get to a dangerous area, but you're trying to cross White Wolf Mountain, but you're a you're a bard, and you yeah. can like just turn all the wolves peaceful. Like it's almost like the ultimate version of the the original, you know, snake charm. That's yeah. kind of exactly what a snake charm was meant to be to sort of pacify those sort of scary oh. python things. But there's all sorts of interesting ways you could take it, and uh, yeah. I think one of the underlying ways I will say, like the way we've kind of approached it, has always been with a very 
we've been we've been cautious in in all different ways and how it'd be meta impacting because mm-hmm. obviously it's that's one of the most challenging parts right of getting a skill right is figuring out how impactful to make it what metas do you try and change what don't you and some areas areas where we feel are a bit kind of off limits and one thing we thought well you know, in, in, perhaps in other games, you might have a bard be sort of a, a class, and almost like a combat discipline or a support in and of itself. We think, well, I think combat skills in general and things that directly affect, you know, a combat type thing would probably be stepping over the line and, and maybe not really suitable or needed. So anything that directly impacts that, we've always sort of strayed away from. But it's definitely interesting you say sort of like pacifying creatures is sort of, I think, skirting the periphery of that to an acceptable degree, perhaps. You know, that, that, I think there's some interesting concept there of, you know, it doesn't really make anything, um, you know, ultra efficient from like a combat training standpoint. It doesn't change any metas from that, but it does open up a new channel for sort of skilling and, and that kind of non-combat side of things. So that's an interesting way of looking at it, I think. And yeah, yeah. I'm even, sort of a, I'm, I'm thinking sorry, of like, uh, I know, uh, I think it was, I think it was Kemp Q that was doing like a, like a, I think it was a 10 HP account. He was trying to do master clues with it. So we'd have to set his yeah. cannon down to kill the wizards. Like, but if you had a bard skill, you could just initiate a tune and they would just instantly become like, I don't know, like zombies. Like they're yeah. just entranced in this music. And so you can just do what I, I think. I don't think yeah. there has to be a crazy yeah. combat purpose to anything. I think it's no, no. Yeah. And that's sort of the direction we've gone is, is thinking, you know what, like what, what areas of the game truly need some extra love and, and, you know, attention. And I think we pretty quickly and unanimously agreed like, well, non-combat quite frankly like you know slay escape is kind of a thing people go on these endless chains of you know killing bosses for all their supplies and resources and poor old skills and on combats the gathering and production have always felt a bit lackluster and again immediately just from the get-go of, of incorporating them as like resources and production materials and skill requirements to make instruments like immediately there's like a feed in yeah. and then you can have that feedback loop go back again by having instruments do just subtle little things perhaps in non-combat activities and there's other things that could potentially go into there, but I'm still trying to very carefully juggle how much information to give versus how vague to be and that <laughs> yeah. kind of stuff. But, um, oh, this is exciting. But, uh, the training methods, from, like, as I mentioned, like, you, you know, you could start simple with just sort of AFK socially playing an instrument along with lots of other players with little perhaps interactions that occur every so often. But then you've got this potential, and that's something we, we talked about a lot, me and Caveman, about, you know, okay, well, what level do you go beyond that? You know, because I think a new skill does need some more oomph to it. It needs some more impactful and new gameplay. It's like, well, you know, what is what is a bard? And you know, there's lots of different things you can do from, you know, types of storytelling, and there's all sorts of crazy sort of mini quest opportunities, I think there. But it's sort of you know, this this musical aspect is obviously going to be a you know part of the heart of it, and and the sort of rhythmic uh, aspect. And it's something we sort of really started thinking about was, well, the players already kind of play in a very rhythmic way, perhaps without realizing it, and that's because of the tick rate. The server cycle is 0.6 yep. seconds, and people have years now especially in more modern old school times. That sounds like an oxymoron, but you know what I mean? <laughs> um, in, in more recent times, like tick manipulation, for example, has just kind of become the norm. It's just become standardized almost. And so you've got these players who are out there doing this thing, you know, things like clicking their, double clicking their prayers every tick to a technically, you know, 100 ticks per minute. It's like a 100 BPM cycle yep. performing a certain action. It's like, well, well look, we we already have sort of this rhythmic style gameplay in game because of what originally was like a, a limitation of how slow the server cycle is but it's been sort of incorporated and adopted by the players but they've had to kind of learn it themselves but what if there was sort of a skill that almost brought that into its heart like sort oh of showcased hey you can actually do things in a rhythmic way and in sync and in time and it almost sort of teaches you about server cycles and the tick rate and having to do things so imagine there's a song playing in the background and you're like on a stage and performing and it's it's a 100 bpm song in the same in tune with you know the server cycle the tick rate and you're having to sort of perhaps do certain interactions click things you know notes are appearing or interfaces are coming up maybe you have to retune instruments or do little fun little side distraction type stuff but i think there's a lot of potential there for a genuine rhythmic style of gameplay that doesn't currently exist in like an official format but feels like a spiritual successor to things that players have been doing for all these years in some cases without realizing they're doing it but just sort of like legitimizing it and then you know molding a piece of content around the game's limitations rather than trying to fight against it yep. and, and that's something that was very sort of compelling to both of us i think figuring out ways of almost using this skill as like a teaching tool of you know opening up that part of the game to players and, and then obviously you can you know think 
the sky is the limit kind of thing of the crazy and fun little quirky interactions whether you're on a stage performing and you're sort of having all these notes flying around you have to click in a rhythm certain a certain timing or maybe you're you're battling against another bard or an NPC yep. or something and you're sort of exchanging it's almost you know you reach a point where you're, you're almost teaching people like pvp fundamentals <laughs> and it's like a pvp tutorial as you're you're flicking between instruments or flicking between musical note types instead of using overhead prayers or equipment switching and it's sort of oh now you've got like a teaching tool not just a pvm but a pvp and it's like this all of a sudden you're, you're thinking of ways of doing this really cross kind of pollinating and, and over kind of overall affecting skill that really serves as a, a both a unique gameplay opportunity and a sort of teaching method for all manner of different pieces of gameplay um without having to like sort of completely redesign what those things are yeah uh, and that that whole side of things is what really kind of you know the more we sort of sat, sat on it and thought about this and what it could be it was like you know what this is there's really something special here we think and it's just there's, there's something so compelling about that thought of having things that people have already been doing for years and years on end and really properly embracing it uh, this you know explaining the tick rate and explaining the server cycle and how it can be its own sort of rhythmic gameplay that people have already been doing and and sort of tentatively teaching players about prayer flicking or you know, overheads and equipment switching and, and different things like that through an organically creates created skill like this i think um, yeah i think you've presented this absolutely beautifully i have like yeah. you have given me the like the true i don't know kind of essence of the skill and i'm even thinking like varlamore you said like musicians come from varlamore to like a school of bards or something yeah it's college of bards yeah i'm thinking we got a little partial pitch where we'd use that and common yeah maybe like, a bard guild that <laughs> could knows, be the guild and that could i yeah. mean that alone i mean think about this like currently you know the meta is to have a max cape and have um your crafting cape tell you to a bank imagine just a simple perk of like let's say you get to 99 bard and you have this this new guild where you can instantly teleport with with your like enchanted lyre or whatever the crazy instrument is and you yeah. can instantly teleport to like a bank and then you have like another thing. like just little perks like that that don't actually it doesn't mean bard but it means like there's actually benefit to the skill on top of you know everything yeah. else that it's going to offer just really cool oh i've yeah, I'm really excited oh that's that's genuinely uh pleasing to hear because it's always scary you know having spent a lot of time thinking about something because we really have discussed it. And yeah. again, massive props. I want to send all my love to my friend Caveman out there because he's really a... Uh, he's awesome. Yeah, he's been a stunning, stunning guy and, and working with, with I, this has been great. I'm also, uh, I mean, I, I was in choir for years. I've always been a very musical kind of person in that real right, life. Yeah. And so this really speaks to me because... Uh, and oh, and I actually cool. was majoring in music in college uh, just oh, cool. just for a year, and then I realized uh, I'm not as passionate <laughs> as I thought oh, I was yeah. about it. <laughs> oh, Comparing well, yeah, yourself absolutely. to others that dedicate their life yeah. to it, but yeah, yeah. No, that's, I think we think this has, um, as I say, it's you know, it just it feels. I think I like it so much because it 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 feels a little bit different from everything else that sort of floated around there, and you know, it's very easy for all of us, like in the collective community, too, to get fixated on the old and the thing that's familiar because it's yeah. kind of, oh why don't we just do summoning again let's bring back the same you know do artisan again do sailing again or something but um or you know especially the um like the rs2 skills or even like the rs3 ones like uh like invention seems to be gaining more popularity these days i have a i think i could talk about that maybe in a bit but yeah for me there's something about this where it's like you know what i think if old school ever did a new skill in some way shape or form in all the different ways and pathways i've identified and outlined earlier on in our chat about how you could go about approaching a skill. If we ever end up in that point, I think it would be such a shame to kind of, dare I say, waste that opportunity on something that is effectively just a rehash again. Yeah. I think old school really should try and get out from, get out from the shadow of, of RS3 and the pre-EOC era and everything, and be like, hey, we can do our own thing. You know, we can forge our own kind of path and make really awesome content that is still old school looking and feeling. But it just shows that this game can go in a different direction, and maybe that direction will be better. Um, and you just you never know until you try that, and it is a bit scary trying something a bit different. But I think it's worth it. And yeah, there's just this this bard idea, obviously been knocking around for quite a while now. We've got it into them, you know all sorts of different concepts and, and various states. It's pretty close to the end in sort of uh, sort of overall theme and concepts we want to do. And uh, and yeah, there's just there's there's so much kind of uh, going on with it that's uh, interesting to think about and. 
obviously you know, things like reward potential that's always a, a challenging one when you're thinking of skills in terms of the, the exact reward offering that it should have but i think there's still so much scope um for that again as you know, things you've listed out you've come up with a few concepts yourself and it's yeah. like I think some things kind of like write themselves. And as I mentioned, you know, I think the non-combat skills are the most things in need of love. And really people used to like the artisan skill idea, which was sort of taking that and in the most bare bones way possible and just saying, hey, do non-combat Slayer now and just tasks telling you to do it. But I think if you can do it in a more organic way and reinvigorate those old skills in a way that doesn't require someone to be told, go and chop 200 trees and fletch 200 logs kind of thing. And, and sort of do things that are like, hey, you've got a reason to need logs again and a reason to want to fletch something again yeah. to something new. And then a use for that, that perhaps aids non-combat things. You know, we've sort of concepted all sorts of things. Maybe you have basic sort of buffs or boosts related to different skills or different locations that you are in game, depending on what action you're doing or what instrument you have. Or maybe it's something cool or interesting, like, uh, you know, you, have, you sort of perhaps you play an instrument out in the world and then you sort of incur a, a buff or a chance to have something to happen upon yourself, you know, sort of. I don't know whether to give a specific idea yeah, of one thing. There, I, think, or, I think people listening are going to have it's some... It's scary going into too much detail. I have yeah, spoken to Cable again recently about this. I'm like, uh, if I do, if this topic comes up and I bring it up, I want to be like, I want to skirt the edge of talking openly and and honestly, but not saying too much just yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, like just to me, like a, a fun skill idea is, uh, or, or kind of reward idea or potential would be something that doesn't necessarily... Ideally, you don't want to force a player into think and they have to start using something, right? I, I think that would be nice to make it feel like a nice little thing on the side that could offer some fun, you know, optional extra rewards, but you don't suddenly feel mandated to do it. And ideally, offering a little bit of extra gameplay so it makes something a bit more engaging or interesting too. And yeah. That's why I like the idea of maybe you don't just sort of blanket buff skilling things that like you could say, oh, maybe you play an instrument and now you get more logs when you cut for a little while while the song echoes through the air or something like that so you know you could do that and, you know that might be fine in and of itself but maybe there's something more you can do and yeah so i think there's idea of uh, yeah. you know, maybe you well maybe you play songs and it sort of creates the chance for things to happen or you can influence certain things to come out we had this idea of uh this kind of what we call these these strange little creatures that could emerge that are only sort of well we call them anima echoes actually <laughs> to do with the game's lore and there's a bit of things you can dig into that but this idea of these sort of somewhat magically attuned creatures that don't really care for anything in the physical world or can't be interacted with through you know conventional means but they love a good tune they do and they'll maybe you know make themselves appear and reveal themselves under the right circumstances with the right tune if you're doing the right sort of action and um, i think so maybe maybe while you're out skilling and you you, you played a song you've got your instrument there in your backpack and you the song is echoing out and maybe it sort of incurs a buff that lasts a while a bit like drinking a you know, a potion and you're protected from anti-fire yeah. for a while. Perhaps you'd, you'd play an instrument and you're under the effect of something for a while and maybe a strange little critter crawls out. A bit like a, a cross between a random event or a, a distraction diversion style of content that can sporadically happen. And maybe you have to interact with this thing and there's different things it can do. Maybe you've got to sort of follow it while it performs an action or it might be a bit aggressive or maybe it's passive and hides or maybe you've got to sort of like uh, listen to it and it plays out its own little jingle and you've got to kind of echo back to it the song that it played to you and you've got to select notes and things like that to kind of engage with it and then maybe as a reward for interacting with this thing and, and dealing with its encounter you gain you know a, a roll on some kind of cool little unique drop table of some perhaps yeah. some resources related to the skill you were just training or perhaps some new unique thing on top because obviously skilling tends to have a, a lack of real kind of signature unique items you know it doesn't have like a slayer style big ticket item drop to have looked forward to so and there's be interesting exploring that idea for for skilling and and figuring out ways of implementing that in a way that also increases the engagement and the gameplay. So it's not just the same passive AFK kind of bot fodder skilling action. It's like, no, you're actually putting in a little bit of effort yeah. should you want to. You know, if you want to bring your instrument, if you want to do a little bit of little bit of thing in a tune back to a playing a tune back to a creature of some kind, then you know, maybe that's a, a way of tackling that and increasing the gameplay engagement in order to increase the reward output so it kind of makes sense and, and feels balanced and fair. There's so much and there's so much potential for like Easter eggs. Like that's oh, yeah. that's yeah, what right. I like. Oh, I'm I'm obsessed with Easter eggs, and we don't get them enough yeah. in this game. But like, imagine you play a tune and something completely out of the blue happens. You're not even expecting it, but you've played a certain pattern of notes that, like, the J mods have planned. Like, you know, you play these certain notes, and something crazy will, you know, happen. Yeah. Or oh, there is there's so much potential for this. There, you know, there's 
you know, putting on little stage performances, performing for, you know, kings and queens and royalty around the world. And maybe you get you know, requested to do certain kinds of things. I have to play certain songs with certain instruments. And certain oh, my God. But to go around, maybe you're like a traveling, a traveling bard and you go and sort of travel for people and you have to get, you know, get paid like that. And bard contracts. Just... <laughs> yeah maybe then why not you go to different places or oh to sort of, uh, up with the bards to get the contract and be the better uh we had a fun i don't know whether this will ever see the light of day but you know some genuinely like half meme half serious uh thoughts of you know actual bard battling like pvp bard battle oh you know, my god beat another player in pvp in big air quotes and if you uh, just and by if playing you... a song better and you sort of attack with your <laughs> instrument and the notes fly out of your instrument and hit and deal damage based on how well you perform the song and just a stupid dumb little but you know potentially fun form of like light-hearted pvp and i'm even thinking know, there's, of there's so much like i'm looking at like okay so I'm, I'm looking at the graphic you got like some war drums and some other things imagine you yeah, you went yeah. out as as a band <laughs> <laughs> no, like yes. you got four yes. people. One of them's playing the drums. One of them's playing the sack. But one hundred percent. That's what I, I love. That's that's one thing I've even pitched to like oh. Kevin and that. It's like, oh, my dream is that people will stop dancing for GP at the GE and instead they'll stay performing music for oh the GP. Oh my god! Form their little band. I'd love it. Imagine if you could form like in using the clan chat or the party chat system. You could like join a little temporary bard group. And whoever the leader of the bard group was, you all equip an instrument at the same time. The leader selects a song, and then they sort of instigate a countdown. It syncs up everyone's instruments, and they all play the same sort of a tune <sighs> in sync, but with their different instruments, and sort of can walk around and interact with people as notes are flying out of them. And if you have like the perhaps the right audio options turned up, you can hear what people are playing. And yes, it's so much fun for just little quirky and... emergent gameplay. Sure, it may not necessarily have like a direct reward <laughs> yeah. influence or meta impact, but it's so again, unique. I don't think, I don't think every skill kind of should do that i think i think it's nice when there are things that feel more you know world building and immersion sort of creating and like that like imagine this okay so i'm thinking imagine like you're bank standing and you imagine like if you're listening to another player's bard instruments you actually gain a little bit of passive xp for listening so (laughs) so so you you actually can pay professional like bards that come as a group to a bank and they play for you. And so you're gaining your normal XP. You are bank standing. But you're also gaining a little bit of passive XP. And you're paying those guys handsomely for, like, playing amazing. And if they play well enough, then you get more XP. And so, oh, like, just create an actual bad tutoring system. Oh, my uh, God. Crazy enough. <laughs> I, am, am, I am legitimately obsessed. I think... Uh, I think we have a. Yeah. I think we have a winner. Barely, here, in my it opinion, it feels like we're barely scratching the surface of all the ideas. It's like the more I'm talking about it, the more I need to shut up because I can I just feel <laughs> caveman breathing down my neck, be like, "Don't share it before it's ready." But yeah, it's like there's oh different ideas, man. You know, we sort of concepted sort of. I'm gonna say it like <laughs> um, ideas of you know, uh, you got uh, big raid dungeons, haven't you? We've got skilling bosses. Well, why not a skilling raid? Why not a raid where the entire dungeon is filled with bosses? that have to be tackled with musical instruments, right? They have like rhythm style gameplay and you've got to play songs to sort of combat what they're doing and, you know, dodge their musical attacks almost and, and deal certain kinds of special songs that only exist in this skilling rage. You know, you've got to perform the song of kind of like what you said, you know, subduing creatures. You can imagine it working in like a skilling raid, but you've got to pacify a boss and yeah. calm its aggression and then use a different song to instigate a power up and then use another song to sort of like attack it and, and cause a cave in to sort of land on, on something and deal damage and creating this almost, you know, very dangerous and high octane raid style dungeon with all the difficulty of a raid but you're kind of just swapping out weapons for instruments and and the crazy potential that comes from that and and i don't know there's just there's all sorts of weird and wonderful things i think you could do and explore there's like other content i'm even thinking of like for example i know i don't think pyramid plunder is super uh you know uh new content or anything but you know you you get bit by opening those urns imagine you go into the last room of the pyramid you play a little tune all the urns are now pacified like just little things like that that can just be intermingled within the world that we already have that's a very good point i've never even thought about that right we have the snake charm in game and and yeah use it in the quest why can't you use it a pyramid plunder yeah that's a good point i've never thought of that wow yeah oh there's so many (laughs) ideas you start you open up pandora's box i think of ideas and there's all sorts of weird and fun little things and strange interactions you could make some of that verge on you know silly and just fun light-hearted things that won't change any xp metas or anything but still might just be you know a little bit socially engaging 
enjoyable little action and then things on the other side where if you if you did want to go a bit meta influencing then again there's, there's so much scope to do that if that's what the wider community genuinely wanted to have some things that help buff and, and boost stuff you know like my big thing and you know, i've got a bit of a history of this in general and saying i do think that the game has shifted far too heavily in terms of drop tables of monsters being so stacked with resources yes. and things like shops becoming such a strong meta especially for iron man having to rely on that it's like why are you ever going to go mining when you're just going to camp the blast furnace for gold or, or why are you going to go yep. whatever you know wood cutting or smithing right? all these different things you get so many like logs and bars and just stuff comes in oodles and spades and that they're, they're all byproducts of just doing other stuff you would have done anyway so it's like why would you ever go back to those traditional skills so yep. i personally you know would probably sit slightly more on the on the controversial side of things and being like you know what if we're not going to be able to like effectively nerf drop tables at this point in time then can we at least just talk about offering meaningful updates and additions and buffs and expansions to the non-combat stuff and you know a new skill like i said i don't think a new skill or updating old skills need to be mutually exclusive i think they should be one and the same a new skill should improve old skills and i think something like this would do exactly that you know having the means to then buff old skills in any way you wanted to you know make them better at gathering resources or offer new kinds of drop tables you could tap into by you know special kinds of songs and reward outputs you could get from strange little interactions you could have I think there's there's so much potential there and yeah that's another big reason why i'd like to see that just something that empowers that non-combat side the, the gathering of the production skills and, and create something that's just you know something that just it's it's grounded and that's what i like about yeah. being a bard as well it's just the game is a medieval fantasy game but occasionally it dives off the deep end of the fantasy and i think sometimes that can be a, a bit of a point of contention for players when it's like oh look at another big garish purple thing just added to the game right like there's sometimes complaints and to me it's like a bard i mean you can't get much more medieval than that like they have such a strong historical context into why they exist and what they do there's so much actual medieval stuff to pull from you know medieval instruments or you know what what bards were you know traveling through you know kingdom to kingdom performing for different people getting paid to regale of the stories of the great kings and leaders of you know the court and entertaining all of the humble citizens and it's just something that feels so grounded and so medieval about that and obviously you've still got the potential for the, the fantastical and the more you know high fantasy stuff if you want to sprinkle it on top but i think starting with a basis of a really strong medieval core just feels a lot nicer and you know it, it also stands in some kind of juxtaposition to something like you know what we discussed with warding where warding was just really full-blown fantasy skill and when you when you really boil down all the layers of what the existing skills are we, we kind of only have maybe like two or three quite overtly fantasy skills and everything else is actually built on a core of you know a simple traditional this role kind of existed at one point in human history in some way shape or form you know like lumberjacks and miners yep. and crafters and hunters and constructors like these are all things they're all you know traditional sort of pursuits and, and acts and i think being a bard like the act of performing as a bard like that sits alongside them kind of perfectly in, in my opinion at least. yeah so, I yeah, know. I think I, talk this. <laughs> I, I I'm obsessed with this. I, I was even thinking. I don't know if this really fits as a bard, but I'm just thinking. <laughs> I keep looking at the graphic. Yeah. And I'm seeing these war drums. I'm just imagining like those yeah. those huge clan like clan versus clan like back when the revs were multi. You'd have two clans oh, yeah. fighting. Just imagine you have like these frontliners that are playing the drums like powering up your clan yes. and stuff. The actual war drummers on the front lines just playing <laughs> yeah. their tune and someone else like carrying those big the... banners or something alongside. Yeah, like Lord of the Rings. It's like clan like, like oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> my God. Large over the hills. Oh, yeah. Be like, you're reinvigorating <laughs> me now, giving me all sorts of fun ideas. So, yeah. But oh, I that's think amazing. That's, that's great about this. It just sort of, well, at least I hope. that That's what I hope. I think that's what both me and K-Man hope is that when we can sort of finally show this hop off hopefully in the not so distant future yeah i was gonna ask when, to... when are you thinking it's, it's tough to say i think you know we'd i think we'd love to get out this year but it's like, next year with, you, with both uh well maybe next year now <laughs> oh wait, wait, wait. so are you actually thinking 2021 like this month we would like to oh okay wow okay uh, again like please do not hold me to that yeah but no we'd, we'd certainly like to but i, I will stress like with this is the, the original sort of inklings of this started i think technically with caveman years ago i think he pitched a really bare bones version of this back with the original original skill player design content submission like that ultimately artisan came from so that was like over half a decade ago um but yeah with me on involved like uh i sort of you know we've been chipping away little bits and pieces for technically i think a couple of years now maybe even more um 
sort of we started to have a little, you know, a little burst, and then we sort of had it down. And as I mentioned to you earlier as well, I've been a bit personally. I've, I've sort of apologised to K Max. I've kind of sat a bit back from all things old school for, for quite some time, just sort of been a bit on the edge of things and, and not super involved. But um, yeah, no, we, we we're definitely both keen to like have some sort of finished thing. It's just as I've kind of discussed with you today, it's really difficult knowing to what layer of depth, to what layer of detail, and exactly what form of presentation would be best to showcase it. Yeah. We've seen so many like really good ideas that have perhaps faltered because they overloaded people with too much or they didn't say enough. They were too vague and it's really, really, really challenging. And we've really gone back and forth on that, trying to figure out like, what is the sweet spot? Like, where does that lie? And I think we're still yeah. trying to like, we're still kind of in that stage of like saying, okay, well, how, how does it need to be? You know, we don't want to just put out a gigantic. The presentation is everything. Topic really really first is, first so. impressions yeah but that, that's why i sort of intentionally you know i pulled together a few assets today i was like you know what actually i'll just sort of i'll dump them in a bit of a mood board and try and create a weird you know i didn't spend too long on that at all as you can tell like all of a few minutes just grabbing things in and putting them together yeah but um i want to just make a, a bit of a spread because i that's kind of the thing i want to instill in people i think that makes the best conversation for a new skill is like what can you as a player as a community member conjure up for yourself based on the core concept and kind of goes back to earlier what I mentioned about separating concepts from content. Cause I think there's a lot of cool things you can do and really, you know, stride into some fun and exciting territory. If you're willing to just hold on to a concept and really try and push through with what cool things could come from that rather than getting too fixated on one individual piece of content that maybe you don't like, or should have been done differently, or you really did like, or something like that. So figuring out how to sort of keep the pure kind of refined essence of the, of the concept intact and enough to sort of, inspire people hopefully conjure up a bit of inspiration and, yeah and yeah let people kind of maybe fill in the blanks a bit where they want to with their own sort of fun imaginative uh, ideas there all right gentle tractor we're moving on to the what as you call it the drop table problem and this was a huge reddit Ooh. post i need to just let me just show the uh, original post it uh definitely got a <laughs> lot of upvotes <laughs> eight point six thousand. so wow Let's... i don't even remember it getting <laughs> quite so much traction i think i'll probably uh do what many people do and read the comments and then focus on hyper focus on the few negative things the yep the dissenting uh opinions and ideas you think oh that wasn't very popular then <laughs> it's easy to forget oh, actually quite a few thousand people saw that and thought yeah that's worthy of an upvote yeah i but, yeah. i was one of the original upvoters so uh i oh, that's good i i have to just preface this by saying i am obsessed with your trinket idea we'll get into it you'll get into I... it and uh, I just I love the fact that it's in, encouraging wearing fashion scape basically around skilling. Yeah. So let's get into it. Okay. So I guess I should sort of break down where it all came from. Essentially, it is all stemming back to this idea of you know as old school's gone on, probably the biggest area that's received the most updates and uh, certainly the most lucrative updates has been combat. And slayer and bossing and, and drop tables they've kind of ballooned and grown and become bigger and bigger and all encompassing and now i think a lot of players even if you do mostly just like combat and really hate skilling you're probably going to be somewhat in agreement to say you know what most skilling resources come from non-skilling sources these days yep. and to me that's always felt like you know what it's, that's a shame that's a real shame we have this entire quite deep and interactive skilling system and it's in many ways that is kind of the heart and the and the framework of the game in its entirety and so many of them are just so underutilized and it's such a shame and a large part of that is just because another area of the game is very very generous and a bit too generous and so yeah this sort of initially will stem from thinking of a way of well how do you slightly redistribute that just a subtle amount you know how do you kind of push it in a certain direction without really overwhelming or freaking people out and just blanket nerfing things. So the only idea I had was uh, what, what I originally called some many, many, many years back, this idea of kind of skilling catalysts, I think I first called them. And it was just a really, really simple premise, which is the idea of what if not every single combat drop was a direct skilling resource, but instead was something that boosted a skill. So you'd pick something up and it would actually help you gain like a log while woodcutting or help gain a, an ore while mining or a fish while fishing. And so you'd kind of subtly lean people towards, you know, you'd still get a lot of stuff from combat, but then you'd have a few things that would kind of feed you and, and funnel you towards skinning again. Or if you didn't want to, maybe they'd be tradable and you'd just be able to sell them off to skillers who did want them. 
and that was sort of like the core premise is sort of this replacement of you know a few very selected drops from certain drop tables to try and put something more skiller friendly and, and more kind of cross compatibility across skills making them feel more uh, more related and more worthwhile um yeah that went down a certain degree of all right you know a lot of people critical about lots of things and very very rightly so the first idea was very sort of free form and basic and bare bones and eventually i came back to it and and readdressed it and i guess it is worth highlighting because between that time of first pitching it and then re-pitching it under this sort of this uh, this descriptor of you know the drop table problem and, and really deep diving into it again um there was another thing that was related to it and it's from the old uh the scary game across the across the other side rs3 because they they did do something similar as people pointed out to me and doing some research into it because they completely overhauled their mining and smithing skills and one of the things they did was they went the completely brutal approach of just axing all their drop tables and removing every single ore rock from every drop table in game and they replaced them with essentially exactly what i described like a thing that boosts your skilling while mining it gives you more ores while mining instead and i'm well aware that that did not go down well like at all <laughs> that was quite hated um by the rs3 player base but i do think that was for a number of reasons i think the nature and how they went about that change was very different to what i was sort of thinking in my mind at least for old school which is subtle soft and don't go too far they obviously went the 100 percent brutal approach of absolute purging and that obviously you know that's going to create a certain effect and a ripple that is going to be felt no matter how you spin it um and the other thing was that obviously came in the back of a giant set of skill reworks for their mining and smithing skills and while they did that they obviously redistributed the tiers of things because much like people even these days in old school they talk about all different things like mining and smithing and the, the hilarity that comes from level 99 smithing making level 40 gear and so that's obviously what that mining and smithing rework did in rs3 it finally tackled that so they added a whole bunch of new things above it and thus obviously that meant things like myth addy rune well that all got knocked down to a much much lower tier of resource and, and item that it technically sort of should be i guess when you're balancing things on a one-to-one -one ratio and so that's i think where the second pressure point came from for their implementation because all of a sudden you had all these formerly high level things dropping highly valuable items like rune ores were suddenly dropping this rune boosting skilling thing but of course rune was now a trash tier item and addy was and myth was so nobody wanted them anymore so it had this compounding kind of impact where yeah. it just i think it was perceived so poorly because it was such a brutal change but wasn't balanced in according to the new tiers of things and so yeah that was sort of like a bit of an analysis i did on that because between posting the first version and the second version that had come out I was like okay well that's a really interesting you know proof of concept at least seeing how one area did it um in rs3 and how they did it arguably quite poorly and what things you would do very differently so that was an interesting one to see and it definitely made me you know open my eyes a bit and think okay you'd, if you did anything even remotely similar you'd want to be super careful on how you approached it and definitely do things very differently basically um and yeah so the core ideas of, of that again were similar but i i would always think in in much softer and and less kind of less drastic terms for me i i do not think we should be dramatically gutting every drop table that just that just doesn't feel old school to me at all like i don't want to be replacing all manner of different things and items and telling people you must go and skill for everything it's like no i i love the fact that you can pick and choose what you do i think that's just the 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 advent of snowflake i met accounts and things like that where people can choose such strange and obscure methods of getting something because you can technically get a thing from this weird impling over here and this monster actually drops with a one in 128 drop chance this strange resource that yeah. I, I love that i absolutely love that about old school i never want to see that go anywhere so for me it's all just about the very subtle readdressing of the imbalance you know not a, a cataclysmic shift saying you must now do skidding you must not do combat whatever just bringing things into a nicer overlap so that that's the yeah first big difference I think from uh, a full one to one change out like RS3 did that would never want to go even near uh, and so yes yeah, so that's sort of like the the core premise of this so it slightly rejigged the uh, 
the idea somewhat and try to look at what things worked and what didn't. So the idea you get these little items every so often, maybe instead of a, you know, instead of a, a fish drop somewhere, you'd get some kind of special kind of fishing bait that would uh, help you catch an extra fish. And it's funny talking about this now because this is technically in game. There's something very similar to this that really exists now with uh, with Temporos because a version of this is on Temporos's drop table called Spirit Flakes, yep. and they do almost exactly that. So again, as like a second proof of concept to me, it, it shows you like functionally like as a utility item and, and what it's meant to do. I think the concept is sound, like it works and it's there, it's in game. Uh, obviously that one comes from like a fishing source to feed you back into traditional fishing. So Temporos isn't your only form of fishing, probably as a result of not wanting people to pull a winter tod and just do their one skill at one skilling boss, which was probably a good move. Uh, so yeah, it kind of, the fact that we have little elements of this in game already, to me speak like, okay, there's, this can work, you know, depending on how you implement it and where you get it and what its source is and what it does and being very careful with quantities and all that, like they can, they can sort of have an, have an impact and, and have a space in game. And so, yeah, looking at how these could be useful in, in different areas for different resources, I guess that ties into the next layer, which is thinking of how to make them really user friendly and unintrusive and basically solve any potential problems. And that's where that original trinket system, I guess, comes in, where you mentioned. Uh, and that was an idea of saying, okay, how do we, what issues would this have? Would these items start wasting a lot of bank space? Probably, yeah. Uh, um, you don't want them to sort of stagnate and accumulate in too high a quantities and all that kind of thing, because then you just sort of, if they, they appear on drop tables or any other sources, you don't want them to tank in value too heavily where they just can't get consumed. There's too much supply, uh, not enough demand uh, and different things like that. So I thought, okay, maybe there's a way you can kind of combine them, a little storage item. And yeah, so that's where sort of trinkets as an idea came from. And I thought out of all the equipment slots, it would be nice to be able to, you know, equip a skilling thing, especially in a way that feels itself kind of unintrusive and, and doesn't block out any other things that you might be wanting to equip or wear. And especially when it comes to, you've got like these like skilling outfits and skilling tools. And that's where it sort of led me into the next layer of, actually maybe this thing could be expanded. And this this taps into a question that's, or, or a conversation that's usually held in regards to things like uh, graceful, which I think is probably the much bigger and more impactful one where it's kind of one, type of outfit suddenly monopolizes an entire look for huge yeah. areas of the game and it's kind of a shame when you think about it in those terms isn't it where you lose all those weird quirky fashion scape items yeah that we used to wear back in the day and so many different things with treasure trail items and miscellaneous quest rewards and all kinds of stuff that just don't have a use and then that's what made me think of this again thinking of making an equipable item to store these little resource enhancement items thinking oh actually maybe what if you sort of converted those skilling outfit effects into a more of like a, a passive effect that could be stored inside of this trinket? So this trinket would just occupy one slot instead of having to be worn, you know, across all of them. Yeah. Um, I thought, you know, there's uh, maybe there's some there's some you know interesting reasons to do that. So I kind of incorporate that as a part of it as well. And obviously think about the specific equipment slot itself. It's a bit challenging knowing what direction to go in there because whichever one you use, it's going to be potentially conflicting with something somewhere along the way and the only one that felt truly devoid of that was basically the ammo slot and i know there's been conversations about that in well just over the months and years about the nature of what it is and how you know blessings exist there in a bit of an awkward spot and different people have pitched different things i thought you know what that's the most it's the most underutilized and uh, underrepresented and and least intrusive and everything else so i thought let's sort of combine that pitching with that as well so you've got these little trinkets, store some of your skilling, boosting things, an outfit and all sort of neatly tucked away in a slot that isn't really conflicting with any of the other skilling stuff. And letting these trinkets kind of uh, boost what they, you do with these things so you can consume more of these resource to, to boost your resource output whilst doing your gathering skills at the cost of consuming them faster. So again, like as a, as a balancing countermeasure to ensure there's never too many of these things coming into the game and the supply always uh sort of less than demand almost and yeah i guess that's sort of like the the core outline of where that pitch originally was i suppose the uh this idea of things that help push you towards increasing the resource gathering and the profitability of, of 
skilling so those traditional skilling sources actually become even if they don't become meta or 100 percent better maybe they gradually creep towards becoming slightly more viable to gather those said resources from and also doing a couple of extra fun things in the mix as well like trying to bring back a bit the old-fashioned scape too and yeah yeah i guess that was the overall concept of it yeah i was a i was a huge fan of uh just kind of combining all the perks like there's outfits and stuff and again like you say it's it's taken away from the fashion scape that we're all so used to but all also like the perks like those little um like the skilling catalysts are held in that trinket and it's yeah. just like yeah i don't know I, I i don't know exactly how i feel about skilling catalysts um because yeah. like they're a good idea it's just it's something foreign that and it i think really that, is yeah that's yeah it. And I, I think that scares a lot of people. I mean, it scares me a little bit because I just think of like these old school drop tables that we currently have. And now they're going to be giving these weird new items that look different. They don't really look old school and stuff like that. And you almost, I don't know, feel obligated to use them potentially. Absolutely. But, yeah. But I think for the most part, it is it is a good thing. And it kind of actually, again, I'm an Iron Man. I play predominantly just Iron Man. So I don't actually... Yeah feel the effects of the economy ever um so i guess i'm not like the the person really to ask how how this would like affect me but um yeah because it's difficult with how that sort of shifted a lot of play perceptions over the years as well isn't it how things affect iron man yep. disproportionately to mains and vice versa and yeah it's a very it's very challenging when that is making sure things aren't just iron man updates versus yeah things that completely exclude iron man and are not viable for use by them so and, I will uh, say, yeah. however, that uh, the drop tables are unbelievably just saturated with skilling resources, and it makes yeah, me really, really sad that like the source is ne is almost never the the most efficient way to get anything. Like if you were to yeah. chop a yew tree, you might as well just kill a giant mole, you know? Just get a yeah. hundred noted yew logs here and there. Um, so yeah. it it is kind of a shame in a way, and I I think this would actually help with that, like help bring back that like good old skilling with like actually like you're actually getting rewarded for it so yeah out of all the big kind of grand ideas i've shared this is probably in many ways the most both the most out there the most controversial the most difficult to get right but also there's there's something in amongst all this that i i do still like that like i'll be i'll be blunt with you i don't think i'd ever try and seriously pitch this specific thing as this is laid out here like ever again or even necessarily fully advocate it for it right now just because i think there are other approaches that you could possibly try and explore and take and as you say there's just there's so much unknown and so much scary qualities about messing with things that you know introducing weird foreign items as you mentioned that don't quite feel old school and you don't want to lose that the one thing you don't want to lose is the old school feel yep because that's that's really all you have like you, you need that <laughs> you desperately need it so there's yeah, there's there's such a such a challenge in finding where that sweet spot is, and obviously as a you know it it is it is a tough one because the the simple you know air quotes solution might be said by some people to just be well maybe the drop table should have never been that generous in the first place, and the actual solution is just tackle the source the you'd nerf all drops just blanket lower GP per hour of almost everything and. I mean, again, on paper, maybe that makes partial sense to do. There are certain some outliers, I think, that still probably could do with being reined in a bit. Yeah. Even, you know, the mighty nerf version of Zora might still be sitting on the far end and your Vorkaths and those kind of things and a lot of Slayer monsters that were intentionally buffed, but then perhaps that was a bit over-buffed, but that's such a difficult thing to... that you, you can't ever get support for that, like, and, and it would feel really horrible and there's all these conversations about, well, so many people have been able to use it for so long and yep. gained a big insurmountable advantage from it. And ah, it's, 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 it's a tough it, one to come to. It's extremely tough. I have my own really strong opinions. Like one of my strongest opinions is I think all runes, like all magical runes should be deleted from all monster drop tables. I think rune yeah. crafting should be the exclusive way to get runes. I even think shops should be nerfed. Uh, yeah. I've even I'm been a fan of like just getting rid of shops. <laughs> Or, or making it so, like, shops are instance to players. So, like, you can't just hop worlds and keep getting a refueled stock. But it would be, like, yeah. the, the stock is your own and it would 
regen, you know, over time. So it wouldn't ever be like the meta to use shops. Yeah. Maybe like an as an hourly you'd go if you really care that much, but like Yeah. Um my yeah, my biggest thing was like th if you think about wrath runes, like wrath runes it's it's such a shame that they come from like Rune Dragons, Addy Dragons, and Vorkath, where God, like so sad that they pulled that in addition to the Rune Crafting thing. I you know. were this close to getting a unique rune that was only I know. present for Rune Crafting, and then oh, a trip to the last hurdle. It's Here so it sad. It, it, and an over grinded monster. It's like oh, what and shame. it's and it's the same thing with uh, with cosmic runes. In fact, they I don't even know why they did it, but the Prif Shop, the Prif Rune Shop, came out giving you really cheap and two hundred fifty stock of cosmic runes where. For Iron yeah. Man, that used to be like the only exclusive rune that you used to have to craft because that was the yeah. only viable method. And now they just got rid of that. Yeah, it was just like the tiny stock in the Mage Bank wasn't there, the Wildy, and I think that was about. Yeah, that was literally it. Barely anything. Yeah. Yep. And um, Astral yeah. Runes, they have a sh well, Astral Runes. The shop has been there for forever, but like that would have been so cool if you couldn't buy Astrals, you had to actually craft them. That was like yeah. the exclusive way to get them. And like Hydra wouldn't give them because I know Hydra now shits them out and. Yeah, it's just kind of like why? Like why are you doing that? It is a shame. I, I agree. Like shops, obviously, they're all kind of shops form a part of this wider conversation too. While this yep. post here, I guess, largely focuses on drop tables. Shops are definitely a big thing and, and a part of that. And as you say, like probably would be nice to find a nice concrete solution to that going forward. What that looks like to retain shop functionality so they still have their function, but not as a meta. Like I, I think it's fine for shops to exist in the context of oh I, I really need like a quick load of this thing and yeah the quickest way of getting it is oh, i'll just quickly teleport to a shop and just buy the few that are in stock like if you need it instantly then i think a shop is a nice way of doing that but then shops get messy when it's like okay i'm gonna quickly grind out the next uh 40 crafting levels by world hopping and using this shop method and stuff so yep. it's like uh that's not nice that just doesn't feel right at all i mean quite frankly anything that involves world hopping i would love to see just gradually and systematically eradicated like anything I that agree. incentivizes and you to consistently hop worlds because it, it was never viable in the past as well maybe yep. well that's probably a thing that's maybe kind of gone the way of history and and been forgotten to time but like yeah back in the day like you literally had a log out timer when you tried to change worlds like hey buddy you were just in a different world please wait 30, 30 seconds, seconds. Yeah. it's like oh, okay so you're just sitting there on the <laughs> completely logged out and then you've got to type your details to log back in again yeah and you know do all that process and the and modern system we have now where it's just double click boop you're there yep it's, it's changed so much it is it is that impossible was never, it was built for it like, yeah no and chose. and and it's really hard to convince the majority of the player base because they are really set in their ways but and you know this this is something like i've been wanting and i think like the best way is just to make it so like shops are instance for you like for the player so yeah. like you get your own thing. Hopping worlds wouldn't do anything. Hopping worlds doesn't even become like the issue. But there are things with that, and people are, like, for example, high level Iron Men that love PVM have str like really struggle with blood runes. So yeah, blood runes like the J mods are going to come out with the, like the real blood altar and give it axe like give it the yeah. um the whatever it's called the blood talisman from the new yeah, room yeah. crafting mini game. And like so that will help. The other thing is like rocks around the game, and I've talked about this for many Sebe casts of like rocks besides iron, sandstone, and granite, all other rocks are just a nuisance to mine because there's that tick delay. Yeah. They take forever to mine. They have a incredibly slow respawn timer, but to like so far from banks, most of them. Yeah, and streamlining that, I mean, I'm just thinking of like that horseshoe gold mine in Brimhaven. Yeah. Like, imagine there was, like, a little dude like, that sat there, or, like, a deposit box, and you can just mine that. You can go around banking gold ore, you're getting mining XP, and then you use that gold ore for smithing. Like, boom. Yeah, I would love that. I mean, I, I've, I always loved, like, I unironically trained there when it first came out in the mid-2000s at the, uh, do you remember the Keldegrim, what's the quest? Between a rock? You shoot yourself yeah, in the, yeah, yeah. the gold vein. It's like, I remember going in there, it's like, oh, my God, there's hundreds of gold ore. I'll be rich. <laughs> I got, and, and the guy outside, like, uh... Does he note them or bank them in exchange for like taking a cut of how many gold you had? It's some sort of mechanic like that, I think. Yeah. It's really terrible by modern standards. Like you would never ever dream of doing it. Back then I was like, this is it, payday, woohoo, get my pickaxe and off I go. And I used to genuinely mine gold there. And you go back and think and look at it now, it's like, that's so hilariously bad. The gold per hour is tragic. Oh yeah. Like you'd spend 
two minutes in the blast for a shop and you're like boom done the same that would have done an hour basically yep literally <laughs> it costs you just a bit of gp it's like oh it's such a shame so i'm fully with you that there's like there's something that i think could and should be done for the skinning things and alongside that i think shops kind of need to be part of that equation and it, it is difficult getting the exact right solution there because you know I'm, I'm probably inclined to agree with you where you say personalized instant shops might be the way to go with like a slow restock but then I guess you've got that subtle downside of well whatever cycle you make it respawn on that suddenly becomes this uh you know what you could call daily scape or i'd kind of call schedule scape yeah. where you have to change your game schedule around the, the game rather than playing on your own schedule because you need to do this thing and you know you then you have whatever birdhouse run now you do your shop run and that would feel a bit yeah I, I, yeah but, it, again there, there are ways around yeah. that though because there's this idea of uh I don't know what you call it, other than like rolling dailies, where you could kind of have, you know, say a shop existed with X amount of shop stock. Let's say it had something in stock for 100 stock per day. And you could say, well, maybe it's a rolling daily. So if you don't go there and buy it on that one day, the next day, that stock rolls over. And now the max capacity is now 200. And if you don't go that day, then it rolls over the next day. And the next day now has 300 in stock. And as soon as you buy them, it kind of resets. And okay. Then, Okay. You know, I like, the following I kinda like day that. after that, it would go back to like a hundred again. So you could kind of treat it like a. I mean, we the closest thing we have to a rolling daily in game right now would be the Kingdom of Miscellaneous. Yeah. I mean, think about it, because you can. Yes, you can treat it like a daily, and technically, I think that's the most. Of, well, in terms of keeping upkeep, I think technically you want to keep yourself at one hundred percent as long as possible. Yeah. But re- re- realistically, I know I certainly don't <laughs> keep myself there every day. That, that's always been a thing. Oh, like, oh, yeah, I haven't checked miscellaneous in a month and a half. I should go do that. 25%. It's, like that. it's exactly, yeah, it's like that kind of thing. But again, it like it gives you flexibility. Like you can yeah. check it daily. You can check it weekly. You can check it monthly or even longer. And I think pieces of content like that are actually quite nice and, and flexible. Cause they I offer think that, that actually would be good. Output, but give it, give it gives it to you on your schedule, not the game schedule. So maybe maybe there's some sort of weird solution there that would work with shops as well or some sort of stock but i don't know I was, I, yeah, that you actually green, you know Sorry, what yeah. the, the more i think about that that is actually a, a brilliant idea um yeah i mean my whole idea around it is to just eliminate shopscape but yeah. at the same time how cool would it be to like let's just say the blast furnace shop it's only ever stocked with 100 every day every day it resets it re-rolls and it, it, it keeps adding up to the point where like Maybe it maybe it should cap at some point, but imagine yeah, it has to be a hard cap somewhere. Yeah, like, but just imagine if it capped it, like I don't know, a thousand. So yeah, by day ten, you can just go there, not hop worlds, and just buy out, you know, a full bunch. inventory bank, buy out a full inventory, and just yeah. do it a thousand. And let's say if they're personalized shop, let's just say like the price doesn't even increase; it's just one set price the whole time. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of interesting things, and you know, on that again, with, specifically with blood runes, I was thinking a little while back in my own mind as to what else would you do in blood runes rune crafting shops and this whole like equation as i mentioned to you there with rolling dailies and how do you afford and look at all these different things that's one thing with rune crafting where it's, it's difficult to obviously just offer more runes crafted per hour because that becomes essentially pure profit increases and obviously if you start going over a certain threshold it's like oh how much gp per hour is this going to be one million two million three four five oh that goes it can balloon quite quickly when you compare it to how many blood runes you actually want and how fast you consume them because there's quite a disparity there i think and that's i guess the real the real pressure and and, and the nasty you know point of contention especially for the iron men players again yeah. uh when you're thinking of those high-end uses of things like bloods you know the the how many consume per hour versus how fast you gain them per hour and th- that ratio is just kind of fundamentally off you can't easily increase it without having a knock-on effect to the wider economy for everyone else and GP yeah. per hour. So you've got to start thinking of creative ways. For room crafting, I think there could be some solutions, but you'd probably want to look at input costs because the reason that pure profit is a problem is because obviously there's no input cost. Either traditional room crafting with essence, I mean, that's like what, basically a static one to two GP these days. That is, yeah. that is almost not, it's like a negligible thing at this point. And then all the other essence types are non-tradable. It's like dark essence or the new day out stuff. Yep. It's all, uh, you know, just it, it isn't a, a cost factor. It's just sort of comboed into it effectively. Yeah. So that's where I think there's maybe potential for future room crafting activities or things that incorporate it that maybe you look at input costs. If there was a different style of input cost to justify increasing the output reward. So the average profit 
remained only a little bit higher, but not outlandish. So, you know, yeah. if you're spending two or three million in some sort of input resource cost in order to get four to five million output in runes, it's like, okay, you're making five million in blood runes an hour. But actually, it's only one ish, one to two millish profit. So that kind of works. Like, you can, yeah. you can, you can justify that at a very, very high level. And, and, I mean, sort of let's imagine that they just got rid of shops completely. So there was, yeah, there was, there was no way to get fast blood runes, but they came out with the true blood altar. Um, I've actually, uh, I've talking, I've talking, I've, I've talked with, um, a, a guest from the Sebe cast talking about like the path of, um, how you get there and you take a fairy ring to like the Meyer, Meyer key, uh, tunnels and stuff and you make yeah, your little, little way over there. Yeah. And we basically found out and again I'm not I'm not confirmed on these numbers or anything but I think it was around like 4500 bloods you could craft per hour just singly. Yeah. But with a double you could craft 9000. I was thinking honestly, yeah. Even right now I'm thinking okay, like 9000, let's just say the current price is I don't know, like 350. Like you know, you're making over 3 million an hour, but that price would yeah. plummet because it's so highly profitable a lot of players would do it yeah that's worth considering yeah and then it would probably drop down to about 2.5 2 even mil an hour like if you think about how how low blood rune prices would go but i think like even that like nine thousand an hour like yeah like you could buy like over a hundred thousand an hour right now if you just wanted to but the fact that you would get like rune crafting xp along alongside of like just a plethora of runes and and then get rid of uh you know blood rune sources from monsters and stuff so it's like rune crafting really has a purpose and you feel rewarded for doing it like you're not yeah, just exactly. afking your way making two thousand an hour but you're getting like nine thousand you know, just a good runes rune crafting like i don't know just even a simple change like that nothing game breaking no like new essence or anything just just simply boom rune crafting is extremely profitable again like a a nice skilling activity but of course, that nine thousand would probably be at level ninety nine. The, yeah. the single bloods would be like on your way up there. So, yeah, there's. I think there's definitely there's definitely reason to look into this. And I hope they. Yeah. It obviously does sound like the old school team have it well and truly on their radar. And yes, you know, there is that little thing coming out that's gonna augment blood output slightly with next. I think it is. I think that's all past polls and everything. So mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to see exactly what that looks like, how fast it is to get, and. No, just throwing out there in many ways that is a skilling resource booster coming from combat drop hey -ho, we hear that before you know so another interesting test case to see if it works or if it just is falls flat in its face who knows <laughs> yeah we'll have to um, see but yeah it's you know that's a definitely curious one is and yeah i'm just thinking off the top of my head more <laughs> design ideas uh design workshop here so you know again there's that that you know that you could get the strong stance like you said with shops and really go aggressively against them or or maybe you do start working them in more to to actual gameplay and i was just thinking now like well okay shops do serve a certain function because they they create a baseline of cost to a certain item right like it, it means a blood rune won't tank to a, a certain value or like it, it means yeah. you have to have a certain value in order to get that right yeah. that's what shops kind of have the one and only benefit for and maybe there's some more ways and they're selling like you could that. sell to the shop as yeah. well so whatever that that's buys it. for yeah yeah but maybe, maybe there are ways of getting a strange sort of hybrid gameplay skilling shop thing I'm, I'm trying to think to myself what that would actually look like now um but something along the lines of maybe there's an actual an, an, an integrated skilling method that starts you by having to do some amount of skilling let's say let's stick with rune crafting and say some amount of some form of blood rune crafting whether at the zayr altar or the new kind of the original uh altar and then there's something that ties into a shop through that maybe it's a, it's a little you know law based hey there's a, there's a certain npc that wants you to charge up an item that he's given you and you can only do that by infusing essence at a rune crafting altar and after x number of charges so it might take like i don't know 20 laps at a at an altar doing you know a full inventory of essence at a time you bring this charged item back to a shopkeeper and he says oh thank you for that in exchange i'll sell you this big stack of blood runes at a discount cost so now it's like oh, okay for every you know maybe one hour or two hours of rune crafting you gain access to a big extra stock that's just for you of that particular resource and it scales based on your skilling level and how much of that skill you've just done. 
so you can kind of offset you know you, you do a bit of both it, it ties in your skill level it it uh you know makes you go and have to do the skill itself for a bit but then also keeps the shop usable and it has that baseline cost associated with it oh that is, is genius nice to think out gp so that is just yeah genius. You can, yeah you should probably get harder it. it's quite genius but yeah you could you could probably get quite creative in how you incorporate that into different methods and almost do you know sort of i guess contract-esque systems yeah. you know, kind of task-esque systems kind of like how you got mahogany homes having you run around the place building things you could almost have shopkeepers asking you to perform certain actions for them in their skills and then the reward for that is you know you gain access to a greater but limited supply of that shop so it's really convenient to do but you can only do it once every x number of hours you've spent skilling yeah so it's not or like just... a horrible shopscape it sort of spreads the load a bit across everything yeah i'm just thinking of like the wizards at the at, at the mage guild that would like they want this certain essence and it's a one in 20 per craft or one in, yeah yeah one in 50 per craft or whatever and then you send it to them and they're like, all right, we're, we're going to give you this new shop access for a limited time. So buy as much as you yeah. want right now. But I can't, I can't tell the, the higher ups, you know, that we're allowing you to do this. But, yeah. You know, they, they like... so there's always already the sort of precedent for unique limited style shops with that. Uh, what's his face? The the Sudoku room shop. In, yeah. In, Ali uh, Morrison. That's it. Yeah. Ali Morrison. So, there's, there's, you know, there's a, there's a little precedent there for having to do a certain action. And then you gain access to a, a unique shop briefly. That's just sort of a yeah yep. has some unique stock in genius and yeah i think that could work and as i say anything that subtly encourages you to do you know, make use of both your skilling your, your level so high level is beneficial and also doing the skilling action itself and you know, maybe you do that for for mining the blast furnace form and is like hey i've got special stock of gold ore but i need you to head down to dondekin's gold mine <laughs> and bring back you know a couple hundred ores and then i'll sell you you know an extra 500 or a thousand on top so actually time wise it works out yeah, I'll end up with quite a lot of ores that I need, but also get some mining XP or maybe some other little tangentially related rewards. Maybe you roll on a chance for some cool, unique rare item as well. So there's like another subtle incentive to do this sort of method and rather than just rely on shops or just do little bog standard skilling. I don't, I don't know. There's, I feel like there's a lot of creative potential there depending on how you wanted to sort of do a bit of a mixture of things and not necessarily have to eliminate shops entirely, but I would, I would definitely love to see the end of shop and hopscape like just I, I really 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 dislike that with a passion i just ugh, yeah. i don't like it it's at all. bad it's, it's bad gameplay yeah if it can be incorporated into actual gameplay in some capacity then great if you balance in a way that doesn't feel like you're pressured to do on a set schedule then great um maybe there is a way of doing that as we just you know, listed there a few ideas but i guess time will tell we'll have to see how things go as mentioned with the first yeah. first types of skilling boosting things that are going to be coming out with with blood runes and all that but yeah it's an interesting topic overall i think looking at how you get resources and everything and as i mentioned going back to that drop table problem and, and trinket ideas and all that stuff like again i will i'll be quite critical of my own idea and think as i already said i i don't think i'd be able to fully stand behind that even still now i think if i ever looked at it again i'd want to try and do another revisit at it but again i yeah I just don't think i feel motivated to do that quite frankly because it's it's tough to know exactly what it would look like i mean heck, yeah. based on this conversation i'd maybe even skew it entirely to talk about shops and, and go in that angle because that's actually made me feel like there's probably there, there might actually be something there the more i've said that and i've thought about it in just these few minutes the more yeah, i, I think, start to like it um, i think these discussions kind of like I mean, even me I'm, I'm thinking of so many new ideas just from just from talking to you like just, yeah not even just about shopping but just like every the new skills everything so i'm just yeah and that, that, that's kind of the beauty of some of these things as well like having shared a, a big eclectic mix of ideas both good and bad over the years it's like at the bare minimum they get you know they can get people talking and get you thinking and sometimes yeah. that initial idea isn't going to be the one that you want to follow and even subsequent follow-up ideas aren't going to be the one but it almost never it, is yeah. Goes on. yeah exactly but maybe there's a little nugget of something in amongst all that and maybe someone somewhere else will be able to take it and pick it up and find a way of doing it that makes sense that feels suitable and acceptable and, and is right for the game as a whole and yeah i think that's what's nice about the community side of things and, and that you know sharing ideas like this having discussions like this one putting things out there on socials and seeing what happens it's it's exciting because interesting things can come of it you know once it's out there in the world people can pick it up and do what they want with it and yeah. all sorts so okay. maybe a, an interesting solution will be found and someone else will come along and have a awesome idea for how to tackle all of this yeah 
now there there's always there's always ideas hidden they're just like they, they just pop out like gems like just talking to yeah. you like that bard skill i've never yeah. I've, I've like heard of the idea but like never really like the f- i don't know it's never really come to fruition and it's never i've never seen yeah. or heard much more about it okay let's talk about um these last kind of few topics before uh we get into the reddit posts uh, I, I made a reddit post for those that are listening um I want to start doing this a little bit more often with guests where I get the Reddit community involved as well because it's generally I just post to Twitter and then we get the Twitter topics. But I want to talk to you, Gentle Tractor, on, and I know we've already kind of mentioned it a little bit, but the community sentiment and um, how that's kind of changed over the last eight years, as you've put, yeah. and uh, where it feels like the game is headed, good or bad. Yeah, it's so. obviously it's a really broad with this and you know as you mentioned we've sort of touched on all different areas and a big one i'd probably just reiterate on is that whole idea of in the early days of old school feeling very organic and kind of grassroots and trying to find its way in the world figure out what it was doing it did feel like the community were really there at the forefront with it helping to to pioneer and and lead the charge almost and i do feel like as the years have rolled by that has shifted feels like we're less like co-pilots and more like sitting in the back seat and enjoying the journey kind of thing and i don't know whether anyone else would agree with that or not it might just be my subjective and perhaps overly uh jaded and cynical viewpoint as the years have rolled by and i've gotten older okay. i think it's fair i think um, it's a fair point yeah maybe maybe um but yeah so it's it's interesting seeing how the community has kind of shifted i think and again it's like you know talking about the polling system and, and the perception of that i think it's interesting because these days I see it come up time and time again, how people feel like the polling system is somehow stifling and really preventing all sorts of things. But the statistics would point towards kind of the opposite. Like almost everything passes with overwhelming support. And it's really only the massive, massive, massive things like skills that you're going to have a bit of a, a bit of a you know challenge in time with. And then obviously there's a whole topic on PVP, but that really is a whole topic in and of itself. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's, you know, I don't think polls themselves are kind of inherently the problem because we've seen from the early days of polls being really contentious and a lot of things failing polls to just gradually becoming more and more and more supported and everything kind of passes and polls are almost just a formality at this point. They are. So yeah, I I don't know if that means, you know, is it, is there a a necessity to to look at overhauling the polling system? I'm not sure because I think the real challenge with that is figuring out what do you replace it with then how do you change it what direction do you take it with and what would make it better for the community on the whole and i I don't know if i'd have a a good answer to that because it's it's really difficult you know do you talk about really basic things like lowering poll thresholds i'm not sure i'm on board with that either because you look over the years and actually i'd say the 75 percent threshold has actually allowed us to dodge a few bullets over the years i really do yes and i think that shouldn't be shouldn't be completely overlooked and while, yeah, you know, some things perhaps have still passed when maybe they shouldn't have, or maybe they shouldn't have even polled in the first place, um, I still think that relatively high bar for a requirement to pass and get something in game is, I think it's a fundamentally positive thing. And also just the existence of the poll system itself. I don't think it's something we should be quick to try and discard, because I really do think it's something special that this game has, and this community has, that we can easily take for granted. Um, kind of what we talked about almost at the very start where you know this game is in such a unique spot and came about through such special circumstances and it really is unprecedented to have such a such an impact on the game and you know just be asked by the developers the things that you want and don't want i really don't think we should be quick to try and lose that in any sense at all i think we should do what we can to try and keep it that's what my general sentiment is on that one anyway and not sure how the wider community is really is on that because I think a lot of people are kind of craving something perhaps a bit bigger and and more impactful. Like again, like like skills, and they they see that polling system as a big blocking force, and so they think the solution is to just well, let's get rid of it then, so we can just have it and yeah. hand the reins back over completely to Jagex. And there's always that little little part of me that's like, ooh man, I yeah, don't know. I... I I like the fact that we've got a a tiny tiny say on how things go and 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 i yeah, think I'm scared to lose that 
and I think it's gonna stay. I was talking to Mod Sween, and I think we both yeah. came to the conclusion like there's we really do have it good with the seventy five percent, and every single person's heard equally, which I think is yeah. very important because I was mentioning like how cool would it be to have like um whatever it called uh like uh shit i'm I'm blanking on uh oh no what they were that basically like these um groups of people that are going to be like the voices i, I honestly i'm just spacing community councils and touch yeah councils like, there we go selected, councils that yeah, was select it. groups yeah that's and, a really interesting concept too. and, and it, it's good in a way but at the same time like who decides who are who's in the council and yeah who votes in the council so, yeah. like yeah that, like there would have to be a vote for to get in the council and then you know at what point do like you have to replace those people and because I really do like the councils, but I also feel like we're already generally heard on Reddit, Twitter, and the forums and everything. So JMods tend to take everything into account before, you know, making decisions. And they'll even scrap polls. I remember, like, Boss Slayer was just scrapped before it was even polled because oh, yeah. the community was just so not for it. Some people were. Yeah. But I think the, the outcry was no. So I don't know. I think uh, the polling system should always stay. And even though it is just like a formality, as you said, it's still like essential. Like if it was taken away, that's kind of scary. Yeah, I can't help but think back. You know, just a few years back to the uh, the partnerships. The fact that that was. Oh cool. yeah. And to me, that's. I'd say that was a, a weirdly nice example of a very, vocally outspoken community all yeah. kind of rallying together and saying, "Nope, let's not even go down this path at all." Because yeah. I'm. I'm fully on the side of that one that's like at, however you spin it i fundamentally believe that was like that's step one towards microtransactions without yes. a doubt because that, that that was microtransactions just with one extra step where jagex wouldn't be receiving the money directly it'd just be going through a middleman yeah but it would still be a microtransaction regardless and i'm, I'm very glad they a put that to a poll because can you imagine a different uh... company out there being like let's uh yeah let's just ask our players do you want additional ways of having your money taken from you it's like no company on the planet has probably ever done that. So <laughs> we have to be kind of thankful for some things, I think. And, and that, I just have yeah, to say, like, problem. sometimes it feels almost like a conspiracy that like these things will happen. But then but then it surprises you that they don't like. Yeah, I, I thought for sure warding was going to pass. I, I would have bet my life on it because it was just like Jagex wants it so badly that they yeah. will do anything to get it out. But so I was pleasantly <laughs> surprised that that failed and. Like, even the Duel Arena getting removed. I'm like, wow. Like, yeah, I just thought that was, like, a big, big uh, company. Like, the, the higher-ups had this conspiracy going on that they needed to keep it at all costs. Just ignore all the issues with it. Just Yeah. So, it's interesting how these things actually uh, get removed. Yeah. I would have assumed there'd be some big wigs looking at the amount of bonds that get bought just for <laughs> know. trading purposes at Duel Arena. And would be salivating at the thought and sad at the prospect of losing it but for real no, I, guess, uh, I guess there is some yeah some degree of the old school team having some autonomy there to pick the right yeah. kind of you know things that preserve the integrity of the game so it's, it's nice to see the daughter in, in particular is a really really interesting one to see exactly what that turns into next year and i really hope for the sake of the pvp community out there it turns into something good and not a bounty hunter 2.0 situation yeah. Where it's like replaced with something and then unceremoniously axed uh, some short time later because PvP is out there. They they need a win. They yeah. uh they they're definitely you know it's it's tough. I think it's a tough life being a PvP. And while I I can't really claim to be a part of the PvP community anymore, not for a very long time. I you know I'll always always have a soft spot I think for what's going on in PvP and mm. I'd love to see it in a better spot. But yeah, just that that topic of uh. Yeah, the polls and I think the, the community interaction with it. I think it's it's interesting to see where it goes, whether it will dramatically shift the tool or, or change or whether any different approaches will be taken. Because, yeah, it's it's been a good old while with how it's been the current way and I'd kind of like to see it go a bit longer. But, yeah, so, only time will tell. Okay, so let me ask, what what do you where do you see the game in five years? Let's say 2026. Ooh, yeah, five years. It's going to be interesting when that is. That's... Uh, I guess it, it, it would be nice to see a, a proper kind of comprehensive and thoughtful scheduling process. I think the last couple of years, although 
again, we'll try and give some allowances and, and acknowledge, you know, the last couple of years have been absolutely crazy for everyone for very obvious reasons. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's not been easy for anyone. So there's obviously understandable reasons for disruption, but it's a shame that it has, I think, certain things have, have been a slightly, you know, mis mismanaged in the schedule, the way content has come out is all things have sort of snowballed and stacked on top of each other. And then all of a sudden we were getting multiple game modes back to back to back. And then they were like, oh God, actually we haven't done any combat quickly. Let's get multiple hard modes and combat updates back to back to back. Yeah. And it sort of, it felt a bit awkward. And then a big thing that really felt like a, a dagger in my heart as a, as a quest fan was hearing the 150th quest get axed and shelved and pushed into potentially next year. Yeah. And that was like, oh man, like I know it's, it's, just a number at the end of the day and the, the quest itself that was going to occupy that can still come out in some new format and probably will next year my my prediction is it's going to be probably the sequel to desert treasure and following on as an and the whole majora and zaros story stuff but yeah that's another thing anyway um but yeah seeing that just sort of get dumped it was that was so sad to me and so alarming because it's like that's something that was just on like a big milestone a post that you could see from years away like they knew how many quests they had from the start of the game yep. when they started producing new quests they knew when they hit quest number 140 141 142 they could see how many were coming out every year roughly how long a quest was taken to develop so that to me was like a real indication of man something went seriously wrong somewhere to be able to lose the opportunity for the first ever big milestone quest like i was secretly hoping for a bit of a, a special themed one you know recipe disaster style special sub Subquest filled extravaganza, tackling some cool topics and things. You know, there's lots of cool things they can do with quests. Yeah. Um, and and seeing that just sort of unceremoniously dropped because they realize, oh god, we don't have any combat content. Quickly, let's get some you know hard mode combat things and fast track Rage Three for earlier in next year and all this stuff. And then obviously they realize, wait, what are we doing for the actual 150th quest? Because they realize the Kingdom Divided was the only quest they had in development as 149. Yeah. And they're like. Well, that's the best and biggest quest we've got. We need to bump that to 150. And how do they do that? Enter a night at the theatre. And it's like, oh, dear. So oh dear, sad. Oh dear. Just the, I, I can't even critique that as like a bad quest. It, it just wasn't a quest. They just didn't make a quest. They made a Slayer task for going complete Theatre of Blood. And yeah. that was it. <laughs> and you got a quest point for it. And it was such a shame to see because that just is the complete opposite of what RuneScape questing is all about. Yeah. You know, going on actual adventures that take you around the world and immersive and fun self-contained stories they but have obviously, fixed you know, it since props. yeah yeah i was gonna say quest, massive but... massive props for going yeah. back and fixing it again a lot of companies out there would just put something out leave it high and dry yeah. so big props where props are due very well like salvaged that was like it's a i think it's a good addition to the game where it is now compared to where it was yeah but you know it's still it's a shame that that whole thing had to go down the way it did and you could tell that it it did very much exist you know a, pushed out a couple of weeks before King Divided just so that could be take up the mantle of 150th so they didn't have to waste the 150th on some shoddy little like novice quest or some little yeah. small little thing so that's what I'd like to see the, the basis of the future looking a little bit better I'd like to see the big pillars of the game be more entrenched so that they go into a year and think okay we roughly know what this year's big PVM big PVP big healing and big questing update is going to be and have kind of like you know sort of three or four big landmark pillars that they can kind of work around over the course of kind of a year and and have like a nicer cadence as well for looking forward at the new and then also looking back at the old because i think there's a nice there's a nice pattern i think that you could you could get into perhaps a nice rhythm there that could be found to because i think there's always merit and worth looking back and keeping sure you know keeping tabs on everything you've got in game currently and making sure there's you know, nothing is kind of falling too far behind. There's been a lot of nice little mini reworks and refreshes, things like the the Shades of Morton stuff come to mind. I think that was, you know, is a nice example of a, a subtle little one. It's not a ground-breaking, earth-shattering update by any means, but it's, I think Shades of Morton is in a nicer spot now with that little rework that was done to it. It is. And it's I agree. Of, it has a, you know, a nice little utility, but it's not going to, you know, revolutionize anyone's day or anything, but it doesn't have to, ultimately. It just makes and the so, game feel like it has a little bit more depth. Like just like Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's nice. Absolutely. So yeah, having having a, a greater focus on that. So, you know, looking back for a bit, picking something out, bringing it up, and polishing it, and then looking forward, making sure you're doing something new. You know, I don't think you want to focus on any one thing for too long. Otherwise, you do get into this 
you know system that we fell into this year sadly where it was just uh oh we accidentally stacked like here's like a hard mode tob and a you know nightmare update and then a combat achievements thing and then oops here's like a game mode dead man and here's another game mode with a you know group iron and then leagues and then uh oh we should have done that scrap leagues uh oh we've got no content to replace with leagues it's like uh, it just felt like they were scrambling all year yeah sort of like going you know barely clinging on and it, it it i i that's the main hope for the long-term future i hope we can get into a nicer pattern of, of looking forward to big updates that deserve to be there that have had the time and investment put into them yeah and then hopefully you know very long term again with the discussions we've had today it would be cool if we can somehow figure out how those big big potentially game-changing updates fit into the equation could a new skill be in game in the next five years i, I would kind of like to see that i really would i know it's scary for some people and always will be and the ramifications that that has but i i genuinely believe you look back at everything else that the game has had there was a time when we didn't have quests and there might have been a bit of dissent and a bit of you know unnerved and, and, and worriness coming around uh you know should a new quest come into the game how should they be done or you know is that right does that still keep it old school if we're going off and changing the course of things but i think they're some of the most beloved things now like i love things like dragon slayer 2 i can't wait for the next big grandmaster adventure to be announced and unlock somewhere cool and go exploring again and do all that stuff and same goes for other things right like would you would you still want to be sitting here killing the same bosses at launch of, of old school like the same it was basically like six or seven bosses wasn't it? you're talking <laughs> and there was KD, no skill to it whatsoever Queen, well DKs, now it's and... no skill but yeah dk's like... was a was a feat back then for sure yeah exactly it really was and that was like some of the pinnacle of pvm you know once yeah. you've done your got your fire cape from jad and you i don't know beyond that you got chaos ellie mole and barrows and i think that was it i think i've just listed every single boss at launch of old school and like it's six or seven of them yeah. so I, I would contextualize it a bit like that like would you be happy if we hadn't had any new bosses or any new skilling updates or any new quests and i know people say oh, we don't need a new skill it's like true we don't need a new skill just like we didn't need new bosses we didn't need new quests but is the game better now that we have them and if you held out on a plate one hand 2013 old school runescape and on the other 2021 old school runescape I'm taking 2021 old school RuneScape every day of the week, no questions asked. Same. I think there everyone is, can. No way I would go yeah. back and play the original launch version again, but the actual 2007 era, because there's so much cool content now. There's so many things, yeah. so many you know little quality of life stuff and big sprawling content updates that I wouldn't want to, wouldn't want to live without. Kind of, they're just so fun and so cool. Yeah. And so that's how I how I'd look at a skill as well. I think yes, it's a bit scary, and yes, there is the potential risk if you get it wrong. Ooh, that 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 could be disastrous. Like, not gonna lie, that could be really horrible if you if you you know butcher that and and do it poorly. But if you get it right, again, I, I think of it in terms of the your, whatever your favorite piece of content is in game right now. Imagine if that just didn't exist. Yep. And you never know if that next new different thing could be your next future favorite piece of content if you're not willing to have a little sense of uh, you know open-mindedness and, and are willing to take a tiny step towards that, that unknown and that, that jumping into the the risk-taking realm of what could be i think that's a nice way to put it is yeah every single new piece of content we got like we didn't you know you could already say oh the game's already fine but like almost every single edition has just added more depth to the game and more fun yeah there's more variety and choice yeah and obviously you get you know it goes without saying it's not like there weren't problems and you spent a big time today talking about things like Zaire and you know how that launched in an undesirable state shall we say but even that has been over the years it's it's improved and improved and improved and it's it's getting there like I yeah. really hope one day the last few regions of Karen can be really spruced up to Hesidius and Shazian standard and hopefully one day we can look at Zay and be like you know what actually add it all up you know weighing up all the pros and cons that was a phenomenally good update in the long run and I think there's always a chance to, you know, fix things up and improve them, even if they're not great. But um, yeah, I, I would I would definitely look at the game in that through through the, those sorts of lenses and and try and you know remember what it is we like about it and all the exciting things that we play now. And if they just hadn't have existed, because we'd have been a bit afraid. I mean, it's, it's totally understandable that the fear is always going to I think exist in the old school player base because of where old school came from. Its origins were firmly rooted in a big game changing update happened. And it kind of killed the game experience for everyone 
and naturally that's just that's there in the back of so many people's minds like i don't want that to happen again i really don't want to have to have to lose the game i love because of a big update that's changed in a way i don't recognize yeah so i I fully appreciate and understand where that comes from but i i just i think i genuinely don't believe that would happen with a skill if it was done right if we found the right concept with the right implementation and the right community driven sort of design um and development of it i I generally think that could open up a whole new whole new future for the game because there is no great equalizer than a new skill there's nothing that brings you an you know, a little max main, ultra hardcore efficient player, and little three, you know, Timmy McJimbo who comes off of Tutorial Island back together again than a new skill could. You know, you're both there on square one again and, and sort of playing together. And yeah. there's no other kind of update that can possibly be done in game that truly captures that cross game wide, all demographics, all player yep. type feel as a new skill can. You know, new bosses, really exciting. But if you want the most exciting ones, you kind of want end game bosses. And it's really easy as a veteran high level player to sort of actually forget what the average player looks like. And I, know. At. I deal with very that. It's easy to, to forget. Actually, the average player is like just dicking about chopping yew trees and yep. just kind of doing some quests after their work, you know, and this kind of stuff. So it's, yeah. I struggle with that. Yeah. No, I think so many of us do. So it's. I think there's there's something there to be said. So yeah, long term future. I'd love a a really quite a well a well established and and solid front for just new content additions in general. Getting a nice pace for different yeah. types of content appealing to different player groups. Making sure there's you know something looking forward and something looking back, improving what's there, getting excited for what could be, and maybe just maybe a big you know big headline update like a skill it's that last final the final frontier <laughs> that could be uh approached into that we haven't yet trodden and we've we've escaped unscathed in all the other previous new frontiers we got through new quests we've done new bosses we managed new skilling updates we've and we've, we've emerged on the other side and the game's still alive and kicking mm-hmm. we're all still good so i, I kind of believe we we would we would be able to get through a new skill and actually find an exciting new future for old school ahead of us. I have thoroughly been enjoying this conversation for real. Uh, we got, we, we did get some Reddit comments, um, some, some, some topics. So I want to be sure to cover at least a few of those. A lot of them we've already kind of like talked about, like with, you know, these past three and a half hours, we've been talking nearly four (laughs) and, uh, I want to I want to start off with one and again you can go off of any that you see that are pretty relevant but one I'm seeing is from Hello Adam and he's talking about fatigue and stamina in game and Ooh, he yes. says like run energy in OSRs how could it be considered anti-fun <laughs> punishes new players who have to walk everywhere and has resulted in fashion skate being ruined which again trinkets could could potentially help um questions yeah. are fatigue stamina systems outdated should stamina reduction be less punishing, especially at early levels? Should it exist at all? And is there room for a rework? Yeah, big, big old topic that one, isn't it? And it's kind of funny timing as well, because I did just watch the most recent old school uh, live stream Q&A just this past week. And actually, I think it was Mod Kieran had a little uh, had a little to say on that front as well, just talking about agility and run energy and its role in the game. He said some quite interesting things on that. And yeah, I think at, at its core, if we're truly trying to be objective and unbiased as possible, like, are they outdated? Kind of, yes, I think they are. And it's it's a struggle when you're, you sort of, for me, it's kind of a battle between the head and the heart. When my heart says, oh, for goodness sake, stop trying to try with the easy scape updates. We've, we've dealt with this this way all this time. <laughs> Doesn't need to change. Like, yeah. just put up with it or shut up, right? <laughs> but then my head says, well, okay. We do also need to try and think about the game as a whole and the future of it and the kind of longevity it has. Are there things that realistically changing wouldn't impact us as veteran players who've been around a while, but would positively impact lower players or or newer players just getting into the game? And maybe there is justification for looking at some systems very carefully, very cautiously, but looking at some and, and making some changes. Run energy is an interesting one because I think it's it's definitely rife with potential for dramatic improvement. 
but no matter how you spin it, it will always kind of boil down to the system itself probably just does need to be made easier if you actually want to solve anything. Because having that whole, you know, starting the game and it takes whatever it is, 10 to 15 minutes to fully restore from zero to 100 percent. Like, wow, that is brutal. Just that is next level. <laughs> that really is. You know, there's there's harsh, there's punishing old school mechanics. And then there's just I'm just watching my character walk everywhere. So Maud uh, Kieran brought up a, a point of like going into pubs to oh, yeah. regen like Remember super that, quick. Uh, yeah, I think that, that's maybe genius. still to this day, that might be. I think the most upvoted suggestion post of all time on the 2007 wow. Reddit. Someone who I'll quickly go search it right now. Top post all time. Yeah, you should. You things about that. Runelite HD. There's a top one. If you find um, it, can you link it? Yeah, I'll have a quick look. I'm sure I remember seeing it. For, like, for, for a free to play player, that is amazing. And I feel like free to play players are generally the people that suffer the most with front energy. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was just going to say is like, imagine if agility could actually increase your run max so like instead of just maxing out at 100 like everyone gets like what if it actually maxed out at 200 or like i guess it'd be like 199 or something but like every level yeah. gives you a little so little bit more up yeah no that that would make a lot of sense as well i was quickly just linked that to you there that was uh, Let's see it. i think it's one of the highest posts uh you know, that that isn't a, a meme or some sort of drama controversy as tends to be the most devoted things in the community um, it's one of the highest of voted suggestions, and it's just the really, you know, the basic one. Just stand inside a pub and do exactly what you said. Just get some energy back, and clearly, it's like sometimes simple things like that resonate with people. Uh, but yeah, as, as you just said, like the using agility, I think that was probably one of the longest-standing misconceptions. I've definitely spoken to people over the years, maybe many, many years back, more so than more recently. But people who used to think agility and its relationship to run energy was like, oh yeah, you just like run for longer, right? It's like actually no. Actually, has no impact on that, does it? It just affects how quickly it restores once it's out. Yep. And the things that impact how it drains would be your weight, and then obviously in more you know old school times, it's uh it's stamina potions and that this this stamina effect. So yeah, actually, there's there's already kind of a lacking of system. Like we almost have one half of a proper run energy system where we have a system that passively increases the rate at which you restore it. But we don't have a system that passively decreases the rate at which it drains. So it, it does kind of make sense on paper for something like that to exist in a more constructive and, and properly kind of made format there. Um, but yeah, what what that what shape that should take, it's it's difficult to know. And and little things like that, you know, resting at pubs and, and that kind of thing, I think they'd definitely be nice from both just a simplicity standpoint and intuitive standpoint and a, a world building and immersion standpoint. There's loads of reasons why something like that's nice. Would it be massively impactful in terms of actually solving issues honestly probably not but then it's you know that that does get you into more difficult territory there like okay well are you willing to start gutting systems and start changing things actually start changing formulas of stuff you know should agility as exactly as you described start you know increasing max energy or, or having a decrease slower yep. so just stamina is an inbuilt effect on agility and a potion simply compounds the effect so you know, maybe it should. It's it's so difficult to say because, you know, as I said, we've all, we've all been used to this and gotten used to it just fine. But I, I do think there are a few things that point towards maybe it is worthwhile and beneficial looking at this. And the ones I would point towards are the instant restoration effects that exist, i.e. pools of restoration and stuff in your POH, things like the statue in Nada, and mostly for like low levels, I guess, it's you know, used to be clan wars, but now he's both the Ferex Enclave pool and the clan wars area. Yep. Because the reality is, it's such a weird meta. When you try and externalize it for a second, stand back and look at it as a third party, it's like, okay, what's the best way of dealing with energy at a low level? Right. So first you get a piece of teleportation jewelry called a Ring of Dueling. And then you teleport into the middle of the wilderness, the main PvP zone. But you're not actually in the wilderness. Don't worry, you can't die. You're just in the PvP hub area. Now you run off and you click on something, and now your energy is fully back because either you stepped inside of a portal and then left it, and now it's there again, where you just drank from a pool that's next to a PvP activity. Yep. Now you can teleport back to what you were doing. It's like, how unintuitive of a system is that? It's like a primary form of getting energy back as like a, a low-ish to mid-level. So I would say that's like the low, that's like the early meta, right? Yeah. If you need a quick burst of energy back, that tends to be what you sort of weave in to the various things you're doing. You expend a dueling ring charge, jump into one of them, and then off you go again before you get your POHs and all those high-level things running. And so it's 
when you really break it down, that's such a such an unintuitive set, series of designs and, and mechanical behavior for run energy to have. And it really does kind of create this weird cap or sort of like hard threshold point that somehow you've got to breakthrough because everything beneath that is absolutely god awful like the first opening hours of the game when it's there's just bad. no mean doing anything it's just like you're just watching yourself walk and then as soon as you get to that point where you can sustain rings of dueling it's like oh yeah you're just zipping around with teleports now and getting the energy back again and it's 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 just it's a very weird environment it's a it's an yeah. odd one and even like I'm, I'm even thinking like from one to 50 agility like there's i mean yeah there's a difference but like even when you're yeah, at 50 agility, it's still painful. Like you still run yeah, out of no, run energy cold. very fast. I forget what the scaling is. I guess the wiki will have it, but I feel like it's only like I think one to 99 agility. It increases. Oh, I've got the number in my head of three times. So I think it triples. Yeah, so it something like that. Like 10 to 12 minutes down to like three or four minutes maybe for a full 100% restore. So yeah, like even a level 50 where you maybe doubled it and now you're taking five or six minutes instead of like that's a long time still. Yeah. So. So Maybe I think that should just be increased, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like the solution might be you just look at the bottom end and say, okay, what is this formula doing? Should it just not start at twelve minutes? Should it start at like eight minutes or six minutes or four minutes? You know, something like that. But then keep the top end, you know, roughly where it is, so the top end doesn't become vastly better than it is, but the bottom end becomes nicer. But yeah, it's it's all it's it's challenging to low. As I said, it's it's the weighing up the old with the new, yeah. trying to reconcile that issue of. No, my heart saying don't do easy scape updates but my head saying maybe there's sometimes a need and would the game be better with some more accessibility i mean again i'm a i am do not really started playing but I, I, as i mentioned earlier i started playing in classic and all those classic uh fans out there will remember there was no run energy like you had one movement speed in classic and that was walk and we walked uphill both Jesus. ways Jesus. <laughs> right which was the old man time <laughs> but the boomer but that, that's true like, like uh exactly yeah and uh but it is like in, in classic there was there was no run energy system and my god i mean agility was a bad skill back in those days it was literally just a quest requirement skill essentially about half a dozen quests had an obstacle and that's why the agility skill existed <laughs> just to force that so i i think back to those days and i think to myself i wonder how many people trundled along into rooms get classic and then quit the game and never experienced anything in the 20 years after it maybe because of that reason because they were just walking around and it felt really painfully slow how many people played RS2 maybe during you know the affectionately referred to mini clip era where a huge boom in popularity RS2 just like oh my god it just exploded yep. people joining in that era from 04 to 07 and how many people may have subconsciously stuck around because just movement felt a bit nicer because all of a sudden go from classic to RS2 you suddenly doubled your movement speed like oh yep. my god that's bonkers the imagine pitching that today it's like, oh by the way you're going to be able to move you know, twice as fast four squares instead of two <laughs> like, what no that breaks so much don't do that jump flex ah right but it's like okay that was that when you start to realize that was how run energy was introduced you can start to see why it was introduced so conservatively and so harshly yeah. because the system it was replacing was literally nothing and they were introducing an entirely new movement speed from scratch so obviously they made it quite punishing so you can only use it you know sparingly but again if that system with it not existing in classic i don't think there's any way you can spin that other than saying oh that's like an easy scape update the launch of rs2 with run energy that was a massive easy scape update but did it cause thousands of more people to play the game and the game to go on to bigger you know popularity and success and allow it to grow to where it is today maybe maybe that had a really subtle impact on that like you so difficult to know and you can't really like break it down yeah you know, analytics wise but it, you know it's the kind of thing that could be hypothesized to have had a, a meaningful impact you know, just the ability to get around the world at a run speed rather than walk speed now so one thing try... yeah sorry go ahead one thing that uh was kind of brought up uh i i don't even know like i don't know where it originated from but it was an idea of like you know how you can one tick prayer flick just have yeah. unlimited prayer imagine you could do the same thing one tick run flick oh just, my god just as long as you put in the effort, you can just nonstop run. <laughs> just like I, I can't, I can't deny it. You know what? As a, 
a gamer who's getting on now and feeling like less inclined to do all the efficient methods. That sounds so awful. <laughs> <laughs> to run around everywhere. You just have to. Yeah. Run. It's like, oh God. Imagine trying to do that in combat as well. You're trying to save the stamina dose. Double click run, double click press, double click run, double click press. <laughs> and then you get like, oh God. <laughs> and then just imagine like these absolute gamers that are both doing the one tick flicking prayer and run. So they're clicking four yeah. times every tick. Oh, just nonstop. God, that's awful. And they're just picky to boot and just oh, just but like out. imagine if if that had always been the case or something like prayer yeah. you know if that was technically always the case and then they were like oh well we're not gonna fix it we can sort of add a feature now like, yeah no definitely that would have been That's crazy like very very different landscape the things would have been if that had a function like that oh but, yeah like I yeah, don't even think rooftops for well I mean. It's still it would still be amazing to like keep stamina's because that's almost like yeah. the prayer pot for the, you know, prayer because yeah, like technically yeah. you can just have unlimited prayer all the time if you wanted. But. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting concept. I just remember thinking of that. I was like, huh, like that would be extremely game breaking at this point. But it is effort for you know high effort, high reward, I guess. But yeah. Um, no, it is. Yeah, real energy in general. It's uh, it's an interesting one to discuss and think about. I, I wouldn't want to again. It, it's. It's just controversial of an area and one that I don't oh, yeah. have such a strong kind of opinion on or like concrete solution for that. I'd want to be like, yes, we must do this. Or yeah, we must not I don't, do this. I don't I'm think. I'm kind of like, you know I what? I'm either. happy to sit back and see kind of what happens on that front. And if it felt like improvements that needed to be made, then you know what? So be it. I think there are bigger fish to kind of uh, and worry about out there than uh, than how run energy is handled in this day and age. So I don't know. I'd be open to the the discussions of what could be done and hopefully more systems you know can be incorporated there and if it does come with little content that's like that that pub resting and I, I i even like the suggestion i've seen in the past of incorporating fire making and do a bit of a weird mishmash of what the old resting system was where you could just like rest anywhere or musicians and stuff in in rs2 pre-eoc oh you? yeah but actually just tying that to a player made fire so you put down a fire and right click the fire and rest by it and then you know it's your little campfire and now you're gaining energy back quicker like that just feel you know just from a gameplay feel again might not be efficient might not be viable really but it just feels kind of nice and could be a fairly unintrusive way of just subtly adding more things in that kind of makes sense for run energy purposes and might be something a low level would do and but yeah it's 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 an interesting one and I feel like it's one of those topics that probably will eventually get addressed in some way. Yeah, absolutely. And probably will end up being done through like integrity changes based yeah. on how it seems like Jagex has spoken about it. It just depends how drastic and deep they go. You know, do they go radically redesign the run energy system, overhaul agility, and then make the entire skill free to play accessible? Like, ooh, happy. Yeah, quite who a knows? steep set of changes and would have a lot of knock on effects. But yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see and yeah, curious to see where, how it all pans out. Okay, I'm looking at one question here, and then I'm going to let you decide yeah. a few topics from the Reddit okay. post as well that you that, that, that kind of stood out to you. So the one I'm seeing right now, though, is from the, I don't even know, what the Admiral Akbar. He says, what is your, what is your favorite location to explore in game? So just if you consider, like if you thought of every single place in game, Oh man! What is your favorite, just in general, I guess? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say mine is Dorgish Khan. Yeah. Or Dorgishun, oh, yes. Dorgish Khan. I don't even know. Yeah, it's one yeah. of those. All the little underground cave goblin yeah. areas. Yeah. I love that place. Oh, there's a, yeah, there's a, there's something nice about those little out of the way places that are really they've got such a unique vibe to them, don't they? <laughs> yeah. and, and aesthetic. I think it's um just to call back to the earlier mentioned uh, my fellow bard skill pitcher friend of Mr. Caveman only. So he tends to lurk in caves, as the name would suggest. Yep, uh, that's like his hometown. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I've you know hung out with him a bit, and uh, and you know seeing him sort of uh you know on his streams and things in game, and it, that's one of his old sort of stomping grounds. And that that's kind of made me realise it's like I think I've seen more of of places like that through your content than I have actually in game myself. <laughs> like that's how seldom I go there. It's yeah. such a shame because they're such interesting and unique little places. But so yeah, that, that's quite a good one. You know, same goes for the. City Keldrigrim, kind of mentioned earlier as yep. well, with dwarves. It's, it's another interesting place that you kind of just pass through or use for like a single little activity. You know, you're in the blast furnace or somewhere, but it doesn't really feel like a, a nice place to spend time. But it's such a kind of cool environment. Yeah. And that locations to explore. Like, I remember when, I remember when Fairy Rings first came out. Ooh. And there was this real sense of excitement because everyone was just trying combinations <laughs> of things and being teleported to a random spot. 
and then all of a sudden you were finding these like strange places that didn't exist before and so i remember one that sticks out just way back was the, the actual enchanted valley that just kind of existed oh there, yeah the fairy ring and you just step through this cave and under a waterfall and obviously by today's standards you go back and look it's like wow this is really kind of pathetic looking <laughs> <laughs> but child me was like filled with wonder and amazement it's like oh it's this hidden little valley in a secret magical fairy teleport circle wow i wonder what, wonder what cool things are here and Sadly, as it turns out, it was basically just an Easter egg location. But yeah, there's, there's nothing wrong with things like that existing, mm -hmm. and it's it's something like that that fills me with that sense of uh, yeah, sense of wonder again. So I, I did like some of those places where you just kind of ended up at a random spot. That, what fairy rings were really nice for. I kind of wish Jaggers would do some more of that. Just secretly add a new fairy ring location at some point and wait for someone to put in the combination and find it. Yeah, <laughs> or or like kind of how you get to the Fairy Queen Resistance hideout. Oh yeah, or like, like a, you type in multiple codes. Yeah, imagine yes. that. There's oh, imagine there was a hidden one that nobody's that found yet. That would be actually yet. amazing. That that really would be. If they just came out and said, "Yeah, this place has existed for 15 years. No one's been here." So, like, because what are you doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking. Okay, so for 64 combinations, the Fairy Queen takes four 64 combinations. So like, oh god, that's just got to be that. insane. That's an ungodly amount. I <laughs> I millions, surely. Like that's. Oh Christ. Okay. So um, yeah dibs on not doing that brute <laughs> yeah, force method, so. I, well, let me actually just 64 to the power of four jesus i don't even i want to just know what that number is yeah <laughs> yeah that is one or no, no no that is 16 million the one in 16 oh, million chance to to come across imagine oh. if there was imagine yeah <laughs> although i guess sadly to, to put a damper on it in this day and age it probably would somehow be figured out i feel like by plugins and clients and cash that's true oh yeah a hundred percent crazy things isn't it so it's a bit of a shame isn't it that actually that sort of exists now but i'm a little curious so uh do you remember mod matt k's like treasure hunter thing like the uh oh, his um, like his clue hunt thing yeah the clue hunter out or yeah, the, the clue hunter clue outfit hunter. with the helm of uh whatever it is yeah ray, ray old, well, something, right yeah. yeah something like that what was that able to be solved by clients i'm just curious because i don't think i you know what? It I was. don't think it was. No, I do think at least some steps of it were brute forced at some stage, weren't they? I think some people just did combinations of Ender's items for some things along the way. Um, but yeah, no, you're right. I think there there might be some, you know, different systems. Like I'll, I'll have to. I'm yeah, not, I don't know if there's like a workaround behind that. like just hiding it. What, like... Yeah, for what works and what doesn't, and what's yeah. extractable and, and findable, and what what isn't, but. I reckon there probably is a few ways and methods they have of keeping a few things secret. There's definitely been a few hidden interactions. I think there was a a secret interaction that maybe I want to say Mod Wolf did for one of the first Kurend quests, like the very very first maybe client of Kurend mm. that involved kind of a, a wolf bones or something like that, or killing a wolf or finding something that then used on something else and it gave a special item or something. And people didn't find that for I think literally years. So wow. I assume there must be some different ways and some things of Keeping, keeping some things under wraps and, and having a little surprise and easter egg remain as such um so yeah it's yeah oh god maybe, maybe there is though. maybe there's some hidden fairy ring combination and if there isn't then there should be quite frankly <laughs> yeah jagex do it now <laughs> drop everything and, and make people are cool just spending years of their life like one person just going through every <laughs> single code writing them all down oh my god oh dear i hope so <laughs> yeah that's always sort of uh those kinds of places excite me and uh fill me with a sense of wonder still it takes me back all right what are some uh things that you that have stood out to you that you'd like to address um I'll, here how about this i'll let you choose yeah. three okay okay yeah um I'll, I'll i'll kind of start from the top and go down to that okay. uh, Reddit thread i guess and but the first couple sort of uh addressed fully with zaya and skills and someone says if you can write a twisted tale what would that roughly involve that, that's always interesting i think quests and it kind of taps into that idea of, uh, before I actually answer the question, I've got a tangent again, sorry, ramble. Uh, but uh, quests and, and sort of like play design content, I think it's a bit of a shame that quests are probably the one thing that you could never really properly pull from the player base for, because it kind of defeats the purpose of it. If a player has to sort of outline the quest and then it's sort of it's spoiled before it's even got in, isn't it, yeah. in a way? It's, it's a bit of a shame. That, I guess unless Jaggers ever held like a quest competition where they secretly read submissions that were that were submitted through an email and then just yeah they thought was best that, that could work i guess but yeah i've never sort of felt compelled to publicly like pitch and share a, a quest in like super detail or depth 
just for that kind of reason, because it is sort of in inherently diminishes that quest and probably makes it less likely to even be a thing. But yeah, Twisted Tales, that's, it's something I want to see more of in general anyway, because again, I've got a bit of a vested interest in how Kurend and Zaya turns out these days, I think, because there's a part of me that still wants to see it be the best place it can be. And I, I do love quests as well, just little, they're the things that feel the most traditionally runescapey to me, just going out there, not worrying about everything else and bossing and skilling and efficiency for a bit and just, just immersing yourself in a little fun jaunt around different places in uh, in the game. So, yeah, I think I've, I've probably had a couple of thoughts as to random little quests that could take place around Perend or the adjacent locations in, in Zaya. And I think one that comes to mind was when I thought of kind of early on after the first series of re-sculpting of the coastline came about. So they added the Kurend woodland and that little area just around the Woodcutting Guild. Um, and yeah, they had a few little features there, the little little town of Land's End nearby and a little barbarian camp there. And when that was first added, and there was a little, little boat just off the south of it, you know, all kind of existing just as fun environmental storytelling. I guess no real purpose or gameplay function at the time, at least. And I always thought to myself, hmm, there's, that, that feels like a cool story to be told there. Why, why is there a little group of barbarians that have decided to presumably sail all the way here from maybe the mainland? Maybe they came from a barbarian village or over from uh, sort of near Barbasalt or something like that. Why, why, have they, why have they landed up here on Zaya near the Woodcutting Guild? What kind of fun thing could, uh, could spin out from that? And yeah, I think the concept in my mind was something along the lines of you'd have this barbarian and, and his little group of people who were following him and perhaps he was in good old runescape fashion a tad on the incompetent side you know, looking for an adventurer to come and help him out and pick up the slack and uh and perhaps you'd start by trying to sort of establish their camp and, and just help them out a little bit so give them a foothold in in Zaya in this current woodland uh you know maybe you'd use your construction help them build a couple of little houses or huts or maybe use your fishing go and help them you know teach them how to uh properly feed themselves go grab some uh, local food and fishing supplies it'd be a fun opportunity to do something silly like uh offer a new bare-handed barbarian technique like bar Ooh. barbarian lobster catching or something for mid-levels yeah like, do barbarian harpoon catching so maybe you just do a fun little thing like that i was then, I uh, just just real quick i was yeah. just, just talking about the barbarian thing i was just thinking imagine how funny it would be just if they like introduced as a as kind of like a joke, but it still kind of worked. Was like barbarian mining. So you're just using your hands to just punch rocks, <laughs> so punching just, rocks, yeah. Yeah. karate chopping them. Like just go full blown like uh, I don't know, go full blown Minecraft now. Just start like, punching trees, punching rocks, <laughs> yeah. barbarians now. Oh no, yeah, that's uh, that could be done. I think. But yeah, so this sort of uh, yeah, little quest of helping some barbarians out, and I could see, I had this sort of idea of uh, wouldn't it be fun to create like a a point in this quest where it's like okay they want they want some better building materials and they look off directly to the north of them and they point at these gigantic two trees like well they They're like what you mean the redwood trees well that's that's woodcutting guild stuff it's like yeah we should get some of them it's like uh well you know you kind of need to be woodcutting guild members and friends of the city it's like nah we'll just go in and get some <laughs> you know, being barbarians as they are perhaps they meet a bit of a you know a bit of staunch opposition at those big gates that are locked in the woodcutting guild and they come back and like uh, okay we need to find a new way in and your character's perhaps sort of uh questioning okay i guess i'll go along with this it's like right we're gonna we're gonna force our way in we're gonna find a way to to tunnel in and then that starts like a heist kind of question you know, Ocean's Ooh. Eleven. I was like, okay we're doing a guild heist we're gonna get in get the redwood logs and get out and that's gonna be our building material for our new little barbarian village like oh god okay i guess i'll help you guys out <laughs> this couldn't possibly go wrong could it <laughs> so sort of work for these barbarians perhaps scope out a spot just near the edge of the woodcutting guild start tunneling in it's like okay this is gonna work perfectly there's we know there's this uh little open cavern filled with some ents inside there so we should be able to tunnel through to that and then sneak up through there so okay cool we'll start tunneling maybe hit a bit of a snag obviously the current woodland it's filled with quite a few hunter creatures about you know there's some uh some birds flying about a few chinchompers roaming so maybe you dig underground and you're like whoopsie daisy you, you sort of dig your way into a bit of a, a bit of a chinchompa nest and maybe there's a very angry you know <laughs> mother sort of chinchompa there sort of carefully guarding a little young chins and you're like oh god okay <laughs> sort of uh conflicts time in the quest got to somehow deal with this your tunnels have now been compromised by chinchompers you're running away from this giant chinchomper attacking you with some crazy little explosions maybe throwing our children at you in a very brutal masochistic way <laughs> yeah, chinchompers are a weird one it's a tangent by the way aren't they like rodents that just live to die it's a very strange one but <laughs> they're kind of kind of fun to think about but yeah i thought that'd be you know there's, there's some chinchompers in the area that could be a fun little uh Fun little nod to that. Have a, have a nice point of conflict in this quest. Sort of finally overcome them. 
kind of work your way through into the tunnels, get up, get the redwood logs finally. You know, escape back out, use the chins to sort of explode the tunnel back behind you and, and block the entrance and all that good stuff. Get back out, you know, you sort of finally got some redwood logs and supplies. Like, oh, okay, I'll build you some buildings. Our brain's like, oh, great. Looking at the end, like, yeah, I think we'll put some oak logs or something. Like that. <laughs> oh, great. Quest complete in good old RuneScape fashion. And sort of uh, end it there. And like, yeah, I think that could be you know, a fun little, fun little tale like that and unlocking perhaps. I did have one idea. I don't know if this is too controversial now, but but you know this little chinchompa nest halfway through the quest. Oh, it would be cool to have that as like a little chinchompa hunting area you can go to afterwards. But give it a little unique spin. Yeah, there's uh, something different. Like uh, the, the idea I had, if it was a chinchompa nest, there are little you know young chinchompas coming. So what if you had this idea of like a variable chinchompa spawn? So as you caught the chinchompa, the next time it spawned, it would change the type potentially and roll between all the different chin variants. Maybe Ooh. too controversial to say, because obviously if you include black chinchompa in the mix, it's like, uh-oh, you've got a non-wilderness source of that. Could be very, very, very controversial. Yeah. But the way I'm picturing it is what if you had this little underground cave that had, you know, a 60 to 70% chance of spawning as red chins, but then maybe like a 10 to 15% chance of spawning as a gray chin, and then a really small chance to spawn as a, a black chin underneath that. Um, so it wouldn't really be efficient to get black chins through that method at all. But you could technically do it just in a, a very little, inefficient and, just a perk yeah, of it, yeah. Just try and you know average out the GP per hour, and XP per hour, so it might work out marginally better than just regular red chin catching, but still be nowhere near as good as actually dedicated black chin catching. The yeah. And the main reason for this variable spawn, because I, I wanted to have one final layer of sort of fun skilling thing that I think skilling needs a bit more of, which is a variety moment and... of surprise. And, yeah, and, yeah, surprises. There we go. A, a fourth chin chomper type potentially as an ultra rare thing because we already have a fourth chinchompa in game through a transmog and a pet and that's the old golden chinchompa it's like okay what if if this is a variable chin spawn you have like a one in a thousand one in a ten whatever you know one in yeah. an insane thousand chance of it spawning as a golden chin that you can catch it's like oh my god there's the golden chin you catch it it's so rare maybe it only happens every few hours and so it can give you like a big xp drop for when you get it so yeah exactly, you know to be okay and when you throw that golden chin, it sort of explodes in a shower of, I don't know, gold pieces or something and <laughs> drops one special unique resource, like some gold chinchompa fur. And then you go and craft that into something. I was thinking in my mind at the time, some sort of mid-level range boots. Um, so something that just slots underneath. Again, nothing like high-level meta yeah, chains. Just... This whole thing is like a mid-level quest. It's like a mid-level set of um, you know ranging boots with a bonus probably just underneath like uh, blessed dragonhide boots. That'd be so, amazing. That'd be like plus six or something. So you can't little mid-level meta. Maybe you give it like a high magic defense bonus as well. So these boots are sort of you know rangy and mage tank sort of item for mid-level I, players. I I, I just like got a to rare say, item drop from skilling. I just got to yeah. say, I think uh, boots would be cool, but also, and I, I I think it was one of your posts that was uh, talking about new coifs and new boots and stuff. Oh, yeah, I did try and pitch some more dragonhide things quite a long time ago. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking like imagine like a like a little like Robin Hood hat, maybe like something that's just like slightly under a Robin Hood hat that you could craft yeah. with golden uh chin Yeah, that'd stuff. Be nice. Maybe maybe have both little matching yeah. chinchompa outfit. <laughs> Who knows, you know? <laughs> that'd be dope. But yeah, that's that's sort of one one concept I had quite a long time ago. That I sort of written down in a word document I thought, that's a cute little story, but I probably won't ever share it. But hey look, I got an opportunity to share it, so that's fun. That's awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, little things like that. I, I think it's it's those little quests and stories that give the game some real. It gives it the soul, doesn't it? Like the yeah, the I think I said earlier that the skilling system is is kind of in my mind the the structure, it's the the skeletal framework of everything. But then it's the little things that you build on top of it, like the quests and everything else, that makes it feel really filled with charm and personality. So I'm always big in favor of little quirky RuneScapey style stories and quests like that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm um, two thumbs up to more Twisted Tales, I would say. I, hope I love it. More. Okay. Do you see any... Yeah, uh... another question. Yeah, yeah um, let's, let's get two more. So, I guess the next question Darren's asking about uh, user-generated content. I feel like I kind of covered that a bit. Um, earlier, I'd, yeah, I'd sort of love to see any sort of system, quite frankly, that lets players generate the content in-game, you know, tools and resources and, and means of doing that. So yeah, I would I would love to see that. I don't know how realistic that is ever going to be at this stage, but it would be definitely nice to see something in game. And I mean, it, it's it's annoying because it doesn't even feel that far fetched. I'm going to throw back to something now that existed. Oh, I assume it's still there, but I, honestly, I don't know. In the era when um, clans and the other RuneScape came out with those big clan citadels, if you're sort of aware of them, 
Yeah, they. I mean, I, yeah, I didn't play back yeah. then, but I've I've heard enough about. Oh, them. like to be honest with you, I wasn't massively like around specifically when they came out, but mm. seeing more into them and then seeing one of the features that came with it really kind of blew me away because there was this the weird Citadel system, which I'm not a big fan of in general personally, but there was elements of it that you could build. So you could build something called a clan battlefield, and this clan battlefield was essentially to really boil it down was like a mini game editor like you could go into it and if you were like an admin in a clan that had built this citadel that had this battlefield so that one of the reasons why i think it's never really been known or touched by people because it had so many barriers to entry it was like a fraction of a fraction of the player base could even see this let alone interact with it but it, it essentially was it was like a mini game creator like you could stipulate rules and place down like objectives and markers and and npcs and things and wow yeah i, I looked into that and sure enough you want to guess which developer made it who may or may not be on the old school team i'm gonna just guess time. mod ash <laughs> well bingo <laughs> you got it <laughs> so it's like of course that came as no surprise finding out that he developed that wow um, yeah so i think task with making a little combat area for clans and he was like i guess i'll just make a full mini game editor just you know bump there you go as you do so to me that's something i look at and go man that was such an underutilized thing because it was hidden away so deeply into so many layers of that game when it was already kind of in an awkward spot I'd, I'd love to see something like that built upon and that that is what gives me hope knowing that morash made that and it's been done in the past in a basic format to me i think yeah there's like there's potential it could be done you could do in-game content creation tools let players make little mini games perhaps even give them expanded access so they can make npcs and give them custom stats and attack cycles and patterns and things like that and then maybe even map editing tools and things like that to let them actually create entire little areas and boss zones and mini quest locations and wow. i just need to tell. Yeah. i think there's so much potential i think there's so much potential that is completely untapped it's such a shame because i think there's there's so much you could do and man it would like free up jagex and the old school team so much if they could offload some of their heavy lifted onto the player base and that's why it feels, you know, sometimes almost redundant or counterproductive when you see them, again, massively appreciate that they've done work on things like client features. Yeah, and but it's, it, it can just be so done so much more efficiently with the yeah, community it's like, involvement. It's such a shame that it is them, like they're, they're having to redo what the community has already done. Yeah. It's, it's such a shame that it's, you know, they're spending so much time doing that when it feels like they should be figuring out how to bring the community in at that stage to, yeah. to start with. I don't know so, how yeah. it exactly works. I think they're like, I don't know if it's something to do with like they don't want to share that like their their coding yeah. and stuff. I think that it has probably is largely that. Yeah, a lot of like law stuff, yeah. like legal. As I say stuff. that, uh, mm. yeah, that little battlefield thing. That's the one thing that gives me a glimmer of hope. It's like something yeah. has existed literally in game where you could walk to and start like editing bits. So it's like it can be done. Like we've seen it done. It's it was simple, rudimentary, didn't do a huge amount, but for what it was, it was I think surprisingly impressive. And yeah, I'd, I'd love to see just little hints of that because we've not really seen any sort of inkling of heading in that direction at all. And that's, you know, I'm biased, of course. I've shared my fair share of suggestions over the years that I would have loved to have seen, you know, come to light. And I've been very privileged and honored to see some things, you know, many things have come to light and fruition in game. Um, but yeah, I would just love it if more players could could get involved, had easier to access tools and weren't reliant on third party offerings and having to go look under strange locations and dodgy avenues to get sketchy tools and programs working to do things yeah it'd just be nice if there was a formalized process where players could really channel their creativity and their input and benefit the game directly yeah as a result of that input i'm glad you're kind of like advocating for that because i i don't know how to do all this stuff but yeah like there's yeah. rune light i mean i don't even know if i could play this game without rune light just it's a scary thought isn't it <laughs> Yeah. For a while early on, when like the old OS buddy and all that stuff was really starting to take off, I was so strongly against all third-party clients. I was like, this is disgusting. This is like, because they're selling it in particular. Like, they're selling access to features that really do push the line. It's like, yeah. this is awful. You can't allow that. Then obviously it kind of became more and more prevalent and more and more accepted and standardized. And then I think quite frankly, luckily, Rune like came along. And I mean, that's yes. obviously had its own controversies on multiple occasions over the years. Luckily, it's all kind of weathered the storm and come out on the other side just about intact and i i do think you know what the game is probably in a better spot with rune light than without because in many ways you know would jagex have ever been spurred on to make their own client improvements without yeah. stuff like rune light possibly not you know they could have i think you know it's um competition you know breeds sort of 
you know invention ingenuity and, and it really does improve everything i think so from that perspective they've probably done a lot good yeah um, i was even gonna yeah, nice if it was more in, it, better incorporated into all the processes you know get the plays involved more rather than yeah the game, what they're doing i was i was gonna say like I mean, back when OS Buddy, I think it cost like four bucks a month or something like three or three or four yeah. bucks a month. But I mean, I besides like the whole uh, thing with like paying for extra features from a game that we we're already playing. But yeah, just minus all that, I would literally pay fifteen bucks a month easily without a question to play on Runelight. That's how much quality of life there is. Like, yeah. it just makes the game so much better, in my opinion. Just like, <laughs> like no, you I don't agree. When 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 the game updates and Rune lights down for an hour, it's like I'm logging out. I can't do this. Like I, I can't even do it without GPU. Like, dude, GPU alone is just insane. Yeah, it's alarming when you realize how many little things you're like. And I'm I'm quite bad for this, but I'll just toggle on a random little thing. It's like oh, I guess that's useful. I'll put <laughs> yeah. that on. I mean, I don't need it, need it, but it's kind of nice that it's there. So I'll have it on. And then you realize when it's all switched off, it is like you suddenly feel naked outside in like the snow. You're like, oh God, this is what the game felt like. Oh, <laughs> oh God, how did we manage? Oh God. Yeah. So yeah, I think I'm, I'm kind of with you there. I, I would really struggle back going, going back to the actual default client yeah. at this stage to the point where I maybe probably wouldn't want to at all. So yeah. And, and there, think... there is like things against clients. There's a lot of controversy with like, for example, speed running records and other things like that. And, uh, but the pros yeah. massively outweigh the cons, like to to clients. I feel oh to Rune Light. I I mean I only play Rune Light, yeah. and so oh yeah, same. I can never go back. No, I think you're right there. I, I I do think so. Yeah. All right, let's get uh if you if you finish right. that second one, let's get the final yeah, uh, topic that you'd like to some address. More. Um, oh god, I should try to make it a really good one then, shouldn't I? Um. We've got, I think we've kind of touched on a lot of different things here. I've shouted out some other community suggestions before of uh, areas most need a rework. I think I'll be kind of like a broken record if I say my answer to that being, you know, Zaya, but it's it's on its way. You know, it's it's doing well. Um, how do I feel about Catalyst? I kind of spent a while talking about that. Um, Lailing was working about that. Um, <laughs> working with jagex or i don't know uh, yeah i Renate, saw that one yeah i don't know if to answer that or not it's like uh it's i don't know there are some interesting things that could be delved into there but i think i'd rather not go too deeply into it but yeah it's um it's kind of thing but you know just want to see the work in there would be definitely very very interesting like i i i'd be so curious to do that but um i mean just from like a practical standpoint like i'm not a i'm not a software developer i don't work in the games industry or anything right now my skill set and career path is in a very different spot so uh yeah and then like they want to hire like a dedicated design and balancing consultant who is and, just a community member and then on way, top of that I like i'll be offering much to them yeah and then on top of that you have like uh like i think sometimes like I'm, i imagine if i worked at jagex and i'm like okay i don't act like this this isn't exactly what I was like thinking of. Like when I, when you think of working at Jack, it's like, oh, I, all my ideas get to like be brought into the game. But it's like, okay, no, you're, no, you don't get to really decide that. And there's so much more because, like, again, like as you were saying, I I tend to think of players that are higher level, where you see the ma vast majority of players are just like you said, chopping yew trees, and you have yeah. to cater for those, and you have yeah, to you see the game as a whole rather than like what you want specifically seen. So yeah, it's tough, especially when that comes comes at odds with the, the most vocal portion of the player base which you know bless them over at jagex they've had to deal with a lot of uh a lot of hatred coming their way perhaps yeah. a lot of unwarranted over the years so that's not an easy one and as you say you know just because you're there and working for them doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get all your ideas and yep. in, into the game and if anything it might even be feeling quite creatively stifling to have ideas and being so close but then being told no we're going to work on this instead yep. now and you have to do that and we're actually going to be implementing this and if you're sitting there on the team feeling like oh god i would i would rather not be developing this at all i think this is wrong that would probably be quite a, a painful experience yes, too i'd absolutely. imagine so in many ways you know what it's it's probably not the worst thing ever sort of sitting on the sidelines as a as a community member kind of throwing things out there you can chuck your unwarranted opinion out and yep let it kind of sit and, and sometimes share things and get the community rolled up a bit hopefully not in an overly negative way but uh, in a constructive way i, I always try to 
you know frame what I do I don't think I'm always successful sadly I'm probably been a bit negative at times like we all maybe are but you know I do do try to remain constructive and, and thoughtful you know there's always another person on the other end of any device any line of text that comes out of anyone that's that's always a human being it's worth trying to remember that and yeah Jags are only human themselves but yeah no, it'd be, it'd be an interesting prospect I'd definitely you know if someone came at me and said hey come and work for us I'd be like you know what yeah I'd, I'd give that a go I'd just purely curiosity's sake at, at, at a bare minimum it'd be interesting to see how it will pan out but yeah I think just based on my skill set alone and how they've sort of expanded the team they're they're definitely looking for you know dedicated software developers yes. you know content developers and, and dedicated artists and stuff and I don't really have that that specific skill set uh, I'm afraid so yeah probably probably gonna be a, a not happen I think um yeah I think looking through a lot of these questions we've kind of covered quite a lot of them yeah in some that's way or I'm, another I'm, I'm um, looking through them too I, I kind of just in the long-winded rambles and and so forth. that's that's generally what ends up happening is uh yeah there, there's a bunch of topics and then like at the end we're like oh we've already kind of covered every single one yeah that's it. here let me let me ask you this one that um okay was on uh twitter so the duck chris is just really short he asks yeah what is the best update old school has received in your opinion oh wow um Oh, that's that's one of those tough ones as well, isn't it? Where it's so big and broad, yeah, potentially. And massive. You could even break it down. Like I'll probably have to, to be honest with you, to say like best update because is it is it the best update because I enjoyed it most, or is it the best update because I think it had the best impact on the game? Because you know there are, there are certain things I think that was really good for the game. But actually, in the grand scheme of things, maybe I don't spend all that much time utilizing it or, or doing it. Like I'll, I'll I'll be the first to admit if. It isn't really kind of abundantly clear based on my posting habits and, and suggesting habits. Like I'm a I'm a big skiller and, and questing fan more than anything. Like I'm, I'm a bit of a, a jack of all trades, but very much a master of none. And uh, <laughs> these days, especially, I, um, I tend to gravitate more towards that kind of skiller and questing and sort of world building centric stuff. So the big kind of expansive end game PVM stuff, I really like. I think it's cool, but you probably won't really find me grinding out lots and lots of in-game raids or anything like that yeah that's not really who i am but again that's i'd look at stuff like that and say how the landscape has changed i'd say arguably for the better with all these sort of aspirational pieces of pvm content like your infernos and your your big chambers xerix and theater of bloods and the upcoming rage three and i think they've you know in many ways you could probably make an argument for things like that being quite an influential impactful update maybe that constitutes some of the best ones because it's really funneled a lot of people down a certain path and you know it's a far cry from as we mentioned about you know the days of end game pvm being kbd and kq and dks it's like the game has come on so far from there it's really impressive to see so stuff like that is really you know quite i think you know worthy of, of praise overall and the kinds of striking big pvm updates um in terms of again just like as it is a bit of a love of mine i guess like questing stuff i think probably Dragon Slayer 2 stands out still as my favorite kind of old school quest experience so far, I think. I think, I think that's one of the most well-rounded and, you know, dare I say, best quest updates we've had. I think Monkey Madness 2 was uh, my favorite. And it might have just yeah. been because that was before Dragon Slayer 2. Because I, I think yeah. if Dragon Slayer it 2 had come out. the first yeah. new old school quest, wasn't it? So it sort of broke the seal, as it were. Yeah. So, yeah, I totally see why that would be a fan. If I'm, if I'm being a with my opinion i i think i don't know if monkey man is 2 has quite stood up quite as well as something like dragon slayer 2 i don't yeah called. i don't think it has either but i yeah. think just the initial go at it was just Absolutely, so yeah. fun and i mean part of the reason why it was so fun is because i didn't actually fail the the barge part <laughs> Oh, I'm pretty gosh. sure if you <laughs> failed that part once, yeah. the quest, you just hated it at that point. Yeah, but. there are a few segments there where it can be a bit, oh, God, I want to scratch your own eyes out or something if it goes painfully wrong. But I was blessed yeah, to no. not have failed that. And so just overall, oh, I just love good. the quest. Yeah. No, it is. Uh, yeah, I think it's still a you know a solid bit of content. It's, it did exactly what it needed to do at the time. I think the first ever old school quest, it built on yeah. a really popular one of Monkey Madness. Super iconic still to this day without kind of fully undermining or diminishing it. Um, I think it did, it, you know, missed out a couple of things just because I'm a... Oh, it definitely did. And like, but 
you know, I, annoyed at the, the, the details and the lore. And there's a few characters, like little tease that was in Monkey Madness 1 at the very end. And that monkey was, like, never addressed properly. It's sort of yeah, odd. that's true. I think that, that where and the boss fight, I think, of, of Gluff hasn't held up at all, I don't think. Oh, no, not at, at all. Galvec, it's like, oof, not too well. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the biggest thing was just the also the release of demonic gorillas and giving those Zenites yeah. just and the ballistas like just like cool things yeah. like that where it's like it wasn't it was better it was like best in slot stuff that was coming out but yeah. it wasn't like crazy it was just like filling it niches like that, it felt cool yeah it felt like a substantial post quest offering which i think yeah. is needed. we look at the iconicism of things like recipe for disaster obviously the the event of recipe for disaster itself is the hundredth quest is you know quite iconic but it's that journey towards barrow's gloves that really reinforces it and solidifies its place in the game. And I think that's probably things like that as well with, with Monkey Madness 2, where yeah. you do have these significant and quite impactful post-quest rewards and things that you obtain through the journey of that quest, and as a result of completing it, that make yeah. it feel that little bit better as well. But yeah, I think I think my preferred would just overall quest structure and how it felt and everything was probably Dragon Slayer 2. Um, so they nailed like it. Best quest and other things. Sorry, I'm going to keep breaking this question down into more subcategories because I can't pick one best thing. So I'm just picking different areas now. Um, Go for it. Like skilling things. I do think I'd like to see more things along the lines of the um, the sepulchre because I think what that represents for agility is really positive in terms of it added some meaningful variety to a skill that kind of needed it. And it, it served as something a little bit different that hadn't really been done before. It wasn't trying to rehash something that was already there or some pre-EOC thing or anything. And it genuinely felt like it was, you know, trying to, to make a positive and engaging and interesting piece of skilling content. <clears throat> and I think that's quite commendable. And I'd like to see that more sort of, you know, things that feel rewarding, that rewards you for your effort and skill and time and meaningfully diversify a skill. So I think that was quite a nice update on the skilling front. Yeah. It was an incredible update. Well done to, like, just huge shout out to Mod Husky for, yeah, developing that. Just insanely, just well yeah, done. Big, big, big I was not expecting it to be that great. No, yeah, it could have been sort of a fairly innocuous little thing, just sort of bundled in with a bigger quest. But no, it turned into quite a, quite a nice. You know, it did. I think it did just the right amount of things that it needed to do. Yep. And again, it's, it's the type of thing that isn't necessarily going to be to everyone's tastes and not everyone's cup of tea, but. I think that's fine. I don't think every content has to be exactly, you know, mass appeal and everything. I think that the only sad thing about that is probably it's um, just because it is so heavily quest locked and gate behind so many of those what often perceived to be a bit challenging, you know, heading your way through Maya Ditch and those Mauritania quests with the vampires have always seen as a bit, oh, they're like slogs, aren't they, getting through. So I guess that's the only thing that's maybe a bit of a shame if, if a lot of people have sort of never experienced that and probably won't because of the, you know, having a bit of a quest chain behind it and a, and a moderate agility level again think yep. of the context of the early conversations about the average player it'd yep. be cool if the average player had access to something in agility much earlier on that had that level of engagement and interest in and stuff even if it wasn't the same you know you obviously scale the reward output appropriately but that's just true. something that made it more invigorating and, and engaging so hopefully that can be a bit of a template again not for the specific gameplay itself but just what it represents and how it how it diversified a skill i think um i think that does a lot of good things there so yeah there's a few areas of um I don't know. I, I really don't think I could pick just like a best thing, but uh, you know, I did. I also really like the farming guild. Just I'm just skinning up there. <laughs> it's nothing really special in terms of kind of. And again, I'm kind of biased there because I know I pitched a version of a farming guild, even if yeah. Um, you know, my <laughs> version was was very very different and didn't really emerge at all in game, as already briefly mentioned. But um, yeah, there's something just charming about the farming guild. It's probably my the during the times I do play kind of like my go-to bank i just like chilling there it's just sort of you've got that background of farming contracts you can kind of sometimes passively do but then you just sort of you, know, you can kind of skill and chill in an environment that feels quite it's, there's something about it it has a nice atmosphere i like yeah. the way it was put together and just I the agree. way that sort of greenhouse look and, and everything it's just, yeah i like i like the farming my guild. my only issue with the farming guild was in my opinion no contracts should have been skippable like you you shouldn't have ever been yeah. able to skip contracts i agree i do think like the rewards, as is quite often the case, being the sore spot of the old school team and old school as a game, the balancing of reward outputs. I think even still to this day, like they're super generous, super extremely, generous. Like, yeah. Wow, they are, you know, just straight up overpowered, and that's even post nerf. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I fully agree. It's uh, 
a bit on the overtuned side, definitely. Yeah. Being able to kind of like fully sustain a lot of seed sources as even as an Iron Man is quite comfortable once you get into the guild and get oh, up yeah. and rolling. So see, I was a big fan of like just okay. So if there was a contract that you actually couldn't do. Yeah. Because you like lack the seed for like white lilies or something. I don't even know what seeds like you couldn't yeah. get. But first of all, I kind of want it to be a challenge. So if you don't have a seed, you have to find the source of it from maybe from a PBM drop or something and go get it. And then like, you know, yeah. but, but at the same time, I'd be okay with some other form. Like Jane will say, okay, like I'll give you this seed for, or I'll give you these few seeds, keep track of them or whatever. But yeah, I think just what would have been so cool is like you get a Redwood contract. Okay. Boom. I get to just relax. I don't have to skip down to easy contracts. I just gotta enjoy this, yeah. and this is like you know what the meta is. You just you do your contract that you're given. Yeah, I think that would have been nice. Yeah, and quite frankly, again, I'm a bit of an inefficient player these days, so I, I actually tend to kind of play like that. I usually I like I do to too, actually contracts Be... I get given. So if I get yeah. given the red one, it's like cool. It's Being brutally honest, I, I play the same way. It. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I kind of I'm like that, and yeah, just everything about that. I like the little. Little Hispori has like a little sporadic boss to go and take on. Obviously yeah. It's not really a challenging boss, but it's just a fun little, fun little distraction to to do every so often. And yeah, there's something just nice and, and simple about that area. So I like that. And uh, yeah, best update. You know what? I'll, I'll end this best update, which is no longer just one update. It's now I've listed half a dozen things. But <laughs> I'll, I'll give an answer that I would I hope to be able to give one day, and I think we almost there, and we'll one day get there. Which is, I want to say Zaya. Because Zaya is an update, I would say, in 2016, again, just, just being really harsh, it's, you know, not nice to overly critique people's work, but I, I do think Zaya was one of the worst updates we had in, like, ever. <laughs> like, just, just <laughs> yeah. putting it unflattering. Sorry to be, like, really brutal there. That's, I know that's just it's me. true, though, work, unfortunately. But, but, again, just to, like, <laughs> double back on that a bit, like, the reason why I, um, I was so disappointed with that is... I don't think that reflected the level of quality of work that the old school team at the time were capable of producing. Like I, I don't, I think there was just some really fundamental missteps made very early on with the, the core design direction. And so because everything else was built off of that design direction, just the pieces were never going to fall into place. And so that's how I think things ended up the way they did. There was a big overambitious, you know, excitement factor of making a big giant landmass increase never done before in the game's history. And I think they just bit off more than they could chew few inappropriate design directions picked and it just it, it kind of crumbled under itself so to me i'd look at zaya and think man if that had have stayed as it was in january 2016 and still been like that today i think that would have been such a, a stain on the on the game like a real blight to the game's legacy in many ways it sounds a bit melodramatic to put it like that but i really do think it would have been i think it would have been really nasty to have left how it was yeah. so the fact that it's been so heavily updated and you know it's multiple members of the team have really gone out of their way to try and improve the quality of it and and take it to where i think it always deserved to be and where the, the team were capable of doing it but just you know sadly couldn't realize it at the, at the first uh you know, the first go around i'm hoping one day i can come back and say you know what zaire is such an amazing addition to the game current is an awesome location filled with great and well-balanced and fun engaging content and yeah i there's already a lot of stuff there. I mean, I just listed some content on Zaya, like the Farming Guild, or whether it's Chambers or Zarek, but there's cool stuff going on there, for sure. So I, I just want the whole kind of backdrop of that location to be no longer mired by its history, but kind of forging a path for itself that really showcases the, the strengths of old school as a game and the team and their willingness to listen to the community and how passionate and dedicated the community can be when it comes to wanting the same thing, wanting the best version of old school that old school can be. So... That's yeah. the answer I'd want to give in the future. In the future, I want to be able to say the best update Old School ever received was Zaya because of all of these reasons. And don't think we're quite yet there yet, but I'm crossing my fingers and hoping it's, one day... It's on the be. way, you can just tell. Yeah, for sure. Well, gentle tractor. <clears throat> um, yes. It's been a uh, wild ride, honestly. It, this, has actually well. been, this has actually been the <laughs> longest cast I've ever oh, done. Dear. Well, I apologize for anyone who was looking for, <laughs> yeah, a brief encounter, but brevity is not my strong suit, so sorry about that. This was, no, this was absolutely fantastic. I'll be recommending this episode over, like, anything. I'm, I'm not even going to lie. This I had an absolute blast. And oh, well, that's, that's good. We could oh, we could talk for another few hours, I'm imagining, but... I bet we could. We could pick out a few <laughs> topics and, and pick some and go to, well, you know, maybe if you want to revisit in some... 
amount of podcast numbers time then i would, would remind me i guess i would that would be a pleasure for me to to have you on once again we can talk about uh new updates that come out there's been a lot of fun i don't usually do things like this as mentioned so it's, you uh, killed it you're very well spoken it was better. it was really oh, enjoyable to listen to you oh thanks that's great and, and likewise yourself it's been a it's a very enjoyable chat and hopefully folks at home have heard something of interest in amongst all the rambling and tangents so hopefully there's something to take away from it no it was it was seriously really nice and uh honestly i mean i i general i gen generally ask my guests uh for three shout outs uh i can already almost imagine some of the shout outs you'd give but you know what i'll I'll ask you anyway and just i guess if there are some that you've already listed like or already mentioned in the cast uh feel free to just bring them up again but i will ask for just three shout outs from you yeah yeah i think i would uh yeah, as you as you suggest that, I think I'll reiterate some of the the folks I mentioned earlier, name drops like the my fellow uh, sort of bad skill co collaborator and sort of originator of that idea and the driver force behind that. We had a lot of great discussions over the years. Has been uh, caveman only. It's been a yeah a real great individual, a good friend who's uh, a lot of good ideas himself. And uh, yeah, so a big big shout out to him and uh, everything he's done. And uh, yeah, in terms of like community members out there, I'd, I've said before they go by the name of. Uh, Screet Monge, or just simply known as Gnome, mm-hmm. usually. Um, they've shared some, like, genuinely, I think the highest quality suggestions that I've, I've ever seen shared by any community member. Some of the most thoughtful things, and, like, the things they've come back and told me and just casually been like, oh, yeah, I've just learned how to 3D model, and here are a bunch of things I've made. It's like, wow. Like, that's just, it's blown me away. And, yeah, the level of thoughtfulness he's put into his suggestions and posts over there, it's, I'd strongly re- recommend checking some of those out. Having a good little you know, sit down, nice warm drink, and have a read through some of his stuff. And I think he's even done a, a few um, YouTube kind of read throughs of them as well. So if you want to listen to them, I think he has a, a YouTube channel of the same name. So I think I might need to invite him on the cast. Yeah, yeah, I'd, no, I'd recommend it. I'd uh, have a little chat with him. I think he'd uh, have a lot of interesting things to to say and input. So yeah, and um, God, who else? you know what? I'm going to be a little bit a um, little bit cheesy on this one, maybe, and and say my third shout would go to. Uh, collectively it would go to the old school team and kind of the community it's this is a cop-out answer i know yeah, i like I'm doing it, it anyway um because genuinely like this game wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for that combined force of like the passion of the players and the dedication to the the team willing to work with the players and it can't be easy on on both sides of things right like we get frustrated as players wishing things would go a certain way and them not and wondering why things are the way they are and then, sure enough i'm i'm you know, sure, the, the old school team could be just as frustrated at times with things they do, but we genuinely do have something so special with this sort of relationship that exists between the development team and the community. And I think we just shouldn't take that for granted. Like, it's it's easy to overlook because it's been like that for so many years now, but we genuinely do have something really special here. And massive props to the old school team who go out of their way to put themselves in a public facing position where they don't need to, to really engage with people on quite a personal level and really push towards getting the best game that everyone wants. And, you know, props to the players out there who spend time and energy trying to make this game that they, you know, we all share and all love the best game it can be um, for no real you know, gain of their own, other than they're just passionate and they, they love what they do and, and want to all share this with everyone else. So, yeah, big props to, to everyone out there, to you at home listening to this and Jay Mods at home busily working away in the game. So give yourselves a pat on the back and, and remember, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. We we're here and it's you know it's quite a nice thing and we should be in celebration of that thank you that was uh i, I just i've just literally been smiling this this entire like almost five hours so oh, thank oh. you so much for for choosing to be on it i asked you um i wasn't sure what yeah. the response was because i've again you're not like a, a well-known like youtuber or streamer or anything no, I, uh, keep to myself a bit <laughs> so uh i really do appreciate your time tonight and um no, no problem. I'll, thank I'll you. It a lot, so thank you. Yeah, thank you guys for listening. Uh, next week, uh, this this next week we will have Dino XX on. He is a streamer. He's a PKer. We're gonna be talking about the wilderness changes together and other things. And then the week following, we will have Puggin on the cast. So look forward to those. And uh, yeah, that's it for me. So thank you again, Gentle Tractor. It was a pleasure. And we'll yeah, thank you. We'll catch you guys all on the next one. Take it easy. Bye-bye.